Chapter 24 Jezet They came for her on the fourth night. Drake had brought her aboard and told her there were no free cabins on the fortune, but she was welcome to stay in his. Jezet declined. She trusted neither Drake nor herself in such a situation, so decided the best course was to remove the temptation. She opted to sleep down in the hold, when she managed to sleep at all, and she found a nice little corner of nowhere that was snug and warm and only smelled badly as opposed to terribly. Drake had laughed it off, told her she could sleep where she liked, and now it appeared her stubborn defiance was having consequences. Drake's crew obviously thought she was fair game. She was awake as the first of the pirates, a big man with beady eyes and no hair, stepped close to her hiding place. He was not light, and he was not stealthy. Jezet opened her eyes a crack. Three pirates. The big one, a small one, and a greasy-haired frog of a man. She waited until he was just a couple of feet away, until she could smell all three men's unwashed stink, and then she struck. Best teach them a lesson so that none of them will forget, Jez. She launched from her sleeping spot with her dagger reversed in her hand. There was no point to wielding a sword in such a confined space. Better something with a short blade. The pummel of the dagger connected with the pirate's gut, driving the wind out of him. Jez saw his eyes bulge and his mouth crease up, and she struck again. This time, the pommel of her dagger cracked the man across the jaw. He went down with a grunt and a spray of blood as the second two came at her. The greasy frog was as clumsy as he was careless. He rushed at her with clutching hands, hoping to overpower her. He didn't get close enough to try. Jez lashed out with her foot and heard the snap at the same time she saw his leg buckle. He hit the wooden floor screaming, and Jez danced out of his reach. That was when the smaller man realized he was outmatched. Jezet saw the change in his eyes, saw the look go from feverish lust to abject terror. The fool turned and started to run. Jezet had no intention of letting him get away free. His intention had been rape and possibly a bit of beating thrown in. Jezet's intention was to make an example. Both Drake and his first mate, Zothus, were on deck when Jezet marched up out of the hatch, pushing the little would-be rapist in front of her. They heard the man's sniveling cries, and both turned to watch Jez's display, as did every pirate on duty. Good. Get the message to as many of them as possible. Jez walked the man to the middle of the main deck with his arm thoroughly twisted behind him, and then kicked the back of his knees. The little man crashed to the floor, weeping and cradling the wrist Jez had just relinquished. He was mostly unharmed, besides the broken wrist, but Jezet was about to do worse. As the little man crawled back onto his knees, he looked back over his shoulder at her, a sneer on his face. Jez was ready and waiting. She punched him with all the force she could muster, and well she knew that was a fair amount of force. The pirate did not get back up. He lay in a slowly spreading pool of blood and spittle. Good message, Jez. Show them all you're not afraid to break your own hand. There were plenty of pirates gathering now, including, Jez noticed, the big one who had just recently tasted Jez's dagger pommel. Some watched her with the same lust she had seen before administering the beating. Others were wary trying not to meet her eyes, and she swept her gaze over the crowd. Eventually, she looked at Drake. You might want to tell your crew to try sticking their cocks somewhere else, Drake, she shouted at the pirate captain. He laughed. In a sea of ugly faces on board the ship, Drake was a beacon of pretty, but underneath all of his smiles and dark eyes, he was as rotten as the rest, and Jez knew it as well as he did. Reckon that'll have to be a lesson you teach them your own self, Jezit, Drake called back. He leaned his elbows on the railing and watched with a wry half-smile. Zothus shrugged and did likewise. How many pirates are you willing to lose like this, Drake? Jez screamed over the rising clamor of voices. 
Jez saw the bastard shrug before she decided it was time to turn her attention to the twenty pirates, looking to use her like a shoreside whore. She sensed the big pirate coming from behind long before he got close. An easy duck to her left, and she spun and drew her sword in one fluid motion, cutting a large gash up the man's back as he passed her harmlessly. With a howl akin to a newborn babe, the big pirate went crashing to the deck, screaming and bleeding in equal measure. The other pirates hung back. They recognized a game-changer when they saw one, and the bloodied three foot of steel in her hand was just that. Whilst weapons were a regular commodity aboard a pirate ship, it was rare the crew carried any. Drake and his first mate were permitted weapons, but the rest of the pirates usually had to wait until prey was spotted before the swords, axe, and bows were brought out. That did not stop a plethora of knives appearing in calloused hands, and all of them pointed toward her. She saw Drake watching with unfeigned interest. No doubt, the bastard is hoping they beat me so he can take his turn. Jez had no doubt she'd lose. Against so many in such tight quarters, her chances bordered on hopeless, but she would be damned before she let a single pirate inside her, and she'd take as many of the bloody shits down with her as she could before they beat her. Jezit dropped down low into a fighting stance, like a predator waiting to pounce. She held one sword in her right hand across her body. Her left hand hovered near the hilt of the other. Yuri had taught her how to fight multiple opponents. He had even gone so far as to hire men to attack her. His method was simple. Imagine a circle around you, no more than two feet in all directions. That circle is your territory. That circle is your body. Anyone who enters that circle dies. Jez held her weapons so she could strike anywhere, and she focused on all her senses, not just her sight, to know when and where they came from. She calmed her breathing and waited for the attack. Ship! Dead ahead! came the shout from above. All the pirates looked toward their captain. Drake was already moving, heading for the bow with a spyglass in his hand. He walked straight past Jezet and the pirates surrounding her, and Zothus went with him. Jezet waited, keeping all of her senses trained on her circle. After one of the more tense minutes of her life, Drake strode back into view. Jezet Verlern's introduction to the fortune will have to wait, boys. Merchant Cargahoy, sleek and fast, but low in the war. And just about right for the taking, I reckon. A cheer went up, and most of the pirates scattered to their posts. A few remained behind, including the bleeding pirates now based on the deck. What should we do with C, Captain? asked one of the pirates. Drake gave the downed pirate a nudge with his boot, and the man moaned. Still breathing. Best get him seen to. As two of the pirates dragged the mewling, wounded man to the hatch, Drake leaned in close to Jezid. Now, why is it you always look most beautiful when you're fighting for your life? Jez felt her cheeks heat and floundered for a response, but it was too late. Drake walked away smiling, and she found herself standing alone on the main deck, as Zothis screamed for all hands on deck, and pirates rushed to and fro, all around her. The activity on the fortune was organized, frenetic chaos, but every member of the crew seemed to have a job, and every one of them obviously knew it well. More than once, Jez found herself in the way as a pirate rushed to his task. Eventually, she moved up to the quarter deck where Drake held the wheel. The night was beyond dark, and the moon thoroughly hidden behind layer upon layer of churning cloud, but the pirate captain steered the ship with the same confidence she had come to expect from him. We're going to attack them? she asked. He gave an appraising look. Aye, we are. Jez nodded. Her sword was back in its scabbard, but her hand never strayed from its hilt. The idea of a fight excited her more than she'd like to admit. She had come close to one, 
and it had stirred her blood. Now she had pent-up energy just waiting to be expended. She glanced sidelong at Drake, with the wind blowing back his hair and a predatory grin on his pretty face. She could certainly see what the Dragon Empress saw in him. Dangerous game, Jez. She looked away quickly. How's her sail looking? Drake shouted. Full! came the reply from above. Reckon she's seen us, Captain? Right then, Drake said, grinning from ear to ear. Hoist the colors and pile on the sail, boys! Another cheer from the pirates and one whooped close by. Jezet turned just in time to see the scrawny pirate scutter to the railing and leap onto the rigging where he raced up to the mast as fast as a monkey. Shouldn't they be armed? Jez asked as she watched the pirates run about the ship like fleas on a dog's back. Drake chuckled. Might want to settle in, Jezet. Go a while before this chase turns into a fight. He wasn't wrong. For over an hour they chased after the ship ahead of them steadily gaining but not nearly fast enough for Jezid. It came as a relief when Zothus finally called for weapons, and she watched as each one of the pirates aboard the Fortune broke their post for a handful of seconds to select a weapon. Some picked swords, others picked axes, but all were crude things of wood and metal. They were well looked after, and she didn't see a spot of rust on them, but they were weapons for those that didn't know how to use them. Jezit's sword was a precision instrument, one she intended to use. When the fortune pulled close, it didn't take long for the arrows to start flying. More than a couple of shafts implanted themselves in the hull and the deck of Drake's pirate ship, though none managed to hit their targets. Drake laughed at the attempts to defend. Reckon negotiation is out of the question. That was an option? Jez muttered over her shoulder to the captain. Her attention was focused on the little ship they were about to board. Drake took a moment to reply, but she could feel him watching her. Nah, don't reckon it was. Jez heard an odd clicking noise and looked down to find the most grotesque creature she had ever seen watching her. The spider was the size of a cat with eight eyes, each the size of her fist, positioned around its head. The beast had a strange turquoise sheen to its body, and its huge fangs rubbed together producing the sound she had heard. She stared at the spider for a while before turning to Drake. This thing yours? Don't you worry, nun, said Zothis, appearing at Drake's side. Reckon Rees taking a liking to you. See how she ain't trying to eat your face? Means she likes ya. Drake shrugged and Jez turned her attention back to their prey, ignoring the little beast as it chittered beside her. As the fortune pulled alongside the merchant cog, Jezet could see its crew were armed and waiting for the pirates, though not a one of them looked ready to fight, only willing. Jez had been in fights before, more than she could or cared to remember. She'd been in battles before, she'd even sparred with Thankwell aboard a ship before, but never had she been involved in a clash like this. Time became a blur of rolling decks, screaming faces, and blood. She was one of the first across, and the first into the fight, foregoing the use of a grappling line and simply leaping across from one ship to the other as they pulled close. Men came at her from all sides, but none of them were prepared for an excited blade master, determined to do damage, and none of them were warriors. They were sailors, and they weren't fighting for king or country or money. They were fighting for their lives. Jezet knew that, but somehow the thought got lost amongst the thrill of battle. The two ships danced a dangerous jig together, and Jezet Velern danced with them. She fought her way from bow to stern of the cog, cutting a swath through any that dared to stand up before her, and the pirates of the fortune surged in her wake. Some occasionally caught up to her, fighting alongside her, spattered with blood and grinning just as she was. The giant spider was there, too. At least once she saw it spit its silky webbing into a sailor's face, 
and watched as the man dropped to the deck, clawing at his bloody face, unable to scream or even breathe. Before long, she found herself on the quarterdeck of the cog, with only the captain of the smaller vessel left standing before her. He was a tall man, well-dressed and well-groomed, but a coward. He had stayed out of the fight for his ship until now, and when he saw Jez approach, he dropped to his knees and begged for parley. Jezet neither knew what the word meant, nor cared. Wait! she heard Drake shout from behind. Jez looked back to find the captain leap up the last steps onto the quarterdeck. His cheeks were flushed, his hair was tousled, and his sword was bloodied. Jezet respected that. The man had fought alongside his crew. She turned back to the captain of the cog. Why? Drake put a hand on her shoulder and turned her away from the cringing captain. Because, while we all like ourselves a spot of murder, there's something we pirates like more, he said to her, so close she could smell the mint on his breath. Money. Captains tend to own their ships, and that means they're worth ransom. Jezet spat, shrugged, and stalked away, wiping her sword down and placing the blade back in its scabbard. Drake followed her. Get that simpering bilge pump where he belongs, and sweep the ship, Drake ordered. We keeping it, Captain? Not this time. Take what you can, then scuttle it. He caught up with Jez as she approached one of the makeshift walkways. You look like you could use a drink, Jezit. She grinned at him. Wouldn't say no. Inside Drake's cabin, Jez paced like a caged animal. Her mind spun from one thought to another, replaying the short fight over and over, analyzing every move she had made and deciding how she could have been better. It was not uncommon for her, and it was, in fact, her own particular method of unwinding. Only she didn't want to unwind. She was enjoying being wound. Drake handed her a glass, and she downed the contents in one, swallowing down the cough as the rum seared her throat. He poured her another, and she gave it the same treatment. When she stopped pacing, she found the pirate watching her with blatant interest, and worse, she found she liked it. It didn't take much of an effort to make the next step. Jez dropped the empty glass and advanced on Drake, pushing him against his desk. She stepped close, close enough to smell him, and close enough for him to smell her. The flicker of a grin passed Drake's face, and then he bent his head and kissed her, and she kissed him back. His hands went exploring, rubbing first against her breasts and then down her hips until they reached her ass. He pulled her close and she let out a strangled gasp. Her own hands tore at his shirt, ripping it open to expose his chest. Drake was sitting on the desk now, his hands gripping her buttocks as they kissed each other with wild, bruising passion. Jez placed one knee on the desk, grinning as she stared into his dark eyes. Jez! She stopped, her own voice in her head snapping her out of her strange trance. Drake leered back at her, the ghost of confusion passing across his eyes. He made to kiss her again, and she recoiled, pushing off the desk and backing away a few steps. They were both breathing heavy, Drake with a half-smile, watching her, licking his lips, and Jez trying to make herself look somewhere else, anywhere else. The night seemed almost like a dream. Drake had been ready to let his crew rape her, and then, the ship, the battle. She hadn't killed men like that for a long time, not since the days of Catherine and Constance and the Angel's Blades, not since Thankwell. Without a word, Jezet turned and fled, crashing through the door to Drake's cabin and storming down into the hold of the fortune. There she found herself a dark corner and silently wept bitter tears of anger. Chapter 25 Jezet
Standing on the forecastle, on a day lit by relentless sunshine, it was easy for Jez to see why people fell in love with the sea. It was beautiful. A vast crystal blue of rolling waves, with beams of light fracturing and dancing off the surface. Jez wasn't fooled, though. She knew the sea for what it really was. Cold, wet, infinitely dark, and infinitely dangerous. The truly wise feared the water, and though Jez didn't count herself among them, she definitely agreed with them. In the two weeks since their attack on the cog, she had learned the names of many of the fortune's crew, and even a few nautical terms. She had come to enjoy standing here at the bow, staring out over the water, and had somehow managed to strike up a strange sort of camaraderie with a giant spider. The little beast often found its way into her company, and more than once she had awoken to find it watching her. She chose to believe it was watching over her and not deciding on the best time to eat her. In the two weeks since their attack on the cog, she had also studiously avoided Drake Morass as much as was physically possible. Unfortunately, it was his ship, and she was discovering ships were not really that big. The few times she had run into Drake, she had done her best to seem terse and uncooperative, but the man had a charm all of his own, and Jez found herself always drawn into conversation or jab trading. Those she could handle, just as long as things didn't get physical. She had a history of making poor choices once her blood was up. Blade masters were not supposed to kill for fun. They killed for money, or for loyalty to a lord, for honor, for a challenge, or to protect themselves, but they did not kill for fun. Yuri had been very strict on that regard making certain she knew he wasn't training her to be a cold-blooded killer. On the cog, though, Jezet had enjoyed it, and those men hadn't even served her as a challenge. They were just... there. Afterward, she had almost enjoyed Drake, and that was something else that could never happen again. Otherwise, she didn't deserve the chance to protest her innocence to Thankwell, and that was something she desperately wanted. None of the pirates had tried to rape her again since that first time. Whether that was Drake's influence or the effect of them seeing her in battle, she didn't know. But it was something she was glad of. Sending them a message just the once was a chore. If she had to do it again and again, she would quickly run out of pirates to maim. Ship ahoy! Right behind us! Princess shouted from the nest. Jez recognized his voice immediately. Despite her best intentions, she felt her blood stir at the prospect, but she ignored it as best she could. It didn't take long to cross from one end of the ship to the other at a full run, and Jezet had always been fast. It was mere moments before she was standing at the aft railing staring at a speck of black on the shimmering blue horizon. Drake calmly joined her at the rail. She could feel him staring at her, and it caused a squirmy feeling in her gut she both knew and hated. Zothus joined them shortly after, with Ri sitting on his shoulder, clicking and chittering to itself. The first mate stood next to his captain and dwarfed him. Though Drake was not a small man, Zothus was both tall and broad. His head was entirely hairless, even devoid of eyebrows and a large, scrawling tattoo stretched from his left cheek all the way down his bared, bronze torso, crossing over to the right side of his body before disappearing below his trouser line. The design made no sense to Jezet, a swirling mass of lines and shapes she couldn't understand, but it fascinated her all the same. Navy? Zothus asked. Drake shook his head. Could be... Seems unlikely this far out. Might be hunting bad people like us. We have been running slow for a couple of weeks. He caught Jez looking at him and grinned as she looked away. No rush, eh? The captain took his spyglass from his belt and handed it to the spider. Up. Re flexed its fangs and took hold of the little spyglass before leaping from Zothus's shoulder onto a rope and scuttling up it until it hit the rigging. 
From there it zigzagged upwards. Jezit lost sight of the little beast, and a few moments later she heard Princess's scream. Well, he screams like a girl, Drake said, grinning at Jez. She laughed back. Zothus! Princess shouted from the nest. Keep your little demon away from me! Drake took a deep breath and bellowed back. The second you see colors, you let me know, princess. I can't. What happens if they're navy? Jez asked. We run or we fight. Run. We can outrun them? Drake laughed. This here is leisurely sailing for the fortune. Don't see no need to run her ragged. But if that ship's a threat, and if we don't feel like a fight, we'll show them what our ass looks like. He took the cue to look over at Jezet's ass. She glared at him. Reckon we go a little while if you... No. The captain sucked on his teeth. Good job, I like a bit of teasing. You'll come around eventually. Jezet ignored him staring at the boat behind them. Could it be one of hers? The Dragon Empress? Nah, she was never even after us. What? Jezet turned to find a smug grin on Drake's face. I distinctly remember being locked in a flooding cell and being arrested. All part of the plan. Whose plan? Hers. Mine. A sort of a combined effort, really. See, Ray has been wanting to make a few changes to her empire for a while now, but she needed more involvement from its people, and less from the magistrates. You were needed to show the people that women, and not just their empress, could be more than just ornaments to be shown off and hidden in equal measure. And you played your role very well. A real cooperative little pawn. The women on the boat? The attack? All staged. My little Ray, she knew what she wanted to do with her empire, but didn't know how to go about it. So she asked me and I came up with a plan. Drake looked at her and Jez felt her cheeks redden. Problem is, she couldn't have you sticking around after. The political power you'd have wielded would have been too dangerous for her. I wouldn't. A funny thing about folk in power, they don't like letting go of it. Any of it. She needed you to play your part, then she needed you to go. So? So I stepped in again. I needed some time away from her anyway. This works out best for all involved. Not for me, Jez shouted at the pirate. Not for Thankwell. Drake nodded. I well. Thing about pawns is, uh, they're there to be sacrificed. Kill him, Jez. But she knew she wouldn't. She'd never survive his crew turning on her, and she needed to tell Thankwell the truth. She would not allow herself to die before she got the chance. What about the magistrates? she asked. They would never allow any sort of... Reform? Drake laughed again. There ain't exactly many survivors. Most suffered an unfortunate case of drowning during the storm. Way I understand it is, one of the struts gave way. Whole district sank. Very tragic, and no way to predict. No way Ray could possibly be blamed. In fact, there ain't really anyone to challenge her power anymore. Seems to me she can do... Almost anything she wants. And I reckon last thing on her mind is chasing after us. She knows I'll come back eventually. Why? Drake looked sidelong at Jez. She's very limber. Jez snorted. Back in Larkos, you said she had agents in the city looking for us. A lie. I felt like the fortune needed a woman's touch. And you and me, Jezit, we're a lot alike. We're nothing alike. No? Uh, we both like danger. Both like being dangerous and being around dangerous. 
both like a spot of killing, don't deny it. I saw you after that fight, all hot and bothered. I reckon, he licked his lips. Yep, I can still taste you. She swung at him. A full fist snapped towards Drake's face, and the pirate was waiting for it. He blocked and hit back. A lazy blow Jez avoided with ease. Before she could stop herself, she reached back for one of her short swords, and it flowed like water from its scabbard toward Drake's neck. His own blade was out in a flash, and the two weapons hissed as they met. Neither Jez nor Drake made another move. They just stared at each other over naked steel. As fast as he was, Jezet had already assessed the pirate, and she knew the truth of it. I could kill you, she said, her voice flat and emotionless. The corner of Drake's mouth twitched upward. I know. Makes it even more exciting, don't it? You think you could do it before my boys get to you? Yes, Jez glanced over Drake's shoulder. Zothis was there with his spider, watching them yet making no move, still leaning on the aft railing as though he wasn't in the least concerned. Confident, Drake said, taking his sword away and slipping it back into its scabbard. I like that. But, even if you did, I don't reckon you'd enjoy what came after. My pirates might not take too kindly to you killing their captain. Jez could hear her heart beating in her ears, could feel the blood pumping through her veins. She ignored it all, sliding her own sword back into its place. Captain! shouted Princess from far above. Aye! Drake shouted back, the smile never slipping from his face and his eyes never moving from Jezid. It's the Phoenix! Still water, Drake mused. Now, what would that ponce be wanting with me? Jez looked away, walking back to the rail and leaning on it. Is it so unusual for you pirates to talk to each other? Aye, away from port as we are. Could be he wants a chat. Could be he wants what we got in our hold. Never can be too sure with pirates. Deceitful lot, as a rule. What do you think we should do, Jezet Velern? he asked. Jezet thought about it, thought about the cog and how the fight had made her feel, how killing those men had made her feel, how much she wanted to fuck Drake afterward. Run, she said. No sense in risking a fight in open water, nothing to gain from it. She could feel Drake watching her, studying her as he did so for a while before speaking. You heard the captain, Zothis. She says run, we run. Chapter 26 Thankwell Give chase! Thankwell shouted. Captain Stillwater turned dark eyes on the Arbiter before going back to regarding the ship in the distance. Put on more sail, or... Thankwell floundered. Make the ship go faster! One more time, Arbiter. If you try to give me an order on my boat one more time, you can swim after Drake. Thankwell's jaw clenched and his nostrils flared. He stepped close to the captain. We had a deal. You help me catch Drake. Captain Keelan Stillwater placed a hand on Thankwell's chest and pushed. The Arbiter stumbled back a step. Our deal was for me to take you to where Drake is most likely to be. Not catch him. I told you we would never outpace the fortune, and it still holds true. Only reason we got this close is she's been shuffling along, lounging in the breeze. Now she's put to sail, Arbiter. Drake is running, and there's no way we're catching up to him now. Our deal still stands. But he's right there! Thankwell pointed a finger at the ship in the distance. She's right there! He still hadn't told the captain why he was after Drake and the fortune. It was information the man didn't need to know. Right there happens to be well out of reach. And what would you have us do if we did catch her? Drake's running means he ain't in the mood to talk. You think you could take the fortune all by yourself? 
because I don't have the men nor the will to fight him. Thankwell fumed. To have Jezet so close and still so far away was maddening. Despite Inquisitor Vance's orders, Thankwell had chosen to chase after Drake. He justified the defiance easily. Keswick was known to be somewhere in the vastness of the untamed wilds, and Drake's most likely destination was also somewhere in the wilds, so he was completing both tasks. That neither the Inquisitor nor the God Emperor would likely agree with him was no matter. They weren't here, and he was. His thoughts turned to the sword he had stowed safely below decks in a locked chest, to which only he had the key, and only he knew how to safely disarm the charms he had placed to protect it. He didn't like thinking about the demon-possessed blade, but unfortunately he couldn't help it. The thing called to him, whispered to him. It was almost as if every time he managed to forget about it, it intruded on his thoughts to remind him it was there. Thankwell had seen the way some of the pirates had stared at the wrapped package. They didn't know why their eyes were drawn to it, and likely, they couldn't really hear the demons whispering. Yet, it fueled their curiosity, and they knew they wanted it, whatever it was. Inquisitor Vance had told Thankwell what to do with the sword, and it all seemed simple enough. If Keswick's forces proved to be too much to handle, all Thankwell needed was Mjorso and the blood of a demon touched, and the only person Thankwell knew to be demon touched was Keswick himself. Thankwell wrenched his mind away from the demon sword and found Captain Keelan Stillwater watching him. The man was middling height and stocky, and definitely among the better dressed pirates Thankwell had met. In truth, the Phoenix did not much feel like a pirate ship at all. There was drinking and scuffling, and at times the crew were crude, and the captain assured Thankwell if they ran into a fat, juicy merchant vessel, they would run her down and rob the guts from her. But the pirates of the Phoenix, while not polite, were civilized. They dressed well, cleaned themselves, and treated each other with respect. Thankwell couldn't decide whether it was his own image of the pirates that was wrong, or just the men on the ship. One thing he was certain of, though, Captain Stillwater did not like him. He considered for a moment asking the captain why, using his compulsion on the man to explain his obvious dislike. He knew how that would end, and the sea did not look particularly warm. There were other ways, though. Thankwell knew better than most arbiters that often all one had to do was coax the target to start talking, and then shut up, and let them spill it all. Drake has someone. She's very... She's mine. And I want her back. Captain Stillwater cocked an eyebrow and said nothing. Just thought you should know why I'm chasing him, Thankwell continued. Doesn't change a thing, Arbiter. The fortune is faster than the Phoenix. End of. Thankwell swallowed down a sigh. He had hoped the captain might elaborate on his own reasons for striking the deal with Thankwell. It seemed the man was more shrewd than that. You're not from the Pirate Isles, he tried. Captain Stillwater laughed. No one is from the Isles, Arbiter. Folk just end up there, trying to escape whatever it is they're running from. Like the Inquisition. Aye, lots of folk run from that. Not you. Captain Stillwater sucked on his teeth and looked out across the water. Ignoring the blinding sun and the shards of light it sent dancing across the waves, Thankwell tried to follow his gaze and had to shield his eyes from the glare. Five kingdoms. Easterner, from near Land's End. Thankwell let slip the smallest of smiles and kept quiet. He couldn't say he was particularly bothered about the man's reasons for his part of the deal, but right now he would take any distraction he could get. You want to know why? Captain Stillwater glanced at Thankwell, and he could see anger in the man's eyes. Mine is a deal made out of desire for revenge, Arbiter. Is that a problem? Thankwell slowly shook his head. Good. 
because I intend to kill him. I had family once. A mother and father, older brother, younger sister. I had a home. Until Arbiter Prin came. Still, Thankwell kept quiet. He had no love for Prin. Quite the opposite. The rack-thin Arbiter had always enjoyed the judgment too much for Thankwell's liking. Their calling was necessary, but they killed people, and that should never be fun. My father requested him, or he requested one of you. Thought my sister, Lisa, was possessed. She'd always been sickly and quiet, knew things she shouldn't, though not things she couldn't. When Prin arrived, Captain Stillwater paused, taking a deep breath and letting it out slowly. He killed her, burned her at the stake for heresy, burned her alive. She was eight years, and he burned her alive for nothing. Split my family apart. My brother left, couldn't stand to be around. My mother died of something. She'd already stopped wanting to live long before, though. I left soon as I could. The captain again focused Thankwell with his grey eyes. So, that's your end of the bargain. You tell me where I can find Arbit of Prin, so I can kill him, and I'll take you to where Drake is most likely to be. Further than that, I want nothing more to do with you, Arbiter. Are we clear? Thankwell nodded. He could barely even see the ship on the horizon now. Jezet and Drake were little more than a speck, vanishing into the seascape. Part 4 Reunion Chapter 27 Thankwell Get your gear, Arbiter. We're here. Thankwell was awake in an instant, half-remembered dreams of darkness and demons fading quickly. He'd always been a light sleeper, but these days more so than ever. Looking at the locked chest by his bunk, he knew why. The sword whispered to him during the days, and at nights, when he slept, he dreamed of demons. He rubbed at his eyes and yawned looking for the source of the voice that had awoken him. A balding pirate with a tuft of hair was standing at the top of the stairs, looking at him. We're here, the pirate repeated. Captain says to get your gear. You're getting off as soon as we make port. Wonderful, Thankwell said, rolling out of the bunk and stretching. The sooner I'm back on dry land, the better. But. The pirate was already gone. None of them were particularly social toward him, and some of them were damned rude. A few had taken to baiting the Arbiter, in an attempt to get him thrown off the ship early and fatally. Thankwell had stoically ignored all such attempts. Though he'd have been lying if he said there wasn't anyone on the ship, he wouldn't happily judge. It was over a month since their sighting of Drake's fortune, and over a month since it had run off, leaving them in its wake. Captain Stillwater assured Thankwell that no matter how fast the fortune was, she could not be more than a few days ahead of them. The wind had been good and steady all the way, with not a storm in sight, and they had only stopped the once for pirating and twice for more fresh water. Unlike the brutal massacre Thankwell might have expected from piracy, it was mostly a bloodless affair. The crew of the trader had fired a few arrows over toward the Phoenix, but had soon relented when Captain Stillwater had sailed alongside them and promised life to all crew members, so long as they surrendered their captain and their cargo. A short mutiny had followed, and both cargo and bloodied captain had been handed over. Then Keelan Stillwater had briefly questioned the mutinied captain before deciding he was worthless and throwing him overboard. The Phoenix had sailed away, with a hold full of pilfered bounty and not a single loss of life. Stillwater assured Thankwell that was how most pirating went, but he wasn't entirely certain if he believed the man. Thankwell didn't really have much to collect. His coat he had taken off and stowed under his bunk, due to practicality, 
He now retrieved and felt all the better for wearing it again. Nothing made him feel quite so naked and helpless as being bereft of his arbiter coat. His sack full of clothing and supplies he had never unpacked, so he simply shouldered it once more. The demon sword was less simple. First, Thankwell disarmed the protective charms. Two were gone already, and two pirates had burned hands to attest to how well the charms worked. Once the crate was unlocked, Thankwell spent a minute staring at the covered blade. Just being so near to it, he could feel his old wounds ache, and a strange, irritable sensation, like an itch he couldn't quite reach. He took the sword from its chest and quickly hung it from his belt, pulling his coat around it to obscure its presence. Then he was heading for the hatch and onto the deck. It was early dusk outside, the sun just beginning to dip below the waterline, and that surprised Thankwell. It was barely dawn when he had laid down in his bunk, and the days in the wilds were never so short. He had slept an entire day away and still felt unrested. Pirates ran to and fro, some climbing up rigging and adjusting canvas, others washing down the deck or performing a multitude of tasks Thankwell neither had a name for nor understood. Captain Stillwater ran a tight ship and a clean ship, and anyone who did not have a job soon found themselves inheriting one. Thankwell himself had been put to work untangling rope more than once. Quite how the rope got into so tight knots in the first place was a mystery. He didn't think he'd ever understand, and he didn't care to. He'd just be happy never to see a rope again. Captain Stillwater! Thankwell said with false cheer as he approached. The captain turned with a smile on his face that soured the moment he laid eyes on Thankwell. He had been standing, talking with his first mate, a burly man with permanently ruddy cheeks, whose name Thankwell had never bothered remembering. I'm told we've arrived, Thankwell prompted. Aye, that we have. About time I got you off my bloody ship. About time I got that payment you owe me. Thankwell nodded. His hand twitched in his pocket. Most times aboard ship, after so long, he shook uncontrollably from his lack of theft, but not so on this journey. He had taken to sneaking into the cargo hold and pilfering small items, originally stolen from the trader. It kept his compulsive need to steal at bay, and seemed somewhat fitting. First things first, Captain. Exactly where are we? Welcome to Fortune's Rest, Arbiter, Captain Stillwater said, pointing out over the railing. Thankwell felt his jaw drop, and what he was seeing deserved no less. There were ships everywhere. Hundreds of them. More than he'd ever seen collected in one port. Bare masts thrust up in the sky and round hulls bobbed down below on the water. There was no uniformity. Some of the ships were small cogs, mostly used for short trading trips, and others were galleys, best suited to war. Some of the boats faced them while others faced inward or out in a jumble of directions. As Thankwell watched, he saw lights begin to flicker into existence, tiny lanterns on the ships to ward off the encroaching darkness. This is a city, Thankwell said, unsure of whether or not his own words were a question. Captain Keelan Stillwater laughed from beside him, a wide grin splitting his face. Not quite, Arbiter. Fortune's Rest is the largest pleasure house in the known world. Drake claims three hundred ships at last count, a fleet by any other name and verging on an armada, I'd wager. It moves regularly, but those of us with invitations have ways of finding it. It's Drake's, Thankwell said. He owns it? Aye, that he does. Most anyone who's anyone has been here one time or another, and some folks say more bits pass through Fortune's Rest in a night than in the rest of the wilds combined. It's how Drake made his fortune, 
though he's not so stupid as to rely upon it solely. These days he damn near owns Chade, and word tells he's in bed with that bloody thief master in Shrewridge. Thankwell still couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. It almost looked like Soromo. Hundreds of different rafts, all lashed together in a maddening series of walkways, almost like a maze. Only the ships of Fortune's Rest could move, could sail away. Drake Morass had created a mobile city out in the ocean. Is Drake here? Thankwell asked Captain Stillwater. Couldn't say, the captain replied. But then, I never agreed to take you to Drake. Just to where he's most like to be. Way I hear it, he's never gone from here for too long. So, time to pay up, Arbiter. Where do I find Prin? Thankwell snapped out of his wonder and looked at the captain. Stillwater's face had become grave, his gray eyes bright in the waning light. I don't know exactly, Thankwell said. But I can tell you where he's most like to be. There's a fishing village in southern South, between Sword Point and the Riverlands. Village is called Iron Sands. That's where Arbiter Prin was last stationed, and still is, to the best of my knowledge. The lie came easily to Thankwell's lips. He had no idea where Prin was stationed, and nor would he give up a fellow Arbiter, even one such as Prin, for misguided vengeance. Captain Stillwater nodded, his eyes never leaving Thankwell's own. Can't say fairer than that, I suppose. One good deed, as they say. So, we're done, Thankwell said, turning his eyes back to Fortune's rest. We're done. Before Thankwell could ask the captain to lower a skiff, the man grabbed him by his coat collar and spun, dragging Thankwell with him. The world turned and Thankwell felt his feet leave the deck and saw the railing pass beneath him. Then he was falling. The water was more than just shocking. It stunned the breath from his lungs and left him gasping. He was surrounded, submerged and lost, unable to figure out which way was up, and Thankwell gasped and cold water flooded into his lungs. He gagged and coughed all at once but still could get no air. Something gigantic moved close by, and on instinct he kicked toward it, not knowing what it was and not caring. He broke the surface of the water, gasping, coughing, and vomiting salty water. He flailed as he struggled to stay afloat. Thankwell had always hated the water, especially the sea. You could never tell what was below you, in the depths, just waiting. Panic set in, and he flailed again, coughing more and more as he attempted to clear his lungs. Might want to calm down, Arbiter, shouted Captain Stillwater from somewhere above. Thankwell looked up to see the hull of the Phoenix sliding past him slowly, gaining speed. Through water-blurred vision, he could just about make out a group of figures staring down at him and laughter reaching his ears. His bag, coat, and weapons were weighing him down, dragging him down, and he struggled to tread water. Fortune's rest is that way! The figure that sounded like Stillwater pointed, and Thankwell turned in the water. All he could see was the tiny fires of the lanterns flickering in the distance. Hope you can swim, and give Drake my regards! Thankwell wasted no more time on the Phoenix, or its captain, nor on the crew shouting witch hunter-based insults at him. He struck out toward the floating pleasure house and kicked with all his might, steering with his arms as he went and hoping his strength would hold out against the cold seeping into his bones. By the time Thankwell reached the outermost ship of Fortune's Rest, he had lost track of time and barely had the strength to grab hold of the soaked rope ladder that led up to the deck. He steadily pulled himself hand over hand, whispering a lazy blessing of endurance as he went to keep himself going. Usually he would combine two or even three blessings, but he was finding it hard to focus. 
finding it hard to keep his mind ticking over. Eventually, he gained the deck, and with a little more struggling, rolled onto his back and lay there gasping, staring up at the mast above him, and the sky it reached toward, and the tiny blinking stars that pocked the sky. Darkness had set in now, and the cold appeared to have come with it. Thankwell could feel himself shivering and counted himself lucky. He knew it was when he stopped shivering that he needed to worry. Before that happened, he needed to find a fire. And he didn't think the owners of this ship would be too impressed if he set it ablaze. Never seen a man swim to the rest before. How'd you get here? Thankwell rolled over to see a tall, burly man with a face full of beard and a hand full of cutlass. In his other hand, he held a lantern out in front of him, and beyond that light, Thankwell could see another three folk, similarly armed, all staring at him. Boat, Thankwell managed through chattering teeth. Pirates threw you overboard, eh? Aye, they do that to folk from time to time. Bit of hazing. Nothing more. Hazing, Thankwell chattered rolling onto his front and pushing to his knees. They tried to kill me. Nah, you're still alive. They wanted you dead. I reckon you would be. Thankwell let out a ragged sigh and determined not to argue with the man. I need a fire and some food. Well, we got both of those here at the rest, but each'll cost you. Can you pay? Thankwell nodded, and his hand went to his belt, only to find his purse was well and truly gone. He hadn't felt anyone lift it from him, which probably meant he had lost it in the swim. He groaned when he realized. While he had lost his purse, he hadn't lost the demon blade. It clung to him and filled him with dread even now. I appear to have lost my purse. Purse. Well, now, that makes for something of a problem, then. See, we don't just give things away for free here. One of the other men stepped forward and whispered in the speaker's ear. That right? You one of them witch hunters? Thankwell groaned. Yes, I'm an arbiter. A grin broke onto the man's face. Well. That just makes a whole world of difference. Been told one of you might be popping by some point. Never expected you to crawl up out of the drink, though. Come on. The man moved forward and took Thankwell under the arm, hauling him to his feet and supporting him as they went. We'll get you warm and fed. Drake's orders. It turned out the man's name was Ianic, and he was a pirate, or at least he had been up until a few years back. Drake had taken his ship and his crew, murdered the captain, and given the others the choice to die or join Fortune's Rest as a guard. All the guards were ex-pirates, gone legit, according to Ianic, and many of them fared well in their new roles. Ianic had a wife, two children, and a cabin aboard one of the larger boats, a galley by the name of Defiant. He was housed and clothed and paid well enough to provide, and mostly his job entailed patrolling the rest and making his presence known. Crime was a rare thing aboard Fortune's Rest, despite the criminal nature of the entire enterprise. Folk didn't commit crimes because the punishments were somewhere beyond severe and many of the people who frequented were rich enough to consider traditional crime far below them. It seemed Drake had set his pleasure house to be a cut above the rest, and discretion was the name of the game. Discretion and supply, as, according to Ianic, almost any tastes can be catered for. Ianic half-supported, half-dragged Thangwell into the bowels of the ship he had pulled himself up onto, and kicked open the door to the galley. The chef raised a giant metal spoon in complaint, but soon quieted after a hissed word from Ianic. The pirate sat Thankwell down in front of the fire 
and wandered away to fetch some food. Blood dripped from Thankful's fingers to the ground below. A steady rhythmic drip, drip, as it rolled down the channel on his arm, across his hand and down his digits. The wolves below yapped and growled and snatched at the dripping gore. They had long since given up worrying at his coat, and now he regretted throwing it at them. The magic controlling the wild canines had worn off, but they were already driven into a frenzy, and the smell of blood only excited them more. Up in the tree, Thankwell was safe from them. It was common knowledge wolves were terrible climbers, but as long as he was up here, he couldn't get his arms seen to, and there was only so much blood loss a man could take before it became as fatal as the beasts that prowled below. Woof, Thankwell said to the wolves. It was meant to be something of a shout, but he was lacking the enthusiasm. The wolves were not so handicapped. They leapt into another flurry of activity, pacing, growling, and jumping at the tree. Thankwell looked around for something he could use as a weapon and came up empty. His sword was long lost, still lodged firmly in the chest of the witch who had summoned the wolves. He must have been mad to summon so many. A pack of nearly twenty, Thankwell found it hard to be accurate in his counting, as the creatures never ceased moving. It had been a hard battle full of near misses, but Thankwell had come out on top, closing the distance to the witch and planting his sword through the man's torso, even as he howled out his final breath. Not a few minutes after the witch's death, the wolves had arrived in force, and they had given chase. Thankwell fled, threw down his coat to distract the beasts, and jumped for the first tree of suitable height. Now he was stuck up here, bleeding to death, while the corpse of the witch, whom he had been sent to capture, was eaten by the same wolves he had summoned. It was strangely fitting in a gruesome sort of way. He shifted his position in the branches, trying to get comfortable, only to shift back when he realized comfortable was the last thing he needed right now. One of the wolves made a valiant attempt at jumping the ten feet up to him and hit the ground heavy. Another snapped at it, and they went back to prowling. White wolves with fur the color of packed snow. Some part of him was aware how rare it was to see such colored wolves down in Sarth, but another part of him didn't care. Rooting around in his pockets, Thankwell found only a small chip of wood, the same chips the Inquisition used to create runes, only this one was blank. He knew it was his only way out, and knew what he had to do. Not many runes would be powerful enough to kill the whole pack, and those that were would likely kill him, too. There was one that would scare them away, though he doubted it had ever been used for such. With no ink to speak of, Thankwell had only one way to inscribe the needed runes onto the chip. He flexed his left hand, set his index finger to the chip, and started drawing. One rune to store the power, he felt himself weakening as he transcribed it, as it absorbed his energy. One rune to summon, one rune to bind. When it was done, he let out a shuddering breath, and without a thought of hesitation, snapped the rune in half, dropping both sides to the leafy ground below. The demon roared into existence in an explosion of noise and darkness. Usually, they faded into and out of this world, but this time, it was almost as though the demon knew it needed to make a grand entrance. The wolves scattered, whimpering and breaking from their frenzied stalking. One was foolish enough to snap at the demon. It made a quick and easy meal for the creature from the void, and blood and wolf parts soon littered the ground. The other wolves had fled by then, long gone. Eventually, the face of the demon turned toward Thankwell, and something that could have been a grin spread across the patch of darkness. Beady, flickering yellow eyes stared into his own, and the mouth opened to speak. Arbiter? Ienix said, shaking Thankwell gently. Thankwell prized his eyes open, an act that took no small amount of effort. 
I was dreaming, he said dumbly. The pirate nodded. That's a side effect of sleeping, so I'm told. How long was I out? Thankwell asked. He felt his compulsion grip hold of Enoch, even as he saw the other man frown. Not long. An hour most. The pirate shook his head and blinked rapidly. Well, that was unpleasant. Sorry, Thankwell said. I didn't mean to do it. Aye, well, no harm done. All the same, I'd rather it didn't happen again. Of course. Good, Enix said, still frowning. Cook whipped you up some stew. Not much meat in it, sad to say, but it's hot and tastes... Well, I've tasted worse. Thankwell took the proffered stew and the heel of stale bread and wolfed it down. It was during that meal he realized he had asked Captain Stillwater questions back on the Phoenix. He hadn't noticed at the time, but his compulsion hadn't taken hold. Whether from exhaustion or from something else, he couldn't be sure. It certainly seemed to be working again now. I need to see Drake, Thankwell said around a mouthful of bread and stew. Figured you might say that. So I had me an ask around while you were out. Ianix said, setting down a cup of something that looked suspiciously alcoholic and then taking a deep swig out of a second mug. He ain't here. And you don't know where he is? Thankwell finished. Can't say I know Captain Morris too well, and he don't seem like the sharing type, especially not to folk like me. Only met him the once. But he was here. He let you know I'd be coming. Seems that way. Enoch took another swig from his mug, and Thankwell followed suit. He couldn't say he'd ever really acquired the taste for grog, but right now the devilish mixture of beer and rum was just about the best thing he'd ever tasted. He felt a warmth spreading through his body as he swallowed it down. I need to get after him, Thankwell said after the grog had slid into his system and was resting comfortably in his stomach. There are ways off Fortune's Rest. We must be near the mainland, near a port. Not too far, not too close. The captain likes to keep his rest off the beaten routes. Don't like folk just stumbling upon us. A few days sailing will get you to overlook, though. Don't know any folk heading that way, but then I ain't the dockmaster. Better to ask around. I don't know, Overlook. Big fort built looking over a bigger cliff. Town just sort of sprawled out below it. Owned by the Farin family. Not much to see or do, but it's the nearest port. Don't reckon Drake will have gone there, though. Thankwell nodded, finishing the stew and then the grog. I need paper and ink. Enoch looked blank. Uh, fabric will do, Thankwell said quickly. Now he had a full belly, he could feel sleep pulling at him, trying to drag him down into sweet oblivion. Something like a bandage. Reckon I can get some? And ink. Enoch shrugged. Thankwell sighed. He'd had a full inkwell in the pack that he had abandoned to make the swim to Fortune's Rest. His entire belongings currently consisted of his clothes, his coat, his weapons, a small tube of black powder thankfully stoppered to protect it from water, and Miorso. I'll manage with just the bandage. Enoch put down his mug of grog and scampered off. Thankwell fought the urge to sleep, staring into the embers of the dying cook fire. Fire was never safe aboard a ship, and especially one connected to hundreds of other ships, but Thankwell wasn't about to argue. He was simply happy of the warmth. By the time Enoch came back, Thankwell's eyes were very nearly closed. The pirate shook his shoulder gently and proffered a handful of bandages of varying lengths. Thankwell selected one roughly twice the length of his hand and laid it out before him. 
He drew the knife from his belt and cut a slit from his index finger. Uh, Enoch grunted. What are you doing? Thankwell ignored the pirate. He sucked the excess blood from his finger and pumped it a few times to get the blood flowing again. Then he placed it lightly on the bandage and drew a clumsy symbol. The sleepless charm wouldn't be his most effective, but as long as it lasted a day or two, he would be happy with it. He doubted it would take more than that to earn enough money to get to the mainland. He was, after all, a thief surrounded by casinos, bars, and a whole host of rich folk. He tied the bandage in a loop and bared his arm. Pulling the makeshift charm up to his bicep, he tightened the loop and let out a shuddering breath as the magic took effect. It might not keep him from being tired, but it would stop him from falling asleep. You all right, Arbiter? Enoch asked. You look like you could use some sleep. Thankwell laughed bitterly. Believe me, sleep would bring me no rest. Filled with bad dreams. This is better. The pirate nodded slowly, though he looked more than a little skeptical. I'd like to see the sights now, Enoch, Thankwell said. A gambling house would be best. Sure, whatever you say, Arbiter. The pirate stood, and Thankwell with him. Reckon I know just the place. Each ship in Fortune's Rest was more than just a ship. Each and every one was a brothel, or a gambling house, or a fighting arena, or an inn, or a drug den. And each one was owned and operated by men and women loyal to Drake Morass. Enoch claimed a person could sate any desire in the floating pleasure house, and Thankwell could well believe it to be true. He saw two women, one a southerner from the wilds with skin as black as the night, and one with the pallor and pointed eyes of the Dragon Empire, sat outside a cabin on a ship. They were playing a game called Buis. It was a strategical game Thankwell had never managed to pick up, despite Jez's frequent attempts to teach him. The girls were placing chips on a board. On one side, the chips were black, and on the other, white. Depending on the placement, one girl would capture the other's pieces and flip them over. The winner would be the one with the most chips their color at the end. When the women saw Thankwell and Enoch crossing from the previous ship to theirs, they stopped playing, and the southerner reached across the table, took the other girl's breast in hand, and licked at the nipple. Thankwell looked away. Enoch chuckled. They specialize in that sort of thing here on Percy's Ghost. Never been in for it myself, but I know a few lads who swear by it. One woman, too. That sort of thing? Thankwell repeated. Yeah, same sex stuff. Two women, one cock. Ain't the weirdest thing the captain offers at the rest. But. It's one of the better earners, I hear. They crossed the deck of Percy's ghost and onto another wooden walkway connected to a ship called Dragon's Dare. The deck of the new ship was deserted, with no sailors, no guards, no customers, and no workers. Thankwell looked at Enoch, who was frowning and clearly a little uneasy. Cross this one quickly, Arbiter. You don't want to see what goes on below deck. What could possibly... You don't want to know, Arbiter. Hells, I don't want to know. Let's just move on, quick. Thankwell Ward with his curiosity and won, following Enoch as he rushed across the deck of Dragon's Dare. The ex-pirate led them through a winding route across ships and further into the heart of Fortune's Rest. On each ship, he explained its current purpose and what services it had to offer. Thankwell saw midget people fighting and customers betting on the outcome, and on the very next ship, he heard a roar come from below deck. Enoch explained they set packs of wolves against bears down below. Thankwell couldn't decide if he was more worried that people would be willing to pay to watch such, or that Drake had brought both bear and wolves out to sea to satisfy the desire. The number of customers increased as they approached the center of the fleet, 
and while some looked a lot like the good folk of the wilds, many looked to be rich individuals or couples, and many did not look as though they came from the wilds at all. Folk travel from everywhere to spend their money at the rest, Enoch said. Some never leave. Get in over their heads and have to work it off. Find themselves a life. Slaves, Thankwell said. Enoch shook his head. No slaves at the rest. Not one. Drake don't allow it. Had a slaver pull up a year or so back. Hold full of folk waiting to be sold, and the captain of the ship wanting to hold here for a few days, while he got himself some pleasure. Drake didn't look on that too kind. Seized the slave ship, killed the crew, freed the slaves, and added the ship to the rest. Some of those slaves work here still. So the people who get over their heads, Thankwell prompted, those are willing to work, get put to it, pay off their debts, and then they're free to go or stay as they please. Those not willing to work, well, we have a more permanent solution for them. Makes an example. Not many folk not willing to pay off their debts these days. How have I never heard of this place? Thankwell asked himself. Enoch took it upon himself to answer. Don't reckon many of your kind have. Don't reckon there's many witch hunters been invited. For fear we would come in numbers and shut it all down, Thankwell said, looking around in both wonder and disgust. Hundreds upon hundreds of ships, and he had seen only a handful, and in that handful he had seen much of the worst people had to offer women and men whoring themselves out to any that had the coin and willing to debase themselves in any way for that coin. People paying money to watch others beat each other to death. Drug addicts so cooked by their own particular choice of vice that they could no longer function without it. Thankwell knew how addiction worked all too well and knew the dangers of indulging. He judged most of the people here were addicted to something, pain, pleasure, drugs. He doubted there were any real heretics, but that wouldn't stop the Inquisition shutting the place down just in case. This is it, Thankwell said. The ship they had come to was named Tagen's Treason, a sleek craft of Five Kingdoms' origin, and it had a small host of armed guards waiting on the outside of the hatch. Above deck, toward the aft of the ship, a group of men were sitting, enjoying the cool night and playing a card game on a table lit by a windowed lantern. Aye, said Enoch, this is it. This and the next two ships on are all gaming dens. But they don't play for free, Arbiter. You'll need some coin if you expect to try your luck. Thankwell reached into the breast of his still soggy coat and pulled out a small purse. He judged there was only a few coins inside, and he doubted they were of anything but the smallest currency. But it was a start, and he would wager he could have many times the amount in no time. Enoch looked confused. Thought you said you lost your purse. I found another one, Thankwell replied. Enoch patted down his pockets and was relieved to find his own purse still in his possession. The ex-pirate backed off a step. Reckon I'll leave you here then, Arbiter. One word of warning, though. The house always wins. With that, the man turned and walked away. Thankwell watched him go, watched him look backwards more than once to make certain he wasn't being followed. Only when Enoch was well and truly out of sight did Thankwell turn toward the guards at the hatch and approach with a wide smile. One of the guards, a woman with a crooked nose, short brown hair, and breasts that barely registered as bumps underneath her tunic, stepped forward between Thankwell and the hatch. What's your business here, witch hunter? Thankwell leaned in close and was rewarded by the woman taking a hasty step backwards. I prefer Arbiter. No business. 
I'm here for pleasure, he said, spreading both his hands. Gambling is a hobby of mine, and I hear there's no better place to lose a few bits. The woman looked far from convinced. She looked thankful up and down, her eyes lingering on the covered blade that hung at his belt. The lure of Miorso had become such a constant in his world, Thankwell had almost forgotten he had it. Now he thought about it, he could hear the whispers again, and, judging by the woman's slack expression, she could hear the voices too. Thankwell quickly pulled his coat closer about him, covering the blade with its leather embrace. The woman shook herself free from the trance and wrenched her attention back to Thankwell. We don't take weapons from Folk Arbiter, but we do ask that you don't use them. If asking fails, we then tend to insist, and I assure you we don't insist peacefully. Thankwell started toward the hatch. I'll keep that in mind. He descended in a dimly lit clamor, heavy with the smell of sweat and cashier weed. The ship was full of tables bolted to the wooden floor and each was in use. Betting games, from card gambling to dice rolling to scorpion racing. There were even some that Thankwell had never heard of, including one that seemed to involve small clay tiles, each with a symbol scribed upon it. Some of them actually looked a little like runes, and Thankwell quickly decided to thieve a few of the tiles to replenish his own lost supply of prepared runes. A few of the customers had taken notice of him, some watched with weary eyes, others eyed him up only as a mark, one more body to make money from. Enoch may have warned that the house always wins, but not all games of chance were played against a house, and it always was far easier to cheat other gamblers than it was the establishment. Thankwell couldn't help but notice there were even more armed pirates masquerading as guards down below. He was sure if any of them caught him cheating, he would soon find himself back in the water, and that was something he most certainly did not want. There was a trick to gambling, and it was different from the art of thieving. Pickpocketing took nimble fingers, quick reactions, and the ability to assess potential marks, to determine which were paranoid and paying attention to their purses or jewelry, and which were oblivious to the epidemic of thievery that infested every part of humanity. Cheating at gambling required misdirection, or, as Thankwell had long ago learned, he could just use magic to cheat. The three schools of magic each arbiter received tutoring in were runes and charms, blessings and curses, and sorcery. Of the three, Thankwell had always excelled at the use of blessings and curses. He was, in fact, one of only four members of the Inquisition who could weave together five blessings into a single stream, and that was a feat even the Grand Inquisitor had never mastered. Sorcery, however, was not one of Thankwell's specialties. The school of sorcery was most akin to the powers of witches. It was not the Arbiter's own power fueling the magic, but instead that of Volmar. The Arbiter used their own body as a conduit for the god's power to affect the world, and in doing so, Volmar could wreak his own changes upon it. There were some Arbiters, not to mention both Inquisitors of the family Vance, who specialized in sorcery, and they were without a doubt a force to be reckoned with, and one Thankwell truly hoped he never had to. His own use of sorcery was confined to parlor tricks and the occasional exploding wall and he was well aware the latter wouldn't so much help in this situation, as it would cause a watery death. Stepping up to a dice table, Thankwell reached into his stolen purse and pulled out a coin, a single silver bit of Wilde's currency. Mind if I row? he said, already reaching for the dice. The gambler beside him backed away a step, and the pirate watching over the table, doling out any winnings and collecting the losses, inclined her head. Simple game, witch hunter. You name the number and roll. The number comes up, you take your coin plus another. The number doesn't come up, I take your coin, and you get to put down another. Savvy? Sounds fair. Four. He picked up the dice, whispered a word to them, and rolled a double two. It's one of them, ain't it? Said a voice from behind. 
Thankwell ignored it. After just a few hours, he was well and truly up. The regular use of magic was leaving him feeling a little drained, especially coupled with the lack of sleep, but he had turned a few silver bits into a handful of gold. The trick was not to play one game for too long, so as not to garner too much in the way of suspicion. Also, he was fairly certain being a much maligned witch hunter and feared by everyone helped with avoiding said suspicion. You know... I do believe she's right, boss. He does look quite like one of them. The second voice was male, and carried the unmistakable lightness of good humor. Reckon you just took piss, I do. The first voice again, female and unrefined. Thankwell sighed and picked up his cards. A three and the sun. All he needed now was a fire and... You know, it's really not becoming for such a small lady to speak in such a way. How becoming is it for a small lady to forcefully interpose a dagger up your posterior? There was a moment's silence. Not very. Right, so how's about you shut the fuck up? There really is no communicating with her when she gets like this, boss. Could we not just put her back in the alley from which we took her? Thankwell paid for another card and pulled a spear. He flicked the edge of the card once, and it took on the appearance of a fire. He laid all three cards on the table to a collective sigh from the other gamblers, and then pulled the bits toward him. Well, ain't you gonna kill him? said the first voice again. Thankwell started shoving the ill-gotten gains into his purse, and decided it might be time to turn around, to face his oncoming killer. Don't reckon I will, no. Came another voice, one Thankwell recognized. Don't do that no more, Rill. Besides... Thankwell turned around and stared into the face of a ghost. The Blackthorn stopped mid-sentence, with his mouth slightly ajar. He looked different with less hair on his head and more on his face, a couple more scars around the burn, maybe, but it was hard to tell. His left eye appeared to be missing, unless he was wearing the patch as a fashion statement. Thorn? The black thorn winced as Thankwell's compulsion locked onto his will. Aye, he said with a grunt. Was that really fucking necessary, Thankwell? Thankwell broke into a wide grin and was relieved to see it mirrored on the black thorn's face though distorted into a horrific pulling of melted flesh on the left side. I heard you were dead, Thorn said, walking forward and clapping Thankwell so hard on the shoulder he stumbled. That so? I heard the same about you. Thorn laughed. Aye, that one's been doing the rounds for a while now, as it happens. Truth is, it's a bit harder to kill me than most folk realize. Never seems to stop him trying, though. Thankwell laughed. It's good to see you again, Thorn. Looks like you have a whole new crew these days. Aye, Thorn said, nodding. I'll introduce you. This fancy fuck is Anders. The little cunt is really. That one is Ben. Six cities, Ben, said Ben. Thorn ignored the interruption. The big one in the back is Susku, and I reckon you already know Henry. Thankwell had overlooked the small woman hiding at the back of the group, but now she tilted back her cavalier hat and gave Thankwell a lopsided grin. Arbiter, she said by way of greeting. Good to see you again, Henry. Wasn't sure you made it out of Hosstown, Thankwell replied. You should have seen Thorn. Cried like a newborn. The little murderess laughed and shoved her hands into her pockets. She seemed less angry than Thankful remembered. Where's that whore you used to crew with? Henry asked. The one that near threw me into the Ural. Aye, Thorn butt in. Where is Jezit? It was the last thing Thankful wanted reminding of, not that it had ever been far from his mind. Drake has her. Anders stepped up beside Thorn. Drake has her? He kidnapped her? Well, Thankwell started, stopped, and scratched at his scarred arm. Not exactly, 
She kind of went willingly. Oh, that makes sense, Anders replied. There was something familiar about him. Thankwell couldn't quite shake the feeling he had seen the man before. Sorry, Thankwell, the Blackthorn said. Hard to keep the interest of a lass like Jessit Verlern, I reckon. No, Thankwell said. That's not it. She... she had to go. Or... I'm looking for Drake. He has her, and I need the truth from him. You should try asking Anders where the bastard is, Rilly said, while picking at something between her teeth. Blooded cocksucker works for him. The Blackthorn let out a groan. Thankwell looked at Anders. Anders smiled back at Thankwell. He grabbed Anders by the collar and dragged him forward, spun him around, and slammed the man down onto the card table. He struggled a little, attempting to push back, but Thankwell was the stronger of the two, and he slammed Anders back down again. Where is he? he demanded. Anders shuddered as Thankwell's will dominated his own. I don't know, the man whined. What do you know? Thankwell screamed back into the man's face. Anders just groaned on the table. The question was too open. There was no answer. Thankwell was just about to ask another when he felt a strong hand on his shoulder. He struggled against the pull, but he couldn't match the Blackthorn for strength, and slowly he found himself dragged away. Thorn positioned himself between Thankwell and the prone form of Anders. From his peripheral vision, Thankwell noticed some of the guards taking an interest, but none were investigating. No more of that, Thankwell, Thorn said, his face as stern and unyielding as the steely tone in his voice. Anders might work for Drake, but he works for me too, and I ain't about to let you question him like that. Time was. You didn't like to ask questions, as I remember it. If he knows anything, he don't, Thorne interrupted. I don't know, Henry cut in. Reckon we should let the Arbiter at him. Might finally get the truth from the little bastard. Anders rolled off the table and onto the floor. I know we've had our differences, my dear, but I don't think that's cause to want me tortured. Henry just shrugged. Thankwell turned back to Thorn. The man seemed taller than he remembered, towering over him as he stood between the Arbiter and Anders. I need to be certain. You can be certain. I'm telling you, Anders don't know nothing. Good? Thankwell forced his breathing to slow and unclenched his jaw. He did trust Thorn, despite, or perhaps because of, all they had been through. He also knew there was no sense in arguing. He was a little outnumbered. Fine, he said. Sorry, Anders. Good, Thorne said. He turned and extended a hand to Anders, helping him up from the floor. Truth is, we're here on Drake's leave. By the curses that erupted from the rest of Thorne's crew, Thankwell judged he was not the only one surprised. We're working for that fuck again, Thorn? asked Rilly. Nah, Thorn said, his one eye staring at Thankwell with doubled intensity. We ain't working for him, but he knows we're here, and his pirates know to leave us be. Why are we here? asked Six Cities Ben before breaking into a grin. Not that I ain't enjoying some of the attractions. Thorne sniffed and looked to Henry, who shrugged back. Then he turned back to Thankwell. Reckon this is one of those things we should be talking about somewhere a little less public. Thankwell nodded. Lead the way. Thorne led them to one of the ships at Fortune's Rest that acted as a brothel. He paid for a room, the largest cabin the ship had, and, much to both Anders and Ben's disappointment, no women. The request was unusual, to say the least, but the woman in charge was compliant enough when she saw Thorne's face, and even more so when she saw his money. Thankwell was last into the room, and the big, quiet one, Susku, closed the door behind him. Thankwell hadn't managed to step into the room before a big hand touched lightly on his shoulder. 
He turned to find Susku staring at him with equal parts wonder and curiosity. He wore a light suit of bronze link, despite the weight of it, and a white robe over the top with a white wrap around his head. He was as tall as the Blackthorn and even bigger in build. You have no color, the man said, with not a trace of Wilde's drawl in his voice. Um, Thankwell grunted, stepping away from the man. Thank you. He moved further into the room, finding himself a wall to stand with his back to. Thorn had found a similar wall and stood with a similar posture. Anders collapsed onto the bed, heedless of the sexual deviances that had no doubt been performed upon it. Henry stood in the center of the room with her hat tilted to hide her face. Ben collapsed upon a chair and stretched with a noisy yawn, and really paced about the room like a caged animal, waiting for a chance at freedom. So, yeah, there's a reason we're here, and it ain't just to see how fucked up some of these folks are. Henry and Anders already know this. Looks like we got another line from Keswick. A hush fell upon the room, as all the members of the Blackthorn's crew gave each other significant glances, and Thankwell let out a sigh. Fate may have forgotten that he existed, but it didn't stop it having a keen sense of irony. He had purposefully shirked his responsibilities and his orders to come here chasing Jezet, and yet he already knew how this conversation was going to end. You're chasing after Keswick, Thankwell said purposefully not making it a question. I, said the Blackthorn, have been ever since I escaped the Inquisition. Truth is, I thought he'd killed a couple of friends of mine. Turns out, now, they're both still alive, and at least one of them is fucking Morass. Seems he might have mentioned that last I saw him. She's not, it's not the issue. The bastard still took my eye, and I mean to pay him back for that. And I made a deal a while back, still looking to hold up my end, if you are still good for yours. My end? Thankwell repeated. I kill Keswick, the Blackthorn said, his one eye staring at Thankwell. And you get me that pardon. Don't much like these arbiters coming after me. You were never... There aren't any arbiters hunting you. I? You tell that to the one that killed Rilly's da and Ben's brother. Cause the bastard was after me, and no mistake. Don't much want any more being sent. Thankwell nodded. Good, continued Thorn. Man here knows where Keswick is, goes by the name of Carlston Barrow, and it just so happens we got some unfinished business with that fuck too. Now, we were looking to go at him the hard way, with a long session of arduous torture. Reckon Henry was looking forward to it, but I know for a fact Susku ain't too fond of the torturing. The big man by the door nodded solemnly. Seen it once too many times in my life. Six Cities Ben leaned forward on the chair, rubbing his hands together with a wide grin. Oh, I've been waiting for this. A few gritty details from Pern's past. So, how many times you seen men tortured? Susku shrugged. Once. It ain't an issue no more, Thorn continued. Seeing as you clearly don't mind asking questions these days, Thankwell, reckon you could do the interrogating? Use that compulsion of yours for good. Wait, Rilly shouted. We're working for the Arbiter now. The Arbiter's working for us, Thorn shouted back. Thankwell snorted. The Arbiter's working with you. Same bloody thing, Thankwell. Nah, Rilly was still shouting. Don't trust him, and neither should you. Fucks tried to kill you. Killed my da. Killed a lot of folk. Rilly, would you just shut up? Thorn said, his voice taking on a commanding tone. Because if you don't, 
by all the hells, girl. I'll... What? Rilly asked. You gonna hit me? I've hit girls younger and prettier, who deserved it a damn sight less. Thanquil looked at the young woman. Her delicate features were at war with her posture, her attitude, and her appearance. Bright red hair cut to various maddening lengths, piercings through nose, ears, and lips, a scrawl of ink across the base of her neck disappearing below her bulging jerkin. She also had the foulest mouth Thankwell had ever heard on a woman, and he had lived with Jezet for over a year. She snorted. Da never fucking hit me. You won't neither. Your da should have taken a fucking lash to you back on his boat. Might have taught you a few manners. Rilly sneered at Thorn. What makes you think he didn't? You just said... The Blackthorn let out a groan and shook his head. Henry. The little woman turned, and Thankwell saw a grin from underneath the hat. She advanced on Rilly silently, her hands open and ready. Rilly backed away, her anger and courage both forgotten. All right, Rilly said as she bumped into the far wall. All right, enough! Henry tipped back the front of her hat and Thankwell could clearly see the sneer on her face and the scarred lip that created it. She was pretty, in a strangely feral sort of way, but Thankwell knew just how dangerous the little woman was. Glad we had this talk, Henry said with a wink, and walked away. Rilly quickly took to sulking. Right we are, then, Thorn said, eyeing each person in the room. Any other questions? Thankwell held up a hand. I'm wondering what it is this Carlston Barrow does for Keswick. Oh, I know this one, Anders said from the bed. What we know for certain is he's providing Keswick with people. Thankwell waited for the man to elaborate. He didn't. Well, that can't be it. Might be. There's more to it than that, said Thorn. These folks he sell into Keswick, they all got what you arbiters call potential. Swift used to work for Keswick, doing the same thing, up until Henry gutted him. Henry spat. Well, Susku used to work for Swift, and he said Keswick gave Swift some sort of jewel or something, which set to glowing around certain folk. Thankwell's hand reached into one of the hidden pockets of his coat, but came out empty. He had lost his own gem to the witch's daughter back in Fort Talon. Near as we can figure it, he's recruiting folk with this potential, creating an army of evil arbiters or something. Thankwell thought about telling them all the truth, but decided against it. The Inquisition's dirty secret, its connection to the demons, was something he wanted to keep hidden if possible. It was something he had to keep hidden. Something all Arbiters had to keep hidden. No more questions? Thorne asked. No more whining? He looked at Rilly. Good, cause I happen to know just where we can find Carlston Barrow. Thankwell hung back with Rilly at Thorne's request. Carlston kept guards, and the Blackthorn's cunning plan was to simply take them by surprise. And, as he was quick to point out, Arbiters were not entirely inconspicuous. Though, as far as Thankwell could see, neither was a tall, one-eyed, heavily scarred Blackthorn. Got a hole in your coat, Rilly said. She was leaning against the wall of the boat the very same, in a way that was eerily reminiscent of Thorn. Thankwell looked down at the bottom of his arbiter coat. She wasn't wrong. He shrugged. Dragonbite. Rilly snorted. Thankwell ignored her. The very same was a fat-bottomed craft better suited to transport of people or cattle. It had plenty of cabins, varying from cupboard-sized to inn-sized and held regular bare-knuckle fistfights. 
It was also one of Carlston Barrow's favorite places, and where he conducted much of his business. He was a loner, and a fixer, and a bookie, and a hundred other things as well. He was extremely well-connected, and had a small army of tough, violence-inclined bodyguards, all able, willing, and more than willing to kill or maim at his command. Despite this, the Blackthorn had not seemed particularly troubled. You and Thorn go a ways back? Rilly asked, staring at him from her section of the wall. They were waiting in one of the cupboard-sized cabins until one of Thorn's crew came to give them the good news. We... we fought against each other for a while, then fought with each other for a while longer. I was the one who sent him after Kessick, just assumed he'd run off back to the wilds afterward. Rilly spat. Instead, Kessick beat him, ripped his eye out, and kept him prisoner at your Inquisition. That certainly seems. And you just left him there, she snorted. Fucking witch hunters. Thankwell shot her a sidelong grin. You're almost like a little Henry. Rilly's expression darkened even further. I'm taller than her. A brooding silence settled over the cupboard as they waited for word, and Thankwell almost started to fear the Blackthorn's plan had failed, that the rest of the crew were dead, and he would be stuck in the cupboard with the angry little woman for even longer. Then the door opened to the mustached face of Six Cities Ben. Were you two getting friendly in here? he asked. Fuck off, Rilly said, bashing into Ben's arm as she barged past him. He only laughed in return. Believe it or not, Arbiter, she's usually very cheerful. The room was carnage. Carlston Barrow had his own cabin on the very same, and he had it decked out with a wealth of finery. Most of that finery, from the desk to the paintings to the rug, to the devilishly pretty whore in the corner, was now speckled or in some cases covered, with blood. Four bodies lay on the floor inside the room, and another one lay outside, with a steadily seeping red wound on her back. Carlston himself seemed uninjured for the most part, unless one counted unconsciousness as a form of injury. He was an aging man, round but thick with long disused muscle, with a healthy color to his skin and a reek of smoke about him even when unconscious. Taking them by surprise seemed to work, Thankwell mused as he stepped over the body of a tall, slim man with hair tied into a tight warrior's tail. The Blackthorn rasped out a laugh. I didn't work, so we resorted to aggressive negotiation. Reckon it did the trick. Henry sucked at her teeth. Sep for Anders almost stabbing me. Anders was busy uncorking a bottle from one of the wall cabinets. Almost, my dear, almost. You will note that I managed to avoid such a costly and messy mistake. Well, in that case, all is forgiven. Come over here and fuck me, Henry spat with a venomous stare. Anders tooted. I would love to, my lady, but we have company. The Blackthorn sighed. I preferred it when they were fucking. He looked at Thankwell. You ready to find out what this piece of shit knows? Thankwell glanced down at the prone form of Carlston, slumped over his wooden desk. He needs to be awake. Thorn reached out and slapped the man across the face with a three-fingered hand. Carlston groaned in response, and his eyelids began to open. Done, Thorn said with a grin. Carlston, Thorn said to the man as he started to come around. Hey, cunt, remember me? Remember her? He pointed toward Henry as she stood, grinning from ear to ear with her twin daggers glinting in the lantern light. You tried to have us killed. A terrified realization passed across Carlston's eyes and beads of sweat sprang forth all over his plump face. You killed them all! 
Thorne looked around the room at the five dead bodies. Yeah, we did. And none of Drake's boys will be coming to save you neither. See, Drake knows something about you. He knows you've been working for Kessick. Just so happens, I'm looking for the fuck. So, how's about you tell me where I can find him, and we'll make this quick. Carlston's eyes went hard. You'll get nothing from me, Blackthorn. He spat at Thorn, a tiny amount of spittle hitting the cell sword on his scarred cheek. No, Thorn started. He's a bookie, said Six Cities Ben quickly, his voice all excitement. Ask him if he wants to bet on that. Thorn sighed and looked back toward Ben. I was fucking getting to that. He turned back to Carlston. Wanna bet on that? Thorn looked at Thankful. Carlston looked at Thankful. Thankful smiled. I rasped Thorn. This here is Arbiter Darkheart. Reckon he might pry the truth from you. Thorn stared at the terrified man. Where is Kessick? His compulsion locked on to Carlston's will and tore the truth from his lips. Absolution. Thankwell looked at Thorn. Um. That it? asked Rilly. Well, I... Thankwell began. Bloody useful having one of these witch hunters around, ain't it? Six Cities Ben said with a grin. Absolution's a fair ways away, but we can catch a boat to Port Loyal and travel north from there. Pick us up some horses, maybe. Absolution is a place, Thankwell decided. Aye, said Thorn. Old town in Droan territory. Used to be a logging village, till tales of ghosts scared folk away. Pretty much a deserted void these days. Or at least it was. Thankwell walked around to the other side of the table where Carlston Barrel sat, sweating into his bright red silk shirt. How do we know that fuck told the truth? Thankwell heard Rilly ask. You work for Kessick? Thankwell asked the man. Carlston groaned as the truth was forced from him. Yes. What do you do for Kessick? I provide him with people. His face was almost as red as his shirt. People with the potential? Yes. Thankwell leaned in close. What is Kessick doing with those people? Carlston's eyes focused on Thankwell, and he struggled and strained to keep the truth in. He's b putting demons in them. Thankwell was vaguely aware of an argument taking place around him, but he ignored it all. He pulled his pistol from his belt, pointed at Carlston Barrow's face, and pulled the trigger. Click. The hammer of the pistol struck metal, yet there was no spark. Thankwell looked at the little gun and realized he hadn't replaced the black powder after his swim in the ocean. Huh. He flipped the pistol over in his hand and struck Carlston in the face with the stock. The plump man tumbled over in his chair and hit the floor, already unconscious again from the blow. Thankwell raised the pistol and hit the man again and again and again. He kept hitting until the only thing left of Carlston Barrow's face was a messy pulp of brain, blood, and bone. Only then did he stop, breathing heavily and spattered with the dead man's gore. When Thankwell looked up, he found every one of the Blackthorn's crew staring at him in shocked silence. Anders' mouth was ajar and really had a short sword in her hand. Slowly, Henry edged around the table and looked down at the mess Thankwell had made of Carlston's face. Yep, we're not getting the bounty on him no more. Chapter 28 Jezit Jez wouldn't exactly call herself a connoisseur of caves, but she'd been inside a few, and this one was particularly pretty. It was the water, she decided. The water, 
and the way the sunlight from outside bounced off of the water, sending rippling blue waves of light across the ceiling of the cave, lighting up all the fangs of rock that hung down, growing toward them all. Peaceful, Jez. Despite all the water, makes a nice change. She felt something light brush against her leg and looked down. Re was there. She was rarely far from Jez these days. The spider stared at her, stared at everything. Benefit of having eyes on every side of your head. Slowly it put a big, hairy appendage on her leg, then another, and another, and started climbing. Jez went back to looking out across the cave. Didn't take long before Re was sitting on her shoulder, surprisingly light for her size, no heavier than a cat, really. The spider rubbed her fangs together and the strange clicking noise filled Jez's ears. Something dark slipped through the calm, crystal water below them. The lagoon in the cave was filled with dark shapes that whipped through the water at alarming speeds, promising painful death to anyone fool enough to test the waters. They weren't large enough to attack a boat, though that didn't make them any less frightening. Jez wondered what they looked like, but none of them had come close enough to the surface to be seen. They had sailed into the cave two days ago on Drake's orders. The captain himself had steered them unerringly to the opening in the cliffside, as though he had been here many times. They proceeded to drop anchor and wait. Drake had not seen fit to explain just why they were sitting here. Shouldn't be surprised, Jez. Pretty bastard has more secrets than teeth, and he's got a full set of those. With the fortune still and lazy, there wasn't much for any of them to do, and boredom soon set in. The pirates drank and sang and gambled and traded stories, most of which Jez would wager were on the lie side of truth, and Jez joined in where possible. Time with the crew was preferable to time with Drake. Jez had hated herself for it, but she couldn't help but be attracted to the bastard, and so she decided limiting her exposure to him was the best for all concerned, or at least the best for her and the best for Thankwell. When she saw the Arbiter again, she intended to be telling the truth when she claimed she'd never fucked Drake. He didn't make it easy for her, though, always finding time to catch her alone, playing on her love of a good fight, and all of his suggestive stares. Re chittered on her shoulder. Never seen her take to anyone quite like that, Drake said from behind. Maybe it's because you're both such dangerous ladies. He always seems to appear whenever you think of him, Jez. Jez snorted, re-chittered. Reckon she'll be right sad to see you leave when you go. Where did she come from? Jez asked, avoiding the subject. Never seen a spider her size before. Island just off the coast of the Forgotten Empire. Jez turned her head to glance at Drake, but got a face full of spider leg instead. Re chittered but didn't move. Never heard of a forgotten empire. That'd be because it's been forgotten, Drake replied. He could hear the smile on his voice. Used to be the far south, down past the Dragon Empire was a thriving kingdom. Or so I hear. Thousand years ago or some such, it was an empire to rival Sarth and rich with the gold it produced, too. All sort of folk went there. Merchants, pirates, princes, even arbors. Reckon, if anyone knows most about the Lost Empire, it's the Inquisition. Rumor has it, one day, the entire empire went quiet. Dead as the night. Cities gone. Ports vanished. And... No one knowing why. No one coming out of the forest. Forest. Whole empire was surrounded by it. Giant trees taller than the tallest buildings. Some folks say the empire's cities were built in and around those trees. 
entire populations living hundreds of feet above the ground, till it all went dead. Nobody goes in ever comes out again these days. Folk go looking for lost treasure, or ancient civilizations and such, and none ever return. Most folk don't even know it ever existed now. Hence, Forgotten Empire. And re? Jez prompted. Drake chuckled. Island off the coast of the far south. Saw some things on the beach. Zothis decided to lead a party ashore and check it out. Took eight men with him in the skiff. He's the only one that came back. And he brought her with him. Though she were a fair bit smaller back then and not nearly so cuddly. Jezet turned to face the captain. Re leapt from her shoulder, springing a good ten feet up and away onto the rigging, where she quickly skittered out of sight. Jez leaned back against the forerail of the ship and sucked at her teeth. What are we doing here, Drake? Not that getting ass overhead drunk with the crew each night isn't fun. Far as I can tell, with you there's always a plan. And this... Aye. Always a plan, Jezit Velarn. And this is part of it. About ready to come to an end, though. He pointed off toward the back end of the cave. It was dark in the rear, surrounded by cold, hard rock. Yet Jez could make out a small, flickering light that looked an awful lot like a lantern. It seemed as though there was a small landing area back there. Solid ground amidst the lagoon of treacherous water, and a group of folk were loading themselves onto a skiff. Taking on passengers? Jez asked, her voice betraying her curiosity. Drake shrugged. Unloading one, as it happens. You ready to leave? Jez felt something clench up inside. She'd been on the fortune for over a month and she wasn't entirely sure she did want to leave. Despite everything, she'd found she actually enjoyed the pirate's life. Time to leave, Jess. Time to go find Thankwell. Where are we going? she asked. Not we, Drake said with a sad smile. Just you. Jez refused the feeling that welled up inside her and resolutely denied its existence. So, this'd be pretty much your last chance. Reckon we got time for me to... Who are they? She asked quickly. On the boat. They work for a trusted partner of mine. She's down there on the boat, too. Goes by the name of Rose. Reckon you met her brother before his very timely and more than welcome demise. They'll be taking you the rest of the way. Rest of the way? Drake was silent for a little longer than a moment, just long enough for Jez to realize something wasn't right. Reckon we'll be taking those weapons off yours now, Jezit. She turned to look at Drake, and found Zothus and a host of pirates, the very same crew she had spent the last month pirating with, advancing up the deck toward them. Her long sword slid cleanly from its scabbard into her right hand, and her left hand found the hilt of one of her short swords, still buckled in the small of her back. She dropped into a battle-ready crouch. Never trust a pirate, Jez. Least of all, Drake fucking Morris. Can't fight us all, Jezit, Drake said. Some of the pirates had weapons to hand, but their captain was empty-handed, as though he knew Jez wouldn't attack. She edged a step toward him. Best defense is stabbing someone in the face. They don't tend to fight back after that. All right, Drake said, holding up his hands. Maybe you could fight us all. Hells, maybe you'd even win. Beat us back long enough to make a break for sure. At the very least, I'd take you down with me, she spat. The pirate captain nodded. Sounds fun. Doubt you'd survive the swim, though. Nasty things in the waters around here. I could steal a boat. 
I? Now that might work. Drake looked around at his gathered pirates. We should probably make it easy for you. Lower one of the skiffs. What? Jez edged her foot closer again. Drake was well within striking distance. You want to leave? Run away? Never see us again? Go, Drake said. We ain't gonna stop ya. Eh? This came from Zothis, standing behind his captain. Drake glanced back at his first mate. She won't. Jez snorted. The hells I won't! If you do, I can all but guarantee you'll never see that arbiter of yours again. Don't reckon he has much hope of surviving without you. Jez uncoiled with the speed of a viper strike. She leapt at Drake, leading with her longsword while her left hand slid the short sword from its sheath. The pirate captain barely flinched. The longsword found his neck, and the short sword his balls, and they both pressed so close that a drop of blood sprang free from his neck and ran down the length of the blade. Jez stared at him across her sword, and Drake just smiled back. She had an overwhelming urge to stab him, and for the first time since she'd met him, it completely blotted out the urge to fuck him. Where is Thankwell? she asked, well aware of Drake's crew taking up positions around her. Couldn't say exactly. Uh, not really sure. Can tell you where he'll be, though. Same place you're going. Drake slowly raised a hand and put two fingers against the blade of Jez's longsword. He attempted to push the blade away. Jez resisted, keeping it firmly in place. I'm sure you remember an arbiter by the name of Keswick, Drake said. Hard pressed to forget that one. Just being near him made my skin crawl. Aye, you remember him. Well, he ain't exactly an arbiter no more. Keswick's alive? Jez asked. What happened to Thorn? Aye, it seems he beat the Blackthorn. It killed him, too, I reckon. A shame, really. I always quite liked that arbiter-murdering bastard. So, Keswick survived and ran, came to the wilds, and took up where his master left off. Inquisitor Heron, Jez said. Aye, that same heretic your arbiter put down back in Sarth. Whatever it were she was doing... Keswick is now in charge. And why do you care? Drake grinned and flinched as the tip of Jez's blade dug a little further into his neck. Me and Keswick have a history. Suffice to say, he wants me dead. And uh, the feeling is more than mutual. So, go and kill him. Drake snorted. Ah, so easy. Kessie could see me coming half the wilds away, and most of my power and influence tends to be located around the war, being a pirate and all. Ah, besides, Kessie has his own army these days. Ah, he'd kill me, before I even got close. Better, I reckon, send a witch hunter to kill a witch hunter. One of my men should have made contact already, told your arbiter that Keswick is still alive and where to find him. So, what do you reckon, Jezid Velarn? You think arbiter Thankwell Darkheart will just let it be? Or do you think he'll go after Keswick? Jez could feel herself trembling with anger. Thankwell will kill the heretic. Aye, yeah, he'll try. Jez spat on the deck of the fortune and pulled her swords back from Drake. Tell me where to find them. I'll do better, Drake said, grinning again. I'm going to deliver you right to Keswick as a hostage. 
No better way to get you close to him, right? And how could he refuse? No better peacemaking present from Drake Moras than the lover of the Arbiter being sent to kill him. He'll keep me close, Jez said, finally getting to the root of Drake's plan. Guarded, but close. Ready to use you soon as your Arbiter turns up. All you have to do is bide my time and strike at the right moment. Drake took a deep breath and sighed out with a smug grin, his golden tooth standing out amongst the set of white chompers. All part of the plan. Jez brought her knee up between his legs as hard as she could and was rewarded with the sight of Drake Morass collapsing in a whining heap of pain, curling up to protect his most vulnerable parts. She threw her weapons down on the deck beside him, that part of the plan, too? Chapter 29 Thankful Sleep didn't come easily to Thankful these days. Perhaps, more accurately, it came too easily. But it was something he avoided wherever possible. Before leaving Fortune's Rest, he had purchased himself a new pack, some paper, and an inkwell. They were expensive luxuries aboard the pirate pleasure house, yet he deemed them necessary. Now he had a sleepless charm on his arm, one of more sturdy design than the scrap of bandage, and he guessed it had been roughly four days since he last slept. It was taking its toll and worse. Staying awake was no longer keeping the dreams at bay. They came at him awake or asleep, day or night. You ain't looking so well, Thankwell, Thorne said from across the cabin of False Hope. The others were asleep, some snoring, some quiet. Really, occasionally thrashed and muttered high-pitched words. Even aboard a transport ship and in a locked cabin, the Blackthorn's crew kept a watch, and Thorne had volunteered to be first. You're looking a little ragged yourself, Thorne. Be up. Frayed around the edges and well used, sure. But you ain't looking well. Don't reckon I've seen you sleep since we met, and you've been talking to yourself when you think no one can hear. Thankwell wasn't sure what was more worrying, that others had overheard him talking to himself, or that he didn't remember doing it. His left hand brushed against the sword hanging on his hip. Covered by protective and suppressive charms, he could still hear the voice of the demon within. I'm fine, Thorn. Then there's that whole thing with Carlston. Cracked him like a bad egg. Thankwell snorted quietly so as not to wake any of the others. Bad enough he was having this conversation. The last thing he needed was for any of the others to hear it. Are you more concerned that I killed him? Or that you lost out on the bounty, I wonder. It's a lot of money you cost us there, and no mistake. But that ain't the issue here. And the Blackthorn turned to bounty hunter, Thankwell interrupted. Never thought I'd see the day. You were the most feared name in all the wilds, if I remember right. Still am, Thorn said with a nod. Just... Mostly feared by the other side these days. Folk I used to run with, scared. And folk who used to chase me, buy me drinks. Truth is, people like me don't last forever in the game. So, I decided to change the rules. Play at being the hunter, not the hunted. Better money on this side of the law, too. Least when arbiters don't go around beating the marks to bloody pulp. You're not going to let that go. The Blackthorn sucked at his teeth. It looked as though he was missing a couple since the last time Thankwell had seen him. Thankwell himself was missing just one tooth from his whole set, and it was Thorn who had knocked it out back in Sarth after finding out Thankwell had lied to him and manipulated him to gain his support in dealing with the three heretics within the Inquisition. Truth is, I'm worried about you, Thankwell. 
were going after Keswick, with or without you, and safe to say I'd rather it be with you. But can't have you losing it going all crazy. It ain't just about killing that bastard took my eye. I got a crew to look out for, and I got no intention of losing any of them. Thankwell was dreaming. His vision doubled up, and he saw both the cabin inside False Hope and an old warehouse back in Chade. It was the same warehouse he had purchased over a year ago, and he already knew what was coming. He staggered into the warehouse through a rotting doorway, housing a collection of nailed-together planks that didn't fit the frame. He was wounded, a dozen different little injuries most given to him by the guards of Chade, but two, including the most serious, were presents from the Blackthorn. They had run into each other in Lord Sho's mansion and had fought. Thankwell had seen the mess Thorn had made of Lord Colth, only now he knew the Blackthorn hadn't been the culprit. It had been one of Drake Morris's assassins that had mutilated the fat lord, someone at the ball. Thankwell stumbled and fell through an old crate, rotted through and smelling of death. He rolled onto his back and pulled a charm from his coat pocket. A sleepless charm, but he was already wearing one. The Blackthorn was staring at him curiously from the other side of the cabin. You all right there, Thankwell? Thankwell nodded as he stumbled to his feet and limped toward another of the rotten crates. His pack was hidden inside, and it had medical supplies that he needed, bandages and ointment to treat the wounds the guards had given him, the wounds the Blackthorn had given him. I'm fine, Thankwell announced, though he was far from certain he believed it. Just tired. Right, the Blackthorn said as Thankwell set about treating his wounds in the warehouse, cleaning the angry flesh and wrapping bandages around the tender spots. I need to know you'll follow orders, Thankwell. Do as you're told. Good? Thankwell snorted. An arbiter following the orders of the Blackthorn. In the warehouse, Thankwell called out Jezit's name, checking to make sure she wasn't nearby. He had a task to perform, and she couldn't see it. Couldn't see what Thankwell was about to do. He didn't want to have to kill her, after all. You're in charge, Thorn. I never was very good at the planning, anyway. Thankwell pulled out a blank chip of wood and his ink pot, and carefully drew three symbols onto the chip. Then he placed the ink pot back in his bag and stood, swaying from the blood loss. Then... With only a moment's hesitation, he snapped the wood chip in half and dropped both halves to the floor where they burst into heatless blue flame. The Blackthorn looked confused. Then came the clinking of chains. Thorn was on his feet instantly, looking aghast at Thankwell with his axe in his five-fingered hand and a dagger in his three-fingered counterpart. He shouted a word and the others began to wake up. A moment later... Thankwell realized he was no longer dreaming. The room grew cold and dark, the flickering lantern light seemingly giving off less and less light, and Thankwell saw his breath mist in front of his face. The others were quick to rise, and started to do so just as the demon began to form in between the halves of the broken rune. It started as a patch of darkness amidst the darkness, and then it began to take shape. A terrible spiked form, a head almost as large as a fully grown man. Thankwell felt the sword at his hip grow heavy. What the fuck is that? Really screamed as the demon's eyes flickered to life. Still, Thankwell found himself rooted to the spot, caught between the dream and the present. Then, the demon spoke. I am revealed... Arbiter Darkheart. A cold grating noise, like steel on ice. Just the right pitch to break him from his trance. Go back to the void, he ordered the demon as he advanced upon it. The face of the demon tilted in the approximation of a bow. We obey. 
it said, around a mouth full of teeth and maddening white light, and then it faded back to nothing. Light and warmth returned to the cabin, and Thankwell found himself confronted by six very angry, very confused, very armed bounty hunters. What the fuck was that? You can control those things? Bloody hells! Fucking witch hunters! Only Henry and the Honin, Susku, didn't immediately start shouting at Thankwell. He wasn't even sure who had said what, let alone how to answer their questions. Yes, Thankwell said to no one and everyone. That was a demon. Reckon I figured that out, Henry said in a quiet, dangerous voice. Seemed to remember one bite in the face off the boss. Seemed to remember a few of them tore apart an entire garrison, then started on the townsfolk of Hosstown. I, the Blackthorn chimed in, and I seem to remember getting blamed for the whole fucking mess. You saying it were you that summoned them things? No, Thankwell said quickly. Host summoned the demons in Hosstown. Reckon I remember you ordering one to fuck off back then, too, Thorn said accusingly. Thankwell winced. Yeah. Well, Thorn said, taking a step forward and towering over Thankwell. Reckon it might be about time you told us exactly what the fuck just happened. And how's about you leave the lies out of it? So, Thankwell told them. A group of bounty hunters, barely more than criminals themselves, and most of whom he didn't know, and he told them all the Inquisition's dirtiest little secret. He told them how the first demon had been summoned by Volmar, and the god had subsequently bound all the inhabitants of the Void to serve the Inquisition. He told them that the demons were primarily used to deliver messages from the Inquisition to their arbiters out in the field, and he told them that Keswick was implanting demons into the bodies of people with the potential. He told them almost everything, but he left out the part about him carrying around Miorso and his orders should all other avenues fail. His audience remained wrapped throughout Thankwell's entire telling, with only minor interruptions, most commonly in the form of a colorful curse uttered by Rilly. The Blackthorn remained silent for the entire time, his one eye never moving from staring at Thankwell, and his face was set into an ugly, grim mask. Fucking hypocrites! Rilly spat once Thankwell had finished. Eh? Thorn grunted. It means they don't practice what they preach, boss, Anders replied. The Arbiters murder people for consorting with demons, but they themselves are no better. We are better, Thankwell argued. The demons are bound to us. They gain nothing by following our orders, as they have no choice but to. It sounded a flimsy argument, even to his ears. I don't get it, Ben said. He had wedged himself into one of the corners of the room and stood with a heavy steel mace held out in front of him with both hands, as if its very presence could ward off the demon should it come back. All this magic and demons stuff it makes no damn sense to me. If you can order demons around, can't you just order them that Kessick, uh... Summons, Pern filled in. Right, them that Kessick summons, you could just unsummon. Thankwell shook his head. It seems to work differently once a demon is possessing a body. They are no longer ruled by the same ties that bind them. The chains? Rilly asked. The ones Volmar made? Yes. We still doing this, Thorn? Henry asked in a quiet voice. Seems to me it's all a bit out of our field of expertise. 
We ain't witch hunters, just bounty hunters. Don't know the first damn thing about killing demons. And, judging from what I've seen of them so far, I'd rather it stay that way. We fought folk from all over the wilds, and there ain't a single one of us ain't got more than a few murders to our name, even Anders over there. But demons? Witch hunters? Gods and magic? Not a single one of us signed up for that. I've seen what those demons can do, well as you, and I ain't looking to die in a fight can't be won. The little murderess took a deep breath and sighed it out. That being said, you're in charge, Thorn, and we made a deal, you and I. You helped me kill that little prick, Swift. She paused and gave a tiny nod to Suzku. And I'm to help you kill Kessick. Comes down to it, choice is yours. Can't speak for the others, but I'll follow your lead. The Blackthorn scratched at the burned side of his face, then eyed each member of his crew in turn. Henry makes a good point. Seems we've been chasing after Kessick without full knowledge of what we might be going up against. Demons, and plenty of them by the sounds, and fuck knows what else. Now, I'm still going, he swung his gaze to Thankwell. Made a bargain a while back, and can't expect Thankwell to live up to his side if I don't make good on mine. Also, wouldn't mind paying Kessick back a little, after all he's done to me. You all got the choice, so it's time to make it, now you've seen what we're fighting. Henry's said her piece, and Anders is coming too. Wait, what? I, I never agreed. Thorne silenced Anders with a stare. What would Drake want you to do? Anders snorted. Who gives a shit what Drake wants? Uh, these... Wisest thing I've ever heard you say. Thorne cut him off. You still coming, Ben? Ben looked far from convinced. I don't know, boss. Demons and all. I I'm simple folk. Don't know the first thing about fighting any of this. You didn't see what that arbiter chasing you did back in Shade, before I took him down. I ain't forcing you, Ben. No? Chances of death would be fairly high, wouldn't you say? High to certain, I'd reckon. Aye, and what would Joanne say if I left you to go it alone? Reckon he'd call you a coward, and likely worse. Ben sucked at his teeth. Reckon I'm coming back to haunt you if I die. Sounds fair, Thorn replied with a grin. Susku, I'm in. Outstanding. Real? The young woman paced back and forth in the little cabin with a frown as deep as the ocean. I don't trust him. Don't trust him, she nodded at Thankwell. These things is people possessed by demons, with who knows what sort of supernatural magics. How are we supposed to fight against that? I can help, Thankwell put in. I can create runes to enchant weapons that will purge the demons. And we're just supposed to trust ya? Thorn stepped forward, putting himself between Rilly and Thankwell. You're supposed to trust me. Rilly took a step forward and stared up at Thorn. And what if I don't? Ah, uh, then I'd be very sad, I reckon. Silence held for a few seconds, before really let out a wordless shout of fury and stormed toward the door, wrenching it open and slamming it behind her with equal force. Thorn stood still for a moment, before turning around to face the others. Reckon that was a no, then? he asked. Anders shrugged, Ben laughed, and Susku was silent. Thankwell decided to keep out of the discussion. You're a right fucking idiot sometimes, Thorn, Henry said, already making for the door. I'll speak to her, bring her back. Ain't like she got anywhere else to go right now, being where we are and all. 
Henry left the same way really had, only without the dramatics. So, uh, now what, boss? Anders asked. The Blackthorn sucked loudly on his teeth. Might as well get some sleep if you can. Still got a few days before we reach land. Till then, do as you like. Thankwell turned to go back to the section of wall he'd been sitting against, and Thorn grabbed hold of his arm. What the hell happened earlier? he asked. Looked like you was in some sort of, uh, trance. Thankwell snorted out a laugh. I think I was. Half awake and half in a dream. You using one of them sleepless charms? Thankwell nodded. Then take it off and sleep. No good to anyone like you are right now. It won't help. I weren't a suggestion. Call it an order and get some fucking sleep. Be at Port Loyal soon enough and can't have you running around summoning demons everywhere. Thankwell nodded, retreating to his section of wall and doing as he was told. He removed the sleepless charm, and for the first time in almost a week, he slept. He slept, and he dreamed of demons. Chapter 30 Jezet Rose purred like a cat, a really flirtatious, annoying cat. It wouldn't have been so bad if Rose only flirted with the men of the group. Jez had been known to do some of that herself in her time, but Rose flirted with the men and the women, including Jezet. Probably flirts with the horses, too. Are you sure? Rose asked, a faint smile on her lips and her eyes all over Jezet. Pretty sure, Jez replied firmly. Not even once, she pressed. Reckon I would have remembered it, don't you? Rose purred again. Oh, you'd have remembered it. Do you mind if we change the subject? Jez asked in a way that suggested it was anything but a request. Am I making you uncomfortable? You're making everyone uncomfortable. Hells, even the trees are uncomfortable, Jez said. The trees rustled in response. Rose let out a dramatic sigh. Suits yourself. I think you'll find most of our entourage are a little disappointed, though. I believe they were listening intently. Aye, I bet they were. Rose was an extremely attractive woman in a dark, sultry fashion. She curved in all the right places and wore a tight suit of riding leathers that did nothing to hide the fact. Her face had fine, symmetrical features with full, pouting lips, and her hair was, annoyingly, just as dark as Jez's, only a damn sight longer. All of the men in their group vied for her attention, competing with each other and showing off wherever possible. Most of the women seemed to be more on the jealous side, sulking and shooting her dark glares when they thought she wasn't looking. Jez saw through to the real Rose, though, saw through to the woman who was aware of everyone around her and wore the attraction people had to her as a weapon. She also saw through to the daggers Rose kept hidden in and around her attire, and if her departed brother was anything to go by, it was likely she knew how to use them. They were walking their horses through a small woodland on the south side of Droan's province. Jez remembered the place well. A few months after she had won her freedom by killing Catherine, she had camped just north of the woodland with Droan and his army. There had been a small skirmish. The remnants of an old bandit warband had misjudged Droan's force in the dark and had attacked. They had caught the army off guard and done no small amount of damage. But once the soldiers got themselves organized, they routed the bandits and slaughtered them all. Jez had stood by Drowan and saved his life, cutting down four men and scaring off another three. Afterwards, she and the lord, whose life she had saved, showed the same amount of vigor with each other 
as they had on the battlefield. Jez hated to think of those days. Drouan had kept her prisoner and raped her, and after she had won her freedom, she stayed with him of her own volition. The very thought of who she used to be was enough to make her angry these days, and right now, angry was the last thing she needed. What about with Thorn? Rose asked. Jez sighed and looked at the woman. Rose winked back at her. No. You're definitely missing out there. You should see the size of him. Didn't he kill your brother? Oh, yes. I made certain to thank him for that time and time again, though the pleasure was all mine. Jez was acutely aware that they were once again the center of all thirty members of their escort's attention. Still, she couldn't help but laugh at Rose's blatant innuendo. So, why work for Drake? she asked the woman. With Drake, Rose corrected. I work with our good captain. Chade belongs to me, not him. But... As long as our interests and ambitions align, I see no reason not to give him his own reins. He's very skilled at getting what he wants, and certainly not without his own talents. Exactly how does delivering me to Kessick align with your interests? Jez asked pointedly. Rose shrugged and flicked her head so her night-black hair rippled. He asks me for a favor, and I, in return, ask him for one of equal value. Besides, I had some spare time, and I couldn't pass up the offer to meet you and enjoy your company. Right, Jez said with a snort. Hope I live up to your expectations. Rose pouted and sighed. You've been a little dour so far. Jez glanced sidelong at Rose. Just like that, the woman said, smiling. Didn't think there were any new of me out here. Last time I passed this way, no one had ever heard of me. And now I have the Magistrate of Chade looking forward to my company. Rose laughed a deep, throaty chuckle. Everyone has heard of you these days, Jezit Valern. The Blade Master. The woman who killed the Bloody Angel and took dead eyes dead eye in the same duel not to mention killing her in the seat of her power the blackthorn may have got all the credit for the slaughter at hostown but everyone is well aware of your part in the play joanne loves to boast about how many times he had you truly that man is insufferable you have no idea He's close by, Rose said, her voice icy cold all of a sudden. I'm certain Drake wouldn't mind if we made a short detour to visit Droan. Jez spat. And why would we want to do that? Rose grinned, all white teeth and wide as a wolf. We could kill him. Jez studied the woman and quickly came to the conclusion she was serious. Starting to see why Drake put her in charge of Chade. I've met less ruthless laughing dogs. I think I'd be just as happy never seeing Drowana ever again. Let him boast if he thinks he has something to brag about. Thankwell is being led to Kessick, so the faster I get there, the better. And what do you mean by dour? Well, like this. Rose said with a pouty sulk. I expected it to be a constant thrill with you around. Adventures and daring escapades. I admit, I am a little disappointed. Jez ducked her head under a low-hanging tree branch. So sorry to disappoint. I would have thought you got all the excitement you could want ruling Chade and keeping all the backstabbing in check. Hmm? I think Chade might have changed a little since your last visit, Jezit. I keep everyone in a tight line. More dull that way, but there's no dissent and a lot more order. My back remains largely unstabbed. How did you manage that? 
by removing the competition. By the time of my brother's demise, and that came about not a moment too soon, he owned half of the city, and Drake owned the other half. I, being the sole inheritor of my brother's vast fortune, took control after our mutual friend, Drake, gave me his own half. Hence, no more backstabbing, and no more counsel. Just me in charge of everything. Jez snorted. Sounds dull. Yes, Rose agreed. It really is. Much like whoring, only far less honest. Jez could agree with that sentiment. Whoring was perhaps the only honest profession left in the wilds, and it was also one of the very few she refused to take part in. Sex was used for fun and for negotiating her way out of potentially deadly situations, but never for money. So, why didn't you screw Drake when you had the chance? Rose asked, her voice the very tone of innocence. I assure you, it's an experience. Jez wriggled, feeling uncomfortable in her skin. Because I'm with Thankful. The Arbiter? Rose said, looking around. I don't see him. Neither do I. Jez rubbed at the wooden ring on her finger. What makes him so special? Jez remained silent, her thoughts turning inward to Thankwell. She missed him like she'd miss a part of herself. He kept her on the straight and narrow, protected her more from herself than from anyone else, and yet, whenever she was with him, she could feel the danger like a coiled snake in the darkness, waiting to strike. He excited and comforted and protected and scared her. Oh, I see, Rose said with a grin that stretched from ear to ear and made her somewhere just short of radiant. You love him. What? It's a strange feeling, is it not? indescribable, and yet so warm and welcoming, and thrilling, and... I felt that once. Really? Jez asked, a little too quickly, eager to move the conversation away from her and her own feelings. She wasn't certain she was ready to admit how she felt to herself, let alone anyone else. Mm-hmm. There was a boy, Faye. Back in Bitter Springs, he was young and vigorous and had a wicked tongue, Rose winked at Jez. He started off buying time with me every so often, once a week or so, whatever he could afford it. Soon, he started robbing folk, coming to visit the springs just so he had enough money to pay for me. There was a time he would come every day. And sometimes we didn't even fuck, just enjoyed each other's company and talked, and he would hold me. What happened? Jez asked, surprising herself by genuinely caring. My mother happened. Killed Fay in the street. Gutted him like a fish. She tried to make it look like an accident. A simple robbery gone wrong for the thief. But the woman trained me and I knew her work well enough to see her hand in it. There was nothing I could do. She had the magistrate by his shriveled balls, and nobody cared over one dead gutter rat. Never did anything for anyone but me. I miss him sometimes, even now. Is that how it is with your arbiter? Jez didn't answer. She stared out into the thinning forest lit by rays of bright afternoon sunlight and remembered a time being attacked in a forest just like this. A time when she had been forced to fight for her life and all other considerations were forgotten. She desperately wished someone would attack them right now. Chapter 31 Thankful Rilly chewed noisily on a leg of chicken, or at least something that looked like a leg of chicken. Thankwell had yet to see one of the birds here in the wilds, but 
Judging by the rest of the continent's wildlife, he assumed they had something like chickens, but much, much larger. The size of the animals here always startled him. The largest thing that lived back in Sarth was the domesticated cart horse, and, large as they were, even they paled in comparison to some of the beasts that roamed wild in the wilds. So, what'd you do to them? The little woman said around a mouthful of roasted meat. Shreds of half-chewed chicken hit the table. Nothing. I just let them go. No sense in murdering folk who have done nothing to warrant it. I'm certain they were very grateful for that, Anders chimed in from the other side of the table. He had two empty tankards beside him, and a third swaying about in his hand and Thankwell knew for a fact he had emptied his hip flask at least twice earlier in the day. After all, it was only their children who were evil. Uh, the parents were just innocent bystanders in the whole affair. I judged them to be innocent of their children's heresy. How benevolent! Uh, did they thank you? Reckon he did right, Rilly said waving half the chicken leg at Anders. Least he has the intestinal fortitude to actually do something. Anders snorted into his beer, sending a wave of dark foam lapping over the edge of the pewter tankard. My dear, I have met a great many murderers in my time. You are getting on in the years. And I have never met a murderer quite so abhorrent as a righteous murderer. Uh, that being said, you're a wonderful person and a joy to be in the company of. Please don't burn me. Thankwell couldn't help but laugh. The Blackthorn had left him in the company of Anders and Rilly, in the dubious location of the local tavern, while the other members of the Bounty Hunter crew turned in a long-standing bounty, on a notorious murderer and rapist who went by the name of the Wilds Slasher. It was neither an original name nor one the culprit had earned, but one she had given to herself, carving the letters into her victims in a crude scrawl. While the crew had no proof that they had completed the bounty, it was apparently common knowledge that Thorne had caught up with the Wilds Slasher just outside of Foundhaven, and a short chase later, the murderer had suffered extreme, pronounced internal and external hemorrhaging. Anders' words, which Thankwell took to meaning, the Blackthorn had stuck an axe in her. They were now just a few weeks' travel from Absolution and from Keswick, and already Thankwell could feel his gut churning. He was unsure of the heretic's forces, unsure of whether their little band could get close enough to deal a killing blow and unsure whether he had the courage and willpower to go through with Inquisitor Vance's plan, should he be unable to kill Keswick. The plan had more ifs, buts, and maybes than a stinking ship had fleeing rats, yet there was too much at stake, should he fail. A few heretics inside the Inquisition was one thing, but Keswick was forming an army of demons in human form. And should he ever lose control, Thankwell had no doubt that army would sweep across the world, causing untold destruction. Only the Inquisition was able to deal with such a threat, and, while they had the tools, Thankwell was no longer certain the Council of Inquisitors had the fortitude for such a fight. You know, I think we could do business together, you and I. Anders slurred at Thankwell from the other side of the table. His eyes were lidded and bright, as though feverish, and he pointed a four-fingered hand at Thankwell, the little finger ending in a small stump. Thankwell simply narrowed his eyes in response, causing the drunkard to grin. I've been watching you, my good man, and I've noticed you like to... He lowered his voice to a harsh whisper. Take things that aren't yours. I, too, am fairly proficient in that particular field of procurement. Perhaps we might collaborate. Rilly sucked at her teeth, 
then spat a small bone onto the table. Thorn might not understand you when you throw around your fancy vocabulary like that, Anders, but I sure as fuck do. And Thorn said, no attention. Anders simpered. My dear, with a face as droll as yours and a mouth as eloquent as a chamber pot, you draw all the attention we could ever not require. Fuck you! My point entirely. Uh, besides, what the boss does not know... Hmm? Thankwell shook his head. I'm not sure why I'd want to participate in such an exercise, Anders. He paused. I have this feeling I've met you before. The drunkard paled. Well, we have just spent no small amount of time locked together in close quarters on a ship in a cabin the size of an outhouse. Uh, besides, I've heard all us blooded folk look the same. Uh, sh strong bone structure in the face, I believe. Uh, now, generally, one partakes in the art of lifting to attain things that are not, in the strictest sense, theirs. The advancement of one's monetary stockpile is also something of an incentive. I, myself, am well able to spend an inordinate amount of money in a miraculously short period of time. He leaned across the table and lowered his voice even further. The expenditure of money is something of a specialty of mine. That's why Thorn don't let you nowhere near the coffers, Rilly said with a smug grin. Anders nodded drunkenly. And the boss is quite right to insist on such a precaution. However, it does leave me with the awkward need to fund a very expensive habit I have spent a considerable amount of time nurturing. Rilly sent a withering glance at Thankwell. Anders has a habit of getting himself beat up. The drunkard snorted. And far worse. I have suffered more injuries since meeting the boss than in the entire previous years of my life combined. Many of them doled out by this little vixen right here. Rilly stuck out her tongue. Shouldn't try to touch me when I'm sleeping. You don't tend to complain when you're awake. Uh, quite the opposite, in fact. Why should the tenuous matter of your consciousness make any difference? Rilly opened her mouth to reply, but Anders forged on. Uh, besides, that was not the habit to which I was referring. Drink, my good girl. Alcohol. Wouldn't mind a couple more my own self, Rilly agreed. Uh, precisely, you are far more agreeable when drunk, as I assure you, I am. Thankwell laughed and fished a silver bit out of his pocket. He sent the coin spinning on the wooden table. Knock yourselves out. Anders grinned wide and scooped the coin into his hand. Oh, I intend to try. Both Rilly and Anders turned out to be excellent drinking partners. But unlike the little woman, Thankwell did not try to match Anders drink for drink. He was happy to get drunk and sincerely hoped that in doing so, he could stave off the demon dreams. He had no intention of getting so inebriated he lost control. An arbiter not in control was a disaster waiting to happen, especially one currently under the subversive influence of a demonic sword. And Thankwell had no doubt he was under the blade's influence to some degree. His dreams were proof of that. He doubted the drinking would work, but at least it was fun to try. The three traded stories, quips, and, in Anders' and Rilly's case, meaningful glances. The relationship there was obvious, if not obtrusive, and only seemed strange in that Anders looked to be at least twice Rilly's age. Not that Thankwell had cause to comment. Jezet was only slightly older than half of his age, even if it didn't look that way. His faith, and Volmar's magic, had made him age more slowly, as it did all Arbiters. By the time the Blackthorn and the rest of his crew returned, Rilly was sat in Anders' lap, 
whispering in his ear and giving the occasional wriggle. Anders, in turn, seemed to be doing his level best to ignore the little woman and carry on telling a story about how he had once escaped the siege of Fairview, a small port settlement in the Pirate Isles, by hiding himself in a chest. I made certain to bury myself under a pile of ladies' dresses, uh, of course. Uh, quite why the pirates decided to take that chest, I'm unaware. But I have to say, I'm glad they did. I much prefer surviving to burning alive in a raised town. Gave them the fright of their lives when they opened the chest aboard their ship, though, let me tell you. Anders quieted as Thorn sat down at the table, but really paid them no attention, proceeding to chew on the drunkard's ear. Ben pulled up a chair with a laugh, and Henry sat down next to Thankwell, shooting him a meaningful shrug in the direction of the others. Thankwell returned the shrug in kind, and Henry grinned at him. He couldn't help but marvel at the change in the woman, from the angry little ball of hate and murder who had once professed to hating witch hunters, and who had also once tried to stab Jezet on a bridge over the river Ural. The Honin did not sit. Susku took up position behind Henry, and she gave him the barest smile from underneath her hat. A quiet murmur spread throughout the tavern, and plenty of gazes turned toward them. It seemed the folk of Fairpoint were not unaware of the Blackthorn's presence in their town. You two done? Thorne asked. Anders cleared his throat and really looked over her shoulder at her boss. For you, Thorne? Anything. She slurred and disentangled herself from Anders' lap, walking around the table to the Blackthorn. The big man grabbed her by the shoulder and forced her down onto the chair next to him. She pouted, but said nothing else. Left you here to stop him getting into trouble, Thankwell, Thorne said with a grin. Thankwell merely waved his own tankard at the man in response. Right you are, then. Wouldn't mind me a drink, too. My treat, said Six Cities Ben, and jumped up, sauntering toward an overweight barmaid with a face like a pig's arse. Good news and bad, the Blackthorn said. Ain't far to absolution, and from here out, it's a straight ride. Pick up supplies we need for the trip tomorrow morning, and we'll be gone by sunup. That'd be the good news. Bad is, I managed to have a word with a man, been through absolution just a month back. Says there's hundreds of town folk these days, many as there's ever been, likely more. He also says... That ain't none of them right. Creepy, he called them. Unnaturally quiet. And a few of them damned crazy to boot. They sound possessed to you? Thankwell nodded slowly. Could be. Well, seven of us against a fucking army. Don't strike me as the best of odds, Thankwell. Reckon we might need a plan once we get there. And I seem to remember yours tend to involve suicide. Thankwell snorted. We all survived Hosstown. The bus didn't, Henry said from underneath her hat. The giant royal blue feather bobbed as she spoke. He was dead before we arrived at Hosstown. He just hadn't figured it out yet. No one died in Soth either. Thorn tapped the eye patch covering his left eye. But you're not dead. Thankwell pointed out. All the same, reckon we might approach this one with a bit more subtlety than you know for, Thankwell. Ben hurried back to the table, not carrying any drinks, and with a grave look on his face. Commotion on the main street in town. Man in robes ignoring the guards. Sounds like a chance to make some money, boss. Thorne nodded and sniffed loudly. Might be. Reckon we can find time. Might as well check it out. He turned to look at Thankwell. Towns like this ain't real large. Pretty much one dirt road and a few buildings. Also happens, the guards ain't real used to dealing with problems. Folk like us can make a fair bit of bits, helping out when trouble starts. 
Thankwell nodded, joining the others as they stood and made for the door to the tavern. I seem to remember a time when you were the one starting that trouble, Thorn snorted. Cause you witch hunters never cause any bloody trouble. The main street of Fairpoint was just as Thorn had said, a dirt road a little bigger than the other dirt roads and more frequently traveled. The buildings either side were squat, ugly things made of hard wood and held together by rusty nails and a vigilant disregard for safety and maintenance. Unlike most places Thankwell had been to in the wilds, Fairpoint did not sport walls. Droan kept his province free from bandits in return for extortionate taxes, and though folk weren't happy about it, they paid all the same. Better to pay than to risk the Lord's wrath and find out that those same men paid to protect you were the ones robbing you blind. Folk crowded out onto the porches of their houses and shops and the local whorehouse. Thankwell and Thorn's crew were not the first to make their way out of the inn and had to jostle for space on the tavern's porch, though the sight of Thorn and Susku towering over everyone made most folk slink away to find more crowded spots. The night was bright, lit by an uncountable number of stars, and a moon that seemed as large as the sun. Pointless lanterns hung from each doorway and provided little to no extra light, but folk hung them out all the same. Insects buzzed toward the light, and Thankwell supposed that might be one reason for them. In the center of the street, walking slowly, calmly and non-threateningly, was a single figure, as tall as Thorn, and dressed in long, voluminous black robes, their face hidden completely in shadow. All around the figure, armed guards danced, threatening with their weapons and ordering the person to halt and state their business, or turn around and leave. The figure remained silent and did not stop. I don't understand why the guards are so threatened, Thankwell said. People don't much like the unknown, Arbiter, Ben said loudly. Thankwell suspected he did so that those nearby would know a witch hunter was around. Might be the knowledge would calm some folk down, but Thankwell also suspected it would only make matters worse. People don't like folk in robes neither said Henry. Makes him nervous. The robed figure continued on, heading straight down the street as if the whole town hadn't gathered to watch. One of the guards, either one more brave or more foolish, darted forward in front of the figure, waving a rusty-looking short sword. The guard looked up into the hood of the robed figure and skidded to a halt, dropping his sword and scrabbling away as fast as he could. The brave, foolish guard didn't stop scrabbling away until he was long out of sight, and all the while the robed figure kept on walking. As Thankwell and the Blackthorn's crew watched, an imperial-looking man, wearing a faded uniform of the Droan family colors, walked out of the whorehouse and fixed his stare on the walking robe. God, Captain, Henry said with a sneer in her voice. Thankwell looked down at the little murderess. He's inspiring me with confidence already. Henry set to laughing and Thorn spoke over her. Useless bastard might try to fight. Might just ask for volunteers. Either way, reckon we're about to make some bits. Robed fella walks like he knows what he's about. How can you be sure it's a he? Really slurred squinting at the figure in the road. Could be a fucking lass, for all you know. Thorn didn't even spare the drunken woman a glance. Only woman I ever seen that big died in Hosstown, and if Deadeye comes back from the grave, I reckon we all best believe the Hells is following her. Halt! shouted the guard captain, without actually getting close to the roped figure. I said... HALT! Thankwell noticed one of the man's shoes was unlaced, and he had a smear of red from a woman's lips across his cheek. His nose was straight as a knife edge, a testament to his lack of experience as far as Thankwell was concerned, and his hair was thinning and oiled back across his head. An old sword, likely only drawn for ceremony, rattled in its scabbard at his side, 
and the belt from which it hung was unfastened. I put two silver bits on the robe, Thankwell said. The Blackthorn rasped out a chuckle. The robed man stopped walking and looked directly at them. Good, said the guard captain, nodding and glancing around at the assembled townsfolk. I hereby order you to state your business. The robed man lifted a single hand and pointed toward the Blackthorn's crew. Thorn silently took a step sideways. The finger followed him. Friend of ours? Six Cities Ben asked. Thorn snorted. Reckon every friend I got is on this side of the finger. Enemy, then? Got a fair few of them. Most wouldn't bother with the pointing, lest there was a blade flying my way. This one's colors are maddening, said Susku from behind. I see a swirling maelstrom of emotion, with no end and no restraint. There was a moment's silence. That right there was some philosophical shit, really slurred. The guard captain looked their way. The inn? Well, that's all right then. We don't like trouble in these parts, so as long... The robed figure ignored the captain and changed direction toward the Blackthorn. The captain, clearly misjudging the situation, then made the greatest and very last mistake of his life. He grabbed hold of the robed figure's arm. In a flash, the robed man twisted his arm, spun the guard captain around, and punched. There was a sickening crack as fist connected with neck, and the body of the guard captain slumped to the dusty street his head distinctly more horizontal than was healthy. Thankwell heard the Blackthorn sigh. Oh, shit. After the moment of shock passed, three more guards charged the robed man. The first to reach him came from behind, running with his sword held in front of him like a spear. The robed man calmly flowed to one side, leaving a foot behind for an instant to trip the guard, sending him crashing to the ground next to his lifeless captain. The second guardsman came on with a wood axe and swung it as though he were using it for its intended purpose. The robed figure caught the shaft of the axe mid-swing, plucked it from the guard's grasp and spun, completing the spin by cleanly lopping off the axe owner's head with his own axe. Thorn let out a low whistle. Thankwell glanced his way. What? Ain't easy taking off a head with just the one blow is all. The third guard faltered in his charge and turned it into a tactical retreat. The robed man stepped toward the first man, still struggling in the dirt, took hold of one leg, and with an audible grunt swung the man twenty feet in the air and another thirty feet toward the inn. There was a scream cut off by a dull thud as the man hit the building, another thud and the sound of something heavy rolling down the awning of the porch. Eventually, the body of the guard dropped from above and hit the ground just in front of the crew. Right then, Thorn said, calmly stepping over the broken body of the guard and into the street. The rest of his crew hesitated only a moment before following. Thankwell, unsure of how to act, followed dumbly, his mind still trying to comprehend the strength of the robed figure. Demon, you reckon? Thorn rasped as his crew fanned out around the robed man. A chilling cackle emanated from within the hood of the robed figure, and slowly the hands rose and pulled it back. The man's face was covered in tattoos, scrawling inkwork flowing over his skin in trails of scripture. His jaw was slightly lopsided, his eyes were dark and reflected no light, and a shock of white hair ran across the right side of his head a stark contrast to the brown. A strange familiarity tugged at Thankwell. It's him, said Six Cities Ben, his voice colder than ice. That's the fuck killed Joanne. I, really slurred from beside Thankwell, killed my dad too. The Blackthorn moved to stand in front of Rilly and looked back at Thankwell. He's one of yours, witch hunter, like you. Beth had never have let him go, Ben said. He must have killed her. Reckon you can talk to him, Thorn continued, ignoring Ben. 
maybe convince him of the benefits of surrendering. Uh, what the fuck? Rilly shouted. You're gonna talk to him? Ain't you famous for killing the likes of them? Infamous, Anders announced to the crew, and was soundly ignored. Really? The Blackthorn started, turning to face the little woman. Would you please just shut the fuck up for once? Truth is, I'd really rather not get us all killed trying to fight this bastard, especially not when we ain't exactly at full strength. Eh? Well, for a start, you're as pissed as Anders, except I don't care if he dies. Oh, thanks, boss. Besides, he's intolerable sober, so we put up with it. You look about ready to drop. So, if we can find a way out of this one without a considerable amount of bloody violence, reckon we're gonna take it. Good? Not good. This came from Six Cities Ben. He killed Joanne, my brother, your friend. You reckon I'm just gonna let that drop? Reckon you might be cracked, Thorn. Thankwell noticed the bounty hunter had his heavy iron mace held loose and ready in his hand. He looked like he knew how to use it as well. Thankwell also noticed Henry standing behind Ben with daggers drawn and hat tipped back to give her a proper view. Reckon you might want to back down, Ben, Thorne said in a voice as dark as his name as Henry crept into stabbing distance. Before one of me does something you can't live with. Ben frowned. Huh? I, I, I think he was threatening to hurt you, old boy, Anders said cheerily into his hip flask. Ben stood a moment longer, before relaxing a little, spitting into the dirt street. Fine. Have your arbiter speak his piece. But I don't reckon this is like to be over till that murderous bastard is lying face down in a pool of his own red. Thorne nodded. Not saying I entirely disagree with you on that point. Thankwell let out a breath he hadn't realized he was holding and noticed the tattooed man was watching them with an amused smile. Off you go then, Thankwell, the Blackthorn said. Try not to piss him off, eh? Thankwell started forward and found a big hand on his shoulder, not holding him back, just letting him know Susku was there. He glanced back at the Honin, and the man was staring intently at the tattooed figure in the street. He is unstable. Thankwell waited for Susku to say more, yet the stoic-mouthed Honin said not another word. After a few seconds, Thankwell nodded and continued forward. As he approached, he couldn't shake the feeling he had seen the tattooed man before. He looked eerily familiar, or maybe just eerie. The tattoos certainly lent him a menacing air that set Thankwell's teeth itching. He stopped a few meters from the man and looked hard. The tattooed man stared back, evenly, not blinking, not saying a word, just watching. It wasn't just the man that looked familiar. His tattoos looked familiar. The scripture looked almost the same as that used in charm formation. The man nodded once toward Thankwell and made to walk past him. Realization hit Thankwell like a mailed fist holding bitter memories. Jacob? The tattooed man stopped, and again he looked at Thankwell. Deep eyes that had once been blue, now contained only infinite darkness. Again, the man nodded. It's me, Thankwell, Arbiter Darkheart. Another nod, and a smile that showed more than a few missing teeth. What are you doing here? Thankwell asked, and reveled in the joy of his impotent compulsion. Jacob Lee shrugged and pointed one finger toward the Blackthorn. Thankwell glanced back at the bounty hunter and his crew. There must have been a mistake, Thankwell protested. The Blackthorn is to be left alone. Avoid it, actually, if at all possible. R regardless, he's helping me. You're helping us, he heard Anders mumble. 
I could use your help too, Jacob. What's he saying, Thankwell? Thorn shouted. Not much. I, I know him. He's an old friend. A mumble ran through the people of the town as they milled it over and decided they were less than pleased at having two arbiters around, especially as one had just murdered their town guard. One of them, a man, shouted some insult about witch hunters. Thankwell turned around to see a middle-aged man reaching down to pick up a stone that was bordering on being classed as a boulder. Thankwell wasted no time in pulling his pistol from his belt and pointing it, rather threateningly, at the man. My suggestion would be to put down the rock, turn around, and walk away, Thankwell said, in the most commanding voice he could. The man faltered, halfway to standing with the rock held loosely in his hand. He gave it a bit of thought, and then decided Thankwell was likely not the type to make idle threats. Either that, or he was reasonably terrified by the homicidal, tattooed man standing just behind him. After giving the rest of the gathered crowd a good eyeing, Thankwell turned back to Jacob to find the man watching him through his dark eyes with a curious expression on his face. Thankwell couldn't tell if it meant Jacob was impressed or was thinking of punching a hole through him and then everyone else in town as well. With a deep breath, Thankwell continued, I think it might be best if we move off a ways, Jacob. We have a lot to talk about. Jacob laughed, deep and honest and terrifying. Then he opened his mouth to show Thankwell the red stump that had obviously once been a tongue, yet now looked small and sad. Ah, um, well... I guess I have a lot to talk about, and you get to listen. Again, Jacob pointed at the Blackthorn. Thankwell shook his head slowly. First we talk. I talk. Then you can decide whether or not you still want to kill Thorn. Thankwell started walking back down the main street, with Jacob reluctantly following. He couldn't help but wonder what he'd do if Jacob still decided he'd rather have the Blackthorn dead. Once they were a good ways out of the town, with Thorn's crew keeping a respectful but watchful distance, Thankwell couldn't contain his curiosity any longer. He stepped close to Jacob and stared long and hard at the Arbiter's tattoos. They curled around the contours of his face, crawled over his bones, and wrapped around each other in concentric patterns. It would have been a masterstroke of a charm had it not been written on a man's skin, and it dawned on Thankwell in a flash. They're blessings, he said, already knowing he was right. Jacob nodded all the same. By Volmar's balls, they turned you into a Templar. Jacob laughed, shrugged, and eventually shook his head. What happened? Thankwell asked. Jacob ran a finger across his face and then rolled up the sleeves of his robe to show yet more tattoos all over his hands and arms. Thankwell got the idea. The tattoos likely covered every bit of Jacob's skin. The Templar then pointed a finger at his head, then held up both hands as if he were holding on to something, then jerked them apart and away from each other violently. Uh... Jacob made the motion again. Your... Uh, head snapped? Your mind snapped? Mind broke? Jacob nodded, and again indicated his tattoos before making the mind-breaking motion. But you survived, Thankwell said, walking around Jacob and inspecting the tattoos he could see. The blessings are active all the time, whether you wish it or not. Jacob nodded. From the looks of things, Jacob was imbued with the augments from hundreds of blessings. He had always been one of the strongest arbiters in the Inquisition, but now, now, he had been turned into a Templar. Thankwell whistled through his teeth and marveled at the ingenuity of those involved in the experiment. The Templars had once been the mailed fist of the Inquisition, back before the world had been scoured of the warlocks and necromancers. Back before the Drur had been decimated and driven underground, Volmar had created the Inquisition and brought together people with the potential, 
teaching them his faith and his magic. He formed the ranks of the Arbiters as scouts and commanders, and he formed the Templars as their troops to command. The constant drain on their potential had robbed the Templars from using any true magic, but the powers and abilities they gained from those blessings made them perfect foot soldiers. Only once the Inquisition's competition was battered, beaten, broken, or exterminated, the Templars served no purpose. They became relics too powerful to let go, and yet too costly to maintain. Thankwell was no stranger to history tomes, and he knew the last Templar had died over 2,000 years ago. Over time, the descriptions of how to create the warriors had been forgotten and lost, but clearly there were some within the Inquisition who were keen to rediscover just how to create such powerful tools. Thankwell couldn't help but wonder whether the God Emperor knew of the attempt and knew of Jacob. Someone sent you here? Thankwell asked. Sent you after Thorn, the Black Thorn? Jacob nodded. Who? Predictable silence. Uh, the Council? Jacob held up a single finger. An Inquisitor? Jacob nodded. That made things difficult, with a side helping of unfortunate. Thankwell didn't have the authority to overrule an Inquisitor's orders, out here or anywhere. He may have given his word to pardon the Blackthorn, but right now he had no way of holding up his end of the bargain. Not to mention, he counted Thorn as a friend and would really rather not see the man tried by the Inquisition. He may have been responsible for the deaths of six Arbiters, but the Blackthorn was most certainly not a heretic. Jacob, listen to me. The Blackthorn is not a heretic. Jacob shrugged. You have no reason to hunt him. He's actually helping me. Helping the Inquisition. Again, Jacob shrugged, focused his eyes on Thorn waiting in the distance, and started toward him. Thankwell quickly stepped into the Templar's way. Jacob, stop! Thankwell was walking backwards as he spoke, well aware that he did not want to try and stop the Templar physically. This is bigger and more important than any orders from an Inquisitor. Did you hear what happened last year between myself and Inquisitor Heron? Jacob nodded but kept walking. Thankwell held up a hand. Jacob, listen to me! The Templar's own hand moved so quick, Thankwell didn't have time to react. Jacob grabbed hold of his wrist and twisted. There was nothing Thankwell could do but twist with it to stop his wrist from shattering. He found himself on his knees with his scarred hand held above him, his shoulder straining in its socket and he was feeling somewhere close to all the pain in the world. Jacob looked down on him with dark, heartless eyes. Thankwell had to admit, the Templar was gentle. He was in no doubt, having already witnessed the man's strength, that Jacob could likely twist his arm from his body, should he want. But instead, he just held him there. Thankwell managed to put out his other hand to stop Thorne's almost certainly suicidal attempt at rescue. Then he gripped hold of his right shoulder to brace it against the strain. Inquisitor Heron was working with two arbiters, Thankwell hissed through gritted teeth. Kosh is dead, but ah, Keswick survived, and he's here, building an army to finish what Heron started. He's using demons to possess people, to turn them into warriors to fight the Inquisition. Jacob let go, and Thankwell drew his hand away, cradling it against his chest. He looked up to find the Templar staring down through narrowed eyes. It's the truth! Thankwell pushed himself back to his feet and stumbled backwards a step out of Jacob's reach. Not that it would likely matter, given how fast the man could move. The Blackthorn is helping me to find and kill Keswick, and put an end to this madness once and for all. Jacob, I need his help to do this, and I could use yours also. I need you to promise you won't try to kill Thorn. Thankwell swallowed and took a deep breath. Please. Jacob was silent. He stood straight as a pole, 
with his head cocked slightly to one side, as if listening for some distant sound. After some time, he frowned and sighed, then looked at Thankwell and nodded. The easy part was done. Now all he needed to do was convince Thorn to accept a superhuman Templar with a mission to kill him. Thankwell ran through a number of arguments in his head as they approached Thorn's little bounty hunter crew, and none of them tended to end well. He could feel his hands shaking in his pockets. You convince him of the benefits of not attacking me? asked Thorn as they approached. Thankwell took a moment to survey the crew and noticed Henry was missing. Thorn stood with his axe in hand and a grim look on his one-eyed face. Anders sipped nervously from a hip flask while playing with the hilt of his own rapier. Susku appeared to be as calm and content as ever, with not a hint of an expression crossing his face, and both Rilly and Six Cities Ben looked about ready to pop. Both carried weapons, and Thankwell could tell both were willing to use them. He's agreed to join us until Kessick is dealt with, Thankwell said, his left hand closing around a stolen key, though he had no idea to which lock it fit. Fuck that, shouted Ben. Reckon I might just gut the cunt right now. If Jacob was worried, he did not show it. Thor nodded, ignoring Ben. Reckon we might take him up on that offer. Seems he knows his way around a fight, and we could use some more of that. What? screamed Rilly. That's my dad's killer! There ain't no fucking way I'm crewing up with him! The little woman started forward, short sword in hand, but Thorn caught her, spun her around, and pushed her down into the dust. Don't reckon I'm about to let you get yourself killed, Rill. I won't. We can take him. All of us together. I, Ben put in. I already beat him twice. Gave him that scar on the left side of his head. Would have killed him, except Beth wanted to do it slow. Thorn turned a harsh eye on Ben. Last time, you had a small fucking army helping you out. And that Arbiter still killed half of you, including your brother. Safe to say, he can fucking take you. And I reckon that's a man I want on my side when we come up against Kessick. Rilly surged back onto her feet and spat at Thorn, a thick glob of spittle hitting his duster. You'll be doing it without me. Or me, put in Ben. Thorn took a deep breath and nodded. Reckon that might be for the best. Reckon he's worth more than the two of you, and I reckon you could both do with a spell here in Farpoint to cool off and to remember who the fuck is in charge. You're still here when we get back, then we'll welcome you. If not, then not. Till then, you're both fired. Ben spat and stalked away. Rilly opened her mouth to protest. I said you're bloody fired, you dumb girl. Now fuck off. Thankwell saw the telltale shimmer of tears in Rilly's eyes just before she turned and fled back toward the town. He let out a slow breath and turned to find Jacob observing the scene with almost as much expression as Susku. He heard a scuff of boot and dirt behind him and found Henry not a few paces away, both daggers in hand. The Templar spared her a glance, and no more. Just making sure, Arbiter, Henry said with a wink. Didn't know which way he'd blow, she indicated Jacob. The Blackthorn sniffed loudly and approached Jacob, standing up just an inch or two taller and well within striking distance. He met the Templar's eyes and gave a nod. Jacob stared on in silence. You're coming with us. You follow my lead, Thorn said in a voice as cold as the grave. Good? Jacob blinked, but made no other move. After we deal with Kessick, if you still reckon I need killing, we'll settle accounts then. Thorn turned away. Assuming we both make it, he said under his breath. Thankful. A word. 
They walked off a fair distance into the dark, well out of earshot and barely within visual. They were both silent, and Thankwell took the time to wonder what sort of potential mess he had just created. You reckon he's to be trusted? Thorne asked, stopping and looking up into the sky and the bright, flickering starlight. Thankwell shrugged. To the job. We are probably better off trusting him than fighting him. The Blackthorn looked down at him. Good to know we're in this together. You sent her away on purpose. Thorne nodded and went back to regarding the sky as though it was the most interesting thing he'd ever seen. Got a bad feeling about this one, Thankwell. The kind of feeling that suggests some of us ain't gonna make it. Maybe most of us. Girl's been through more than enough already. Don't need a nasty case of death adding to her troubles. Reckon she's better off here. Safer off here. On the off chance any of us make it, she'll be waiting. Can't say as I know about Ben, though. Reckon he'll look after the girl. Thankwell decided to fill the silence before the subject turned to himself. Last thing he wanted to think about, let alone talk about, was his own troubles. So, why are you doing this? Is it just about vengeance? Again, Thorne glanced at him from his one eye. Sounded an awful lot like a question to me. He wasn't wrong. Thankwell smiled a weak smile and tried not to think about why his compulsion was waning. Ain't gonna lie. The idea of giving Keswick back a little ain't unappealing. Also, ain't the only reason. Drake Morass wants the bastard dead, too. Says Keswick is bad for the wilds, like a wound gone to fester. As a rule, I tend not to, but in this case, I agree with Morass. Taken an awful lot from the wilds in my days, and now I reckon. I'll give a little back by getting all murderous on the bastard took my eye. What about you, Thankwell? You just here on orders? Thorne produced a small hip flask from his duster and unscrewed the top before taking a swig and handing it to Thankwell. Halfway to his mouth, Thankwell paused, hearing a whisper as if from a distance, some dark and terrifying voice just out of earshot. He patted the sword by his side and took a deep gulp from the flask. As he handed it back, he caught a glimpse of Jacob in the distance, staring his way, his head once again cocked to the side, as if listening. I was tasked with rooting out the heresy within the Inquisition. With Keswick surviving, I failed. I don't like failing. Also, he took your eye. Eye. Thorne said, with a grin and swig, before passing the flask back again. He did that. Chapter 32 Jezet Absolution. As ugly a deserted dust ball as Jez had ever seen, and she'd seen more than her fair share. Low wooden walls ringed the settlement lazily and poorly spaced. At places, even a full-grown man could likely fit through the gaps. Other places, Jezet wagered she could get a horse through. Not hers, though. The beast had taken lame not a day back, and now she rode behind Rose. The woman's perfume forever in her nose, and Jez did not like the way she wriggled up against her. No patrols walked the walls of absolution, and no smoke drifted upward from within. No travelers? Merchants, or workers, came and went, and the only small signs of life were the birds that cawed at them from their own guard positions high up. One solitary figure sat at a table outside the main gate. He looked to be dozing in the afternoon sun, as Rose's not-so-little entourage trotted up. A real fortress. How will Thank will ever find his way in? Looks deserted, said one of Rose's guards. The magistrate of Che tooted and pouted at the man. Looks can bear deceiving. Keswick is here, hiding from his enemies and biding his time. 
building his forces. Enemies, Jez mused. He seems to have a lot of them. Don't we all? If there's one thing I've noticed about getting older, it's that you always pick up more enemies and more wrinkles. Jez snorted. <laughs> Speak for yourself. They stopped in front of the man at his table and waited. He wore a wide-brimmed, slightly conical straw hat that obscured his face from view. Jez could see stark white hair bound in a warrior's tail and flowing down his back over his mud-colored cloak. Nearby, within easy reach, was an old sword, its scabbard battered and scarred with heavy use. Jez had got that tingling sensation she often did when faced with a warrior, the type of feeling that the man was dangerous, and she felt the need to test just how dangerous. The Sword of the North had once told her that blade masters were born, not just trained, and he had been one to prove it, challenging everyone and anyone just to test his own abilities. She had thought him mad, and terrifyingly so. Now things were different. She had leashed her own fear and understood his drive. Though she was still certain beyond a shadow of a doubt, she was not yet his equal. Yet. Rose slid down from the horse, leaving Jez alone atop the creature, and approached the man with a wary caution. We've come to treat with Kessick. I bring a gift from Drake Morris. Slowly, very slowly, the man reached up with his left hand, extended a single finger, and pushed up the brim of his strange straw hat just enough to reveal an eye. He was old and had a face weathered with age and scarred with the same sort of use as his sword. He wore a neatly trimmed goatee of white whiskers and chewed lethargically on a small brown stick. He rolled a lazy brown eye over each member of the group and then shrugged, lowering his hand and letting his hat drop back down to cover his face. Rose struck a pose and sighed. So we'll just go on in? Silence. Good. Nice to meet you. Rose waved forward the group and started walking through the gate into absolution. Inside was a ghost town. Jez had been to more shitty little wilds settlements than she cared to count, and all looked the same. Absolution looked just like them, only empty. Squat buildings built from wood, wind-blasted, and somewhere between disrepair and derelict. Dusty streets usually slick with mud and animal droppings, only these were missing all but the dust, and of that, it had more than enough. Signs atop shop entrances or inns swung on rusty hinges, and the dark doorways looked anything but welcoming. It wasn't the first ghost town Jez had seen, but it was damn sure close to being the eeriest. She suddenly felt the need to not be astride the horse and slid from its back, walking over to Rose. The magistrate, for once, did not look to be in good humor, and Jessit couldn't say she blamed her. There was a feeling this town gave off, and it was not a pleasant one, almost like insects crawling over skin. Jez shuddered. Don't take this the wrong way, Rose said scanning the buildings for any sign of life. But I am sorely glad I'm not you. Huh? I'm just dropping you off and getting the fuck out of here. Rose turned an apologetic glance Jez's way. You have to stay. Thanks for the sympathy. Sure thing. Have you noticed we're being watched? Jez asked, spying a gleamy set of eyes peering out from an upstairs window. I wondered what that feeling was, Rose said with a shaky voice. I was hoping it was just you staring at my ass again. Jez snorted. It ain't worth a second glance. Rose stopped and turned to face Jezet. Men have paid good money to get their hands on this ass, and I've never once had a complaint. Jez had that feeling all over now, that feeling she got when she was surrounded 
and in for a whole heap of trouble. Just saying, mine's better. Not so well written. Well written? Now ain't really the time, ladies, said one of the men, a burly guard by the name of Nolan. The group were huddling together, horses and people all as frightened as each other, and not a one of them had actually seen the source of their fear. But all knew they were more than a little surrounded. Perhaps we should surrender? Jez asked. Rose looked at her and nodded. Someone put her in chains, she said to the men before raising her voice. We're not here to fight. I bring a gift and a message from Drake Morris. He wants a truce with you, Kessick. Jez scowled as Nolan slapped manacles in place around her wrists. The big man shrugged and apologized, yet fastened them tight all the same. Jez considered strangling him with the chain, but decided it would serve no purpose. You come in peace, but bring a group of warriors into my town. A voice deep with bass rang out into the square. Jez recognized the voice from long ago. She had met its owner. They're not for you, shouted Rose, looking around, trying to find the source of the voice. Just for the journey. For protection, she lowered her voice to a whisper. How many of them are there, in case this thing goes south? Enough, Jez replied in a similar whisper. Too many. Rose sighed. Normally, two of my favorite words. She raised her voice. Just here to make a delivery, and then we're leaving. Well, most of us are anyway. What makes you think any of you will be leaving? The voice came from their left, a man standing in a dark doorway, his eyes reflecting none of the bright afternoon light, and his hands hovering above the hilts of two long swords sheathed at his hip. You Kessick? Rose asked, waving at her guards to keep their own weapons down. I. No, he isn't, Jez put in quickly. Can't say who that is. But I've met Kessick, and it ain't him. Rose turned a simpering pout on the man in the doorway. Sorry, friend, but I'm here to see your boss. Not really interested in the hired help. Run along and fetch him now, please. The man stepped out of the doorway, and then stepped aside. The next figure stepped into view, and that was one Jez did recognize. Kessick had not changed at all. He was still short, of a height with her, and stocky. His steel-gray hair was cropped short, and he had the face of a man who had never known laughter. Every bit of him seemed hard, sharp angles and long, taut features. He carried no weapons, though Jez got the distinct feeling it was because the man simply didn't need any. He even still wore the coat of an arbiter, though Jez knew full well he had long since had his name stricken from the Inquisition's records. You, I remember, Kessick said in a voice like grated sand that tugged on all of her nerves. You named yourself Jesset Verlern and claimed to be an employee of Host. You killed Arbiter Kosh. Jez sniffed. Twice. Rose shot her a look. How did you kill a man twice? Well, the first time didn't take, so I tried again. Jez didn't have to look around to know that Kessick's forces had started to leak into the street. Her finely tuned senses were warning her that violence was likely imminent. She touched Rose's arm and nodded behind them. The magistrate turned, and Jez saw the color drain from her face. You wanted excitement and tough scrapes, Jez said with a forced grin. Stick with me long enough, and one or the other are bound to turn up. She heard one of Rose's entourage whispering quick prayers to a god that she couldn't name, and nor did she care to. An acrid smell filled the air, and Jezet got the impression that one of their hardened guards had pissed him or herself. She decided to satisfy her curiosity and looked around. The street had filled with men, women, and in a few cases, children. There were hundreds of them, and more arriving, 
gliding silently from open doorways and surrounding the small group. I would suggest laying down your weapons, Jez said to the group. Might be Keswick will feel gracious, though I doubt it. I ain't going down without a fight, Nolan growled out through a tight mouth. Take as many of the fuckers with us as we can. Jezit laughed. That would be none. You can't kill them. Huh? She had that same feeling. The feeling she'd had around Kosh and Sarth, and the feeling she had when Thankwell had summoned the demon back in Chade, though she had never told him she had bore witness to the scene. The folk that had them surrounded now might look like villagers, merchants, slaves, beggars, or sellswords, but that was only on the outside. Each of them was a demon wearing human skin, and it would take more than cold steel to kill them. You know more than you're letting on? Rose asked. A pair of throwing knives appeared in her right hand. I do, Jezid admitted. But telling you would serve no purpose. You wanted to treat with Keswick, Rose. Now's your chance. Rose hesitated for a moment, then grabbed hold of Jez's chains and started forward, dragging the blade master behind her and out of their circle of guards into the open. Keswick! the magistrate shouted. Drake Morris wishes for peace between you. He says he's leaving the wilds for good, and you're welcome to them. And he's instructed me to give you this. Rose gave the chains a hard tug, and Jez stumbled forward. A moment later, she felt a boot kick into the back of her legs, and she went down onto her knees in the dust. A gift! Oh, been called worse, Jez. There was that one time Thankwell called you a... What need have I for a blade master whose blade works for my enemies? Keswick asked. I have no interest in vengeance for either Kosh or Heron. Your master's gift is as worthless as your lives. I suspect he knew that when he sent you to me. Sorry about this, Rose whispered before raising her voice. Arbiter Thankwell Darkheart knows you're still alive, Keswick. Does he? The Inquisition has sent him to kill you, Rose continued, her hand firmly on Jezit's shoulder as if to keep her grounded. Jez briefly considered breaking the woman's wrist and regaining her feet, but she had taken an insidious liking to Rose and didn't feel much like hurting her, though she also didn't feel much like being handed over to Keswick in chains. Still, seemed to be going through with that. A hostage to dissuade the Arbiter, then. Keswick's mouth moved to form the words, but the rest of his face remained as still as though it were carved from rock. What makes you think I would need her when I have an army at my command? Rose squeezed Jez's shoulder. Actually, she squeezed and rubbed it. Any more, and we'll have to call it a massage. Host had an army, far larger than this band of scary miscreants, Rose said. The way I hear it, Arbiter Darkheart tortured the man to death inside his own fort, and then set his entire town to the slaughter. I heard it was the Blackthorn, said one of Rose's men. I heard it was her in chains, said another. Jez glanced back at them and gave her very best predator's grin before turning her own attention back to Keswick. Keep her, or don't, Rose continued. Choice is yours. Either way, Drake's gone, never to return. And you? Keswick asked. Oh, I'm still here, looking after Chade. Free city, open to anyone and everyone. Keswick considered that for a time, and all the while, more of his people moved to surround the group. Eventually, he seemed to make up his mind and pointed to her. Bring her, he ground out. A woman of an age with Jezet and wearing a faded yellow dress ripped off above her knees moved forward to obey. Rose gripped hold of both of Jezet's shoulders and put her mouth so close to her ear Jez could feel her breath. Good luck. The woman in the yellow dress grabbed Jez under her right arm and hauled her to her feet. Stronger than she looks, 
stronger than she should be. We'll just be going then, Rose announced with a shallow bow. Jessit saw Keswick hand something to the man with two swords before turning back toward Rose's group. Test them all, he said. Kill any that aren't compatible. He started to turn away and stopped. Let the woman go. An ally in Chade could be useful. Jez heard shouts of protest from behind, but she didn't have any time to turn around. The woman in the faded yellow dress was dragging her along, behind Keswick. As she was pushed inside a solid stone building, she heard the shouts of protest change to screams of pain. Chapter 33 Thankful He had never seen a demon in its full, monstrous form, and this one was most definitely a sight to behold. Thankwell stared up at it, and his mind refused to calculate its size. Somewhere close to really big seemed an apt description. Its hulking form was a mass of shifting, spiky darkness, and its head was, well, Thankwell would have placed a bet on it being able to swallow an elephant whole. Behind its teeth, a bright white light shone from within, and its eyes were two blazing yellow lights, as blinding as the sun. Then there were the chains, the ties that bound the creature to the Inquisition, giant black links of metal, as dark as the creature itself, wrapped around the beast, constricting and binding it. Thankwell had never seen the chains before, but he saw them now and wondered at their construction and at the creature who could have made them. He wondered at the power of Volmar. He could feel the creature's anger. Like a blazing forge, the heat of it washed over him in waves that blotted out all other thought. For thousands of years, both the demon and all its brethren had been made slaves to the creature that had defeated it, and they were none too happy about the injustice. They wanted nothing so much as to be free. The demon knew it couldn't kill its tormentor. Volmar was too powerful and beyond the beast's reach. But that didn't mean they couldn't kill Volmar's servants. The demon wanted to be free, and they wanted the Inquisition to pay for the thousands of years of enforced servitude. The demon screamed, a primal bellow containing emotions he didn't understand and couldn't make sense of. The sheer force of it felt as though his soul were being ripped from his body. He heard the chains. Thankwell's eyes flew open, and he sat bolt upright, drawing his pistol, and... Bang! Something exploded in a shower of blood, bone, and feathers. Thorn rolled onto his feet, axe in one five-fingered hand, knife in the three-fingered hand, and one eye squinting against the darkness. Thankwell heard the others rousing in similar haste. He was drenched in a cold sweat and breathing in quick, heavy gulps of air. Jacob stood by a stark white tree, spattered with drops of blood. What the fuck was that? Thorne asked into the darkness. Uh, Thankwell began but lacked words. A raven, answered Suzku, sitting cross-legged on the ground behind Thankwell and watching Jacob with weary eyes. The Arbiter got it. I? Thorn said. Why? Susku shrugged. Thankwell still couldn't find his tongue. The dream still lingered too heavily in his mind. The sight of the demon. The sound of the chains. The sight of the demon. Perhaps it was a heretical raven, suggested Anders, already sipping from his flask. Is that... Is that possible? asked Henry. She crossed in front of Thankwell and moved to sit beside Susku, grinning at the big honin. Well, I don't reckon Thankwell's going to be questioning it none to find out, said Thorne. Might as well change shifts, seeing as we're all up. Thankwell slowly lowered his pistol and tucked it back into his belt, deciding that it was probably best to leave it unloaded until he needed it. He stood up and stretched. I'll take a watch. <sighs> I'll stay up also, said Susku, his eyes back on Jacob, 
who returned the stare in kind. Thorn looked at them both. You two just been sat there, staring at each other all night. Susku shrugged. Occasionally one of us blinks. Not often, though. Thankwell patted the sword at his side, the feel of Mjorso still at his hip, both comforting and terrifying. He picked a direction and started walking out into the night. Don't go too far, Arbiter, Henry said from behind. Wouldn't want you getting lost and victimized by a bunch of heretical laughing dogs. He grunted an affirmative and continued on his course, only stopping once he was out of sight of the others. His hand was shaking in his pocket so badly he had to keep it clenched to stop the trembling, and that just made the old burn scars ache. Anders stepped up, reached into his trousers and pulled out his cock. A loud, dramatic sigh later, and he was releasing a steady stream of urine. No sense being modest all the way out here in the wilds, Arbiter. Thankwell looked away. Some of us have more to be modest about than others. The drunkard laughed. You know why I first learned to pick pockets? Thankwell had a bad feeling about this conversation. He didn't think he'd stolen anything from any of the crew members lately, but he was not always aware he had stolen anything until it turned up in his possession. Boredom, for the most part, Anders continued, heedless of Thankwell's fairly obvious discomfort. Taught myself simply for lack of anything fun to do. There may have been some attention-seeking as well. My father was... is a fairly hard man. Did I tell you? He tried to have me executed recently. That was a story Thankwell had heard from three different angles, and none of them seemed to match up. I failed a lot at first, more than I succeeded, and I was caught and punished by my father accordingly. He was uh, maybe a little light on the punishment back then, but only because he hadn't actually gotten to know me yet. Otherwise, I don't doubt I'd be missing a hand, and not just a finger. Anders waved his maimed hand at Thankwell, lost control of his stream and almost pissed on Thankwell's boots, before quickly taking hold of his cock again and redirecting the flow. It wasn't until I was cut off from the family funds that I actually found a legitimate use for this skill I'd learned. After all, when one is bitless and in desperate need of liquid fortification, one must find the means from somewhere. Anders finished pissing, shook his cock, and slipped it back inside his trousers. Thankwell sighed. I quickly learned a number of useful little pointers during those days, chief among them that many people, particularly those paranoid about losing something, have a habit of regularly checking it's still there. They were always the best marks, because you could always tell they had something of value to steal. Uh, except for that one time I ended up finding a mouse in a man's pocket. Anders seemed to run out of words. My, my point is, Arbiter, I'm wondering what a witch hunter, especially one who should already know such a thing, is so damned worried about losing. Thankwell turned to find Anders watching him without his usually drunken haze. What is it you keep wrapped in bandages beneath your coat, Arbiter? None of your concern, Thankwell said, turning away. Anders nimbly dodged back in front of him. Ah, uh, but if you'll humor me, I, I think it is my concern. I think it's all of our concerns. He waved back in the direction of the crew. But I'm willing to just let it be my concern. Either that... Or I could tell the boss about my concerns. Thankwell stared a hole through the man and silently wished, for once, he was taller than someone. It's a sword forged by Vulmar to imprison the first and most powerful demon ever summoned from the void. It holds the demon within the blade, and the damned thing won't stop whispering to me and giving me nightmares. Anders looked more than a little taken aback, and even more skeptical. 
Why do you have it? He asked, in a voice that suggested he wasn't entirely convinced Thankwell wasn't making fun of him. I wish I knew. It was entrusted to me by an Inquisitor, whose instructions were somewhere between vague and non-existent. Hmm, Anders grunted. Hmm, Thankwell agreed. And I was really hoping for some sort of helpful insight from you. Well, you know what they say, Arbiter. A problem shared is somebody else's problem. Thankwell let the awkward silence stretch out into eternity, staring at Anders until the drunk decided the short bit of darkness between them was not nearly enough. Well, I'll let you get back to touching your evil sword, Anders said, stepping backwards. Just a few days to absolution, though, Arbiter. Hope you're ready for... whatever it is you're planning. Thankwell watched Anders walk away until the man disappeared into the darkness. The truth was, he had no idea what to do when he reached absolution. He just knew he had to deal with Kessick so he could finally continue his search for Jezid. Part 5. The Ties That Bind Chapter 34. Jezid Jezid's eyes flicked open, and she reached out for a sword that wasn't there. It was an ingrained reflex she knew she would never rid herself of, and one she did not want to rid herself of. It had, in fact, saved her life on more than one occasion. Also very useful to give voracious arbiters a scare. She saw bars, and her heart gave the beat equivalent of a sigh. Why does everyone feel the need to lock me up? I haven't committed any crimes in at least a few weeks. Jail cells had become a regular occurrence in her life. She seemed to find herself inspecting a new one every six months or so, though in truth, one tended to look much like another, and none were the most luxurious of accommodations. Her left wrist ached like she'd been stabbed, and if anyone knew what being stabbed felt like, it was Jez. Thangwell had once tried counting her scars, but the Arbiter had never been known for his patience, and soon gave up, finding other ways to occupy himself and her instead. She rubbed at her wrist idly and froze. There was a scar on the inside of her left wrist. It was an old scar. It's your oldest scar, Jez. Your very first wound. But today it felt different. The skin was raised, puckered, and angry to the touch. It almost felt as though the scar was new, a couple of weeks by the feel of it. Jez rubbed at it some more and gave it a closer inspection. The flesh of the scar was knitted, but it was new. Either she had been unconscious for a few weeks, or there was something unnatural at play. The charm! Jez poked at her wrist, wincing at the pain and feeling through the flesh. It was her first scar because Yuri had wanted to make certain he could use her body without the consequences. He had had a charm sewn into her flesh to ward against pregnancy. The flood of relief that coursed through Jez when her probing fingers touched against the tiny wooden charm came out as a wild giggle that echoed in her small cell and she collapsed back onto the straw that coated the floor. She noticed a small rat sitting by a tiny hole in the wall. The little creature was on its hind legs, watching her with plenty of nervous nose twitching. She smiled at it. The rat ran away. Can't say it feels good to know the bastard has been poking around inside my body, but at least he didn't take the charm. Now Jez thought about it. The idea that she had been cut open made her feel more than a little violated. She didn't even remember falling asleep. One moment she had been happily gulping down a cup of water, and then... Drugged, Jez. Bastards drugged you. At least they finally got around to taking off the chains, though. No doubt how bad things get, there's always something to be thankful for. That had been one of Catherine's favorite sayings and it was safe to say 
the bitch had known full well just how bad things could get. Stretching and giving her wrist a further good rubbing, Jez rolled onto her feet and took a damn close look at her bars. Sturdy set of rusted irons. She gave them a good shaking all the same, hoping, but not believing, that one might shake free and provide her with the freedom she needed to go in search of her captor and give his throat the slitting of a lifetime. The bars didn't budge an inch, so Jez gave the rest of her cell a similarly close inspection. From what she had already gleamed, the jail was one of the few stone buildings in the entire town. Built like most Wilds shitholes, absolution was cobbled together from whatever the original residents could scavenge, steal, or barter. There were a few good buildings with more than one story, but Jez wouldn't bet on her life on the stairs being what most sane people would consider safe. Most of the buildings sported only the one floor, and most of those featured only one or two rooms. Absolution was built for folk who lived hard and were not opposed to leaving when that living got too hard. Jez wondered how many of those original inhabitants were still living here now, with demons inside of them. Jez heard the door to the jail swing open. If they've come to cut me open again, kill the first one through the bars, Jez. She waited, every muscle relaxed and ready to spring into action at the slightest command. Nolan walked into view, a broadsword on his hip and a vacant expression on his face. His leather armor was torn and bloody, yet he didn't appear to be wounded. Nolan, Jez said, rushing forward and gripping the bars. What happened to Rose? The big soldier stared at her blankly. Keswick walked into view. He stopped just short of the bars, just short of being within nose-breaking distance. He can understand you, but he hasn't learned to form our words yet, Keswick said in a monotone voice. It can be disorientating at first. They learn eventually. Jez took an involuntary step back from the bars, readying herself for a fight. What do you mean? Keswick looked confused for a moment. You fought Arbiter Kash. You know what he was. Yes, you do. A demon? Jez asked. Yes. Arbiter Darkar told you about them. Yes, he explained it all to you, didn't he? Only two of your group were compatible. This one was one of them. What about Rose? The woman. Drake's sacrifice. She didn't realize he sent her here to die. She was not compatible. You killed her? Keswick shook his head. Drake wants her dead. That alone is reason enough for me to want her alive. I sent her on her way. She might get back to her city. Though I think you know a woman alone in the wilds can experience many tragedies. Yes, you do. Still, I suspect that one will survive. What about me? Jez asked. Are you going to put a demon in me? She looked down at her wrist. Have you done it already? No, Keswick ground out with a single shake of his head. There is not a bit of potential in you, Jezid Verlern. Perhaps that is why Arbiter Darkheart finds you so fascinating. In her head, Jez let out a sigh of relief. The idea of sharing her body with a demon was not entirely pleasing. She had seen one, and they looked far from pleasant bedfellows. I choose to believe it's because he loves me. What you choose to believe and the truth are two very different things. I will show you. Keswick motioned to the cell door, and Nolan pulled out a key, fitted it to the lock, turned it, and a moment later the bars swung open. Jez walked calmly, cautiously forward, until she was at the doorway. Then she sprang. She passed Nolan before he could react, 
and swung a fist at Kessick, followed by another. The ex-arbiter turned both strikes aside, as though Jez were nothing but a slow, weak child. She felt a large hand grip her neck from behind, and then she was flying backward through the air to crash onto the floor of her cell, rolling in the straw and flowing back to her feet with nothing but a new bruise to show for her efforts. The door to the cell did not close, but Nolan moved in to block her way, standing as still as stone, his deeply wrinkled face a blank slate. You had to try, I understand, said Keswick, his hands in his coat pockets, in such a way that reminded Jez of Thankful. Please, do not try again. It would be unwise. Now, come. Jez walked cautiously to the cell door and waited for Nolan to move. The big man took his time. Jezet followed Keswick out of the jail and on to the main thoroughfare of absolution, bathed in the soft waning lights of a wild late afternoon. There was a breezy chill in the air, and Jez knew what that meant. Storm's coming. Though the lack of clouds claimed otherwise. The streets were busy with folk going about their business, but that business was definitely not what most folk would consider normal. Men, women, and children, dressed in rags or armor, fine silk clothing or aprons, shifts or robes, some were even naked, with all their bodies on display. They were busy in the central square of absolution, building siege engines or smithing weapons, or mixing ingredients into what looked suspiciously like Thankwell's black powder, the same substance he used to fire that deadly little pistol of his. Here were peasants and nobility, warriors and beggars, children and the elderly, and all were gearing up for a war. Intending on using those? Jez nodded toward the war machines. Keswick turned back and glanced at her, then continued walking. The wilds will not submit without a fight, and it must submit to me. You'll need more than a few hundred people in your army if you want to take the wilds. Who said anything about people? Jezet spat into the dusty street. I want to explain myself to you, Jezet, Keswick said, his voice approaching what some might consider earnest. Why? Because I want you to convince Arbiter Darkheart to join me. She snorted. I ain't really ever had much of a say with him when it comes to the killing of heretics. Then you will have to be persuasive. Keswick's voice ground her nerves to dust. First, I must give you a history lesson. Jez groaned and noticed two more of Keswick's demon-possessed troops, a young woman with hair the color of dying embers, and a grizzled veteran with only one arm, had joined them. She felt more than a little prisoner, even out of her cell. Seems you've been a prisoner a lot of late, Jez. Might be time to break for freedom soon. Thousands of years ago, the world was ruled by the Drur. Keswick started his lesson, heedless of Jezet's reluctance to come anywhere close to caring. They spread all the way from the wilds to Sarth, to the Five Kingdoms, and to the Dragon Empire, though none had such names at the time. Humanity was weak, powerless against the magics the Drur wielded. Little more than animals, the humans were used as slaves and cattle. We were not freed from the Drur by your gods, or even by Vulmar, as many would have you believe. We were freed by the Dreadlords. Who? Keswick looked back at Jez, giving her a long, pointed stare. There were seven of them. I'm afraid I do not know their specifics. Such details are long lost. They learned the secrets of magic, dark magic, the type of power people these days do not even know exists. They wielded sorcery and necromancy, 
and they went to war with the Drur for the sake of their people. They won, then? Jez said, pointing out the obvious. They lost. Oh, didn't see that one coming. This was before they became known as the Dreadlords. They threw an army at the Drur and backed it with apocalyptic magics, and they lost. Their army was slaughtered to a man, but they escaped unharmed. Years later, they returned to the homeland of the Drur, to the land south of the Five Kingdoms. You mean the land of the dead? Yes. They returned with the knowledge of immortality. Once hidden inside their enemy's capital city, they completed the ritual to turn themselves into liches, necromancers that have cast off their mortal shells, and to become the very thing they seek to control, the dead. But the dreadlords did not bind their essence to an object. They all bound their essence to the land itself. They created the land of the dead, and overnight, they won a war their enemy did not even know they were fighting. Legions of the dead rose from their graves and slaughtered the Drur. Men, women, children. And every one that died rose and continued the slaughter. A plague of death swept the Drur homeland and left living death behind it. Then... The Dread Lords reached the limit of their power. As strong as they were, their influence could only reach so far. It stopped south of the land now known as the Five Kingdoms. But the Dread Lords were not satisfied. Power corrupts, and they were corrupted to the souls. They began to marshal their forces. If their power could not stretch beyond the land of the dead, than their monsters could. Then came Volmar, a beacon of light in the darkest of times, a living god sent from on high to save us from the very weapon that had freed us from the Drur. Volmar rallied the burgeoning kingdoms of man to his banner and taught those he could how to use magic. Volmar took the fight to the Dreadlords, and he won. Then he created the Inquisition to hunt down the remaining Drur, to purify the remaining users of dark magic, and to protect the world in his stead when the Dread Lords returned, and he knew they would. Fascinating, Jez said, rolling her eyes. Kessick spun around, and the back of his hand connected with Jez's face. She found herself on her hands and knees in the dust, spitting blood, wondering how she got there. Bastard is so fast. That, and he hits like a bear. Jez rolled her tongue around her mouth and felt one of her teeth move. She'd never lost a tooth before. Not since the little ones she had as a child, anyway. But it looked like she might lose this one. She spat out another mouthful of blood. Her lip was well and truly split, and she reckoned it would be swelling and leaving a colorful bruise any time soon. Might be best not to piss him off again, Jez. With that thought in mind, she pushed herself to her feet, swaying only slightly as the world gave a little wobble. Keswick was treating her to a blank stare. Once he was satisfied she was suitably cowed, he turned and resumed walking. The Dread Lords are returning, Jezid. Already their power is beginning to affect the world. The land of the dead swarms with walking corpses, and soon the Dread Lords will walk in this world again. The demons have shown me that, and they have shown me that we are not ready. Thankwell told me about this part, Jezid said. Your dead boss said something similar. Darkness coming and the Inquisition being too weak to fight it. Keswick didn't stop, didn't slow, just kept on walking. Inquisitor Heron was a puppet. I needed the help of someone higher up in the Inquisition, 
and I chose her. You chose her? Did Arbiter Darkheart ever tell you he was sent to find Volmar's sword as a gift for the God Emperor? Yes, lost for somewhere near forever, and he found it out in the Land of the Dead. Well, he wasn't the only one sent to look for it. He found Volmar's blade, and I found something else. I found Miorso, the demon blade. The demon inside the sword showed me the truth, and I gave the sword to Inquisitor Harren so it could show her. Her pride wouldn't allow her to play second place to an arbiter, so I let her think she was in charge. The outcome is what's important, after all. Keswick stopped outside a two-story wooden building with shuttered windows and an old rusty sign showing a big red X. He turned to look at Jezid. The Inquisition is weak. It is full of powerless cowards who wish only to further themselves and do not care to see the whole picture. They do not know what is coming and they will not be ready to face it. But I will. By the time the Dreadlords rise, the Inquisition will be gone, and I will have an army of demons at my command. I will send the Liches back to their oblivion, and then I will rebuild the Inquisition, stronger than ever before. For the first time, Keswick's voice betrayed emotion, and Jez saw the fire of self-righteous zeal lit in his eyes. It didn't matter whether he was right or not, Keswick believed he was, and he would do anything, sacrifice anything, to achieve his goals. It scared her. Nothing worse than those who do evil but believe they're doing good, Jez. Keswick was staring at her, his eyes flicking back and forth, searching her face. You do not believe me. No, I see it. Come. He opened the door to the building marked with the red X and walked inside, his entourage nudging Jezid along behind him. She rubbed at the scar on her wrist and followed the X Arbiter into the dingy building. It smelled of dust and sweat and blood, three things Jezid knew all too well. The walls were warped and stained, dark with years of neglect. The floor was covered in dust and mud brought in from the street and never cleaned. A stairway led up to the first floor, but Keswick ignored it, heading down a short corridor and through a bent doorway sitting at a slight angle. Jez followed him inside and froze. In the room, strapped to a solid wooden table, possibly the most solid construction Jez had seen since arriving in Absolution, was a man she recognized. He was one of Rose's guards, a big-mouthed, big-nosed, balding veteran who went by the name of Rab and who never missed an opportunity to leer at either Jez or Rose. Now he was strapped down tight, and his face was a horrible motley of red, blue, and black. Looks like he took a real beating from someone who really enjoyed it. Jez sucked at her teeth. What are you doing to him? Keswick regarded Rab for a moment, then turned to Jez. He has potential. I'm going to put a demon inside of him. Jez took a step backward and bumped into the man who had once been Nolan, staring down at her through dead, pitiless eyes. So, why the fuck am I here? You said I've got no potential. You don't. Keswick said in his gravel voice. But I want you to witness it all the same. I want Arbiter Darkheart to join me, Jezit, and I want you to convince him. This, he pointed at Rab, is to convince you with motivation. If you cannot convince Arbiter Darkheart to join me, I will force his cooperation. Chapter 35 Thankful Absolution Strange name for a town located in the wilds, a place where most folk didn't know the meaning of the word. 
and those that did wanted none of it. Stranger still that Keswick had chosen to make it his home. It didn't look like much, but then, places rarely did out in the wilds. Thankwell had spent a fair portion of his life within the glorious city of Sarth, white marble everywhere, and thousands upon thousands of slaves to clean it every day. Sarth put on a pretty face, but under the skin it was rotten. In the wilds, towns didn't even bother with the pretty faces, and absolution was no different. However will we get in? Thankwell said, staring at the walls. Thorn sniffed loudly from beside him. Reckon there's probably a... No, interrupted Henry, tilting back her hat and giving Thorn a glare. What? You were going to suggest sewers. You always suggest sewers. What is it with you and fucking sewers? Thorn looked a little indignant. It's a good way to get into a place. No one ever checks the sewers. That's cause they're full of other folks' shit. Bad enough smelling of your own from time to time, but willingly smelling of someone else's shit? Never seemed to bother you before. Henry spat. Always fucking bothered me. Just, when we was on the other side of the law, didn't have much of a damn choice. Now, I reckon we're above crawling through sewers. Don't reckon the hangman went on his hands and knees through shit, nor the saint. Thorn snorted. You might be surprised what the saint got up to in his day. Try asking Ben when we get back to Farpoint. I believe you may have meant to say if we get back to Farpoint, boss. Everyone turned and gave Anders a silent, meaningful glare. Just putting things into perspective... Six of us, army of demons, little to no chance of survival. As a gambler, those are exactly the sort of odds I like to play. Of course, that might explain my extraordinary lack of monetary gain over the years. Silence. So, no sewers then, Anders said with overactive joy. Henry shook her head. Sometimes. I wish Drake could have kept him. You know? The Blackthorn shrugged. So, the walls then? Pick an abandoned looking section. Looks like there's plenty to choose from. Slip in through the gaps and take a look around town, Thankwell said. Scout the area, find out where Keswick is holed up, kill the bastard. You make it sound so easy, Henry said. Thought we weren't letting him do any of the planning these days, on account of none of us wanting to die. Thankwell glared at the little murderess, and Henry grinned back at him. Aye, Thorn said. As a rule, I'd say that's a fairly safe one. But I don't reckon he's wrong about it. Best we do this with some degree of stealth. Killing Keswick when he ain't expecting it. Seems the best way about it. I don't remember agreeing to assassinating anyone, the Honin said. It had been so long since the last occasion, Thankwell had almost forgotten how his voice sounded. Aye, Henry agreed. Seemed to remember us being done with that sort of work. Thankwell decided to opt out of the argument. Assassination wasn't in an arbiter's dictionary. They preferred to call it righteous judgment. Thorn gave Henry a hard stare. I seem to remember a time when you wasn't above a little spot of murder. Henry gave Thorn a hard stare right back. I seem to remember a time when you was the same way. Also seem to remember us both deciding it might be time for a change. We ain't assassinating no one, Thorn growled. Things go right. We won't be doing no killing at all. All we do is get Thankwell in and let him deal with this Inquisition's heretic. A grand case of doing fuck all, and Keswick gets dead out of it. And maybe then, my eye, the one that ain't fucking there no more, can stop itching. Good? Thankwell watched Henry grind her teeth, her jaw clenching hard. But, eventually, she nodded. 
Susku nodded, as though he had never had a problem with it in the first place, and Anders just grinned. All set, then, Thorne said. We'll wait for a spell of darkness, then slip in quiet, do the job, and slip out just as quiet. Darkness came sooner than Thankwell would have liked. He didn't feel ready for it, for what was to come. He wasn't sure why he was so hesitant. Maybe because he knew something the others didn't. He patted the sword hanging from his hip. Might be because he knew how it was likely to end. They stole up to the wall in silence, moving from shadow to shadow in short dashes. They had brought only what they thought they would need and left the rest out of the way with their horses. All six members of the crew were well-armed and ready, all except Jacob, who carried no weapons and, judging by his extravagant hand gestures, did not believe he would need any. They flattened up against the wall and waited. After Thorne was of the opinion no one had seen them, he waved Henry through one of the larger gaps in the wall. She ducked through and was gone. A few very long seconds later, and she reappeared, gave a quick nod, and ducked through again. Thankwell followed her in. Within the town walls, Absolution looked a sad, sorry place. Squat buildings, complete with an odor of rot and stagnant dust. They were behind a large wooden building, judging by the outdoor oven, Thankwell guessed it to be a baker's, though he doubted they'd find any fresh loaves on sale. Thorn came through the wall last and looked about, before waving them into an alley that ran alongside the bakery. They wouldn't stop there. They were looking for somewhere more central, somewhere with easier access to the small town. Henry reached the mouth of the alleyway and stopped. For a while, she stood motionless, before turning her head slightly to speak to Thorn. Reckon we might have a little problem here. She stepped out into the street, and Thorn went with her. Thankwell and all the others, each one of them sporting their own version of confusion, followed. The street was dimly lit. Each building had its own lantern, shuttered against the breeze and burning away merrily. In the middle of the street stood a single figure, a man dressed in mud-brown cloak over stained leathers, with a white warrior's tail of hair and a strangely conical straw hat obscuring his face. In the man's left hand was a curved scabbard that Thankwell thought looked oddly familiar. He doesn't look much like a problem, Anders said, peering at the man. We have him somewhat outnumbered. Susku stepped forward, away from the crew and further into the street. You should go, he said quietly. This is not your fight. Thankwell saw the set of the big man's jaw and the way his hand hovered near his sword, which sat in a curved scabbard, and realized he was looking at fear. It was possibly the first emotion Thankwell had seen Susku show, and it was not a reassuring one. Ain't the way we do things these days, Susku, Thorne said, stepping up beside the Honin. You're part of the crew, and that means we look out for each other. Don't let the others go off and fight alone. Besides, we can't let him warn Keswick we're here. The man with the straw hat hadn't moved at all. Thankwell was fairly certain a statue would have given away more intent. He won't harm anyone. Susku assured Thorn, And respectfully, I find I must leave your crew. Eh? This fight is mine and mine alone. What little honor I have left demands it. The last thing Thorn looked was pleased. His jaw muscles writhed like snakes in a bag. He grabbed hold of Susku's shoulder and turned the honing, treating him to a one-eyed stare. You gotta do this alone, then all right. But don't think you just get to leave afterward. Still part of the crew. Soon as you're done here, you catch us up. Good? Susku nodded. Thorn took a quick look at the man with the straw hat, let go of Susku's shoulder, and stalked away. The others followed, thankful with them. Only Henry stayed behind with Susku. She said something to him, too quiet for thankful to hear, 
then hurried to catch up with the others. Thankwell found himself beside Jacob. He looked up at the Templar. What do you think that was about? Jacob chuckled and shrugged. He had a wild grin on his face that scared Thankwell far more than an old man with a sword and a strange hat. They ducked into another alley, and Thorn waved to a halt. We may have hit a stroke of luck there, Thankwell said, breathing a sigh of relief. Why's that? Henry asked from behind, her voice as dark and dangerous as it used to be. The street was deserted, apart from the one man. I'd say it could have been worse. The little woman pushed past him and up to Thorn. Don't reckon this town is too big, Thorn said quietly. Cross this street and find a building to call home on the next, I think. Don't want to try the main street, Henry replied. Should be somewhere near the center. Reckon that's where we're like to find Keswick. That's uh, where we're like to find more folk, too. Best we stick between outskirts and center, I reckon. Least till we know where we're going. Henry nodded. Thorne nodded back. Anders nodded at Thankwell. Thankwell shrugged back. Jacob stood tall and silent and watchful. Let's move, Thorne growled, and he was away, sprinting across the bare stretch of street. The others followed at similar speeds, and they ducked into another alley. Still, they saw no people. Starting to get a real bad feeling about this whole deserted issue, Henry said. Thankwell replied. Anders snorted. <laughs> Luck is a cheap whore. You pay her for the privilege, and she gives your cock a nasty rash. Thankwell looked at the man, then looked at his crotch. Don't you worry, my good man. I assure you it cleared right up after a few months. That one, Thorn said, pointing at a building to their right. Henry grunted her agreement, looked both ways out of the alley into the street, and slipped out of cover, dashed across a muddy porch and up to the doorway of the target building. She tried the handle and then disappeared from view as she darted inside. A few tense moments later, her hand popped out and waved them all in. They took it in turns, rushing to the house that would serve as their base, and all made it without incident. Thankwell wasn't certain what he liked less, the general lack of folk out and about, or that each and every building, without fail, sported its own lit lamp. Seemed passing strange to him, but none of the others made a deal out of it, so he decided to keep quiet. Once they were all in, and the door was closed, and the windows shuttered, they took a moment to relax. Tense would have been a welcome luxury, Thankwell's nerves were so on edge. He patted the sword at his side, but quickly stopped when he found both Anders and Jacob watching him. Henry moved to one of the windows and peered out through the shutters, watching the street for any activity. Fair to say, this is a little odd, said Thorne. Don't reckon I've ever seen a town this deserted. Jacob shook his head, pointed to his ear, and then pointed in the direction of the town center. You can hear activity further in, Thankwell asked. The Templar nodded. I didn't hear anything. Thankwell looked at the tattoos around Jacob's head, around his ears. His hearing is better than most. Well, ain't that just a useful thing to know? Wish he could fucking tell us without all the hand-waving. Thankwell heard a whisper, something close and far away at the same time, something shrill and deep, and he could almost make out the words, if only they were a little clearer. Henry hissed from the window and held up one hand for silence, while she tilted the shutters just enough to see out of with the other. People coming! she whispered. How many? asked Anders. Well, I don't got all your fancy numbers, so I'm just gonna go with a fuckload. She peered out of the window into the street and cursed. Looks like they got your woman with them too, she said. What? Thankwell asked. Henry grunted as his will locked onto hers and forced the truth out. Jesit Verlern is with them. For just a moment, 
the words didn't make any sense to Thankwell. Then he realized he didn't care. He started toward the door. Thorn stepped into the way, but again, Thankwell found he didn't care. With a whispered blessing and a hearty shove, he sent the Blackthorn sprawling. Henry and Anders were moving now to stop him, but it was too late. Thankwell kicked the door open. Chapter 36 Jezet. There were times, not many but a few, in Jezet's life when the word surprise didn't quite cover it. This was one of those times. It was not the door slamming open as Keswick and their escort, whose numbers were on the generous side of thirty, passed, nor was it the door rebounding so hard against the building that it came off its hinges and collapsed, so that the man had to kick it again to get it out of the way. Her surprise was laid solely at the feet of the fact that it was thankful standing there. She perhaps should have seen it coming, considering she knew he was coming, but somehow his appearance was a sudden shock, and her heart, traitorous beast that it was, gave a lurch in her chest. Seeing him would have and should have been a happy sight, if not for the scene Jez had just witnessed. Your breath, Jez! She spat, for perhaps the hundredth time in the last five minutes, and quickly wiped her hand across her mouth. Her breath likely still smelled strongly of vomit, and she knew that shouldn't really matter given the current situation, yet there was a part of her, quite an insistent part, that didn't want her reunion with Thankwell to be marred by her breath stinking like that of a sour drunk's. Wasn't often that Jezet Valern lost her stomach over something other than bad food or too much drink. Only once before in her lifetime, to be exact, but what she had seen in that building with the Red Cross. She felt bile rising again and swallowed it down, instead focusing on Thankwell. The Arbiter stepped down from the wooden porch and onto the dusty street. Keswick remained stone-faced, and a couple of his demon entourage looked a little discomforted. Of course, that could just be the fact that there's a demon inside those meat shells, Jez. Thankwell, Jez said, a damned stupid thing to say, and none would agree with that more than Jez it herself. But sometimes her mouth worked quicker than her brain which at the moment was rebelling on the thought of working at all. Jez, Thankwell said, with a washed-out smile. He didn't look so good, now that she thought about it. His face was lined, and he looked a good five years older than the last she saw him. He had dark bags under both eyes that lent him a slightly menacing air, and his stubble had gone unmanaged, and had blossomed into the beginnings of a curly black beard. Jezet did not approve. Touching, Keswick said, in his voice like cracking ice. Jezet might have swung for him, but he was too far away, with at least eight demon-possessed guards between them. Ain't it just, said a familiar voice from inside the building Thankwell had emerged from. The voice was followed by a man she thought long dead, and found herself more than a little happy to see it wasn't so. The Blackthorn stepped into view and out through the doorway, stopping beside Thankwell and giving him a hard glare. Reckon we might have to have words about you knocking me down just now. Despite his eye patch, which Jez could only assume was not just for show, Thorn looked well. He stood a good foot taller than Thankwell and broader to boot, his head shaved and a full ginger beard covering much of his face and hiding much of his scarring. He wore a heavy black duster, and Jez had no doubt it contained Thorne's usual complement of sharp objects. He wasn't alone, either. One by one, they exited the building. A big man, slightly taller than Thorne, with every inch of exposed skin covered in tattoos. A little woman who looked suspiciously like someone Jez had once thrown off a bridge. A blooded man who looked suspiciously like someone Jez had once thrown out of a window. That appeared to be all of them. Not exactly an army, but five is better than one. Well, said Thorne, looks like we got ourselves a whole lot of reunions. 
don't it? I'm glad you're here, Jez said, and it was only half a lie. She was glad to see him. She just wished he hadn't come. Blackthorn, said Keswick. Don't I know you, said the blooded man. You took my fucking eye, Keswick. What are you doing here, Jez? Which one is Keswick? asked Henry. You were a disappointment from the start, Thorn, growled Keswick. I need a drink. That whole business with Drake. Oh, and there was that whole tricking me into trying to kill Drake Morass. Oh, Drake! The blooded man brightened up. He sends his regards! Enough! shouted Thankwell, his voice loud enough to silence everyone. Or at least, everyone but the tattooed man who was merrily humming away to himself, while mad eyes darted around the assembled force arrayed against him. Keswick, Thankwell continued. I think you know why I'm here. It's certainly not for the hospitality, the blooded man mumbled. Yes, I knew you would be coming. Did Drake tell you I was here? Or did the Inquisition send you? I think it was Drake. Jez saw Thankwell touch something at his hip. Little bit of both, really. Doesn't matter now, though. You won't get away again. The Blackthorn leaned a little toward Thankwell. Not so certain this is a fight we can win. Reinforcements were arriving for Keswick, and many of them were bringing sharp, pointy friends. Many of the others were bringing dull, blunt friends, but all seemed just as dangerous. You can't win, Keswick agreed. But I would much rather this didn't end in a fight. I need more people like you, Arbiter Darkheart. People who believe in the cause. You know the Inquisition is weak. You of all people must have seen it. I've heard this tune before, Keswick, Thankwell said in a grave voice, as dark as the bags under his eyes. Inquisitor Heron tried to convince me to join you. I set her on fire. Twice. Really? asked Thorn. Twice? Jezzet saw Thankwell shrug and grin and she couldn't help but follow suit. It seemed so long since she had last seen him smile. If a thing's worth doing, Thankwell said, might as well do it twice. Keswick flicked his gaze toward her. Jezit. She rubbed at her wrist as her mind tried to figure out what to say. She didn't trust Keswick, certainly didn't believe him, but as more and more of his possessed warriors arrived, the odds looked worse and worse for Thankwell. She didn't want him to die. Didn't want him to suffer. Not like... Never thought I'd see a man's soul torn apart and burnt to ash before me. She couldn't stand seeing that happen to Thankwell. But then, she didn't think she could sway him from his course, even if she tried. Everyone's watching you, Jez. Waiting on you. He's looking at you. Jez met Thankwell's gaze and smiled. Fuck it. Still wearing that same smile, she kicked the demon to her right in the knee, forcing it to the ground, grabbed hold of the sword sheathed in its belt, and stepped away, drawing the sword free from its scabbard in time to leap backward and take off the arm of another of the human skin-wearing beasts. She thought she heard Keswick curse, and that just made her grin all the harder, as another demon came for her. Jez had always had a knack of inspiring chaos, and it was safe to say what erupted into the streets of Absolution had no better description. Thankwell's crew scattered, fracturing away from each other to fight on their own. Thankwell started across the street toward Keswick, drawing his battered old sword to defend against the demons. She lost sight of him as the creatures came at her from all sides in a rush. She charged one of the demons a petite woman with a flat chest and only one shoe, ducking into a roll at the last second and dodging past the wild mace swing. Her sword took a chunk of leg out as she rolled. Not enough to kill, certainly not enough to kill an immortal demon, but enough to drop it to the floor. Jez twisted and came up, facing her pursuers, only for her internal warning sense to inform her there was someone behind her. A nimble dodge to the left, complete with a spin, 
and she brought the sword down onto the man's ample skull. It didn't so much cut as bludgeon, crushing a section of the skull into a mushy, white-pink, blood-squirting goo. Good point, Jez. Time to find a better blade. Something with an edge would be good. Two more of the demons were on her, and both with sharp objects of their own, and neither looked any better than Jez's pointy piece of metal. She brushed away the first attack, taking a moment to marvel at the strength of the woman making it, and parried the second, catching the blade on her own and redirecting it into the body of the first attacker, who promptly let out a high-pitched wail of pain. Good to know. You may not be able to kill them, Jez, but you can sure as all the hells maim them, and that's something you're known for. Chapter 37 Henry Even before that crazy bitch spoke, Henry could see in her face what was coming. That cruel smile that broke across some folks' faces when they were about to do violence, and knew, even should the worst happen, that they were going to enjoy themselves. Henry saw it and knew it, because it was a smile she herself had worn more than once. Not so much of late, though. They were law folk now, and violence had become much more sporadic. Violence on a scale of what was likely to ensue here, though, that was simply unheard of. Last time Henry had been in a proper battle, half of Hosstown had ended up fleeing and the other half burning. That, and half her crew had died, including the boss. She didn't much like the idea of that happening again. So, she was ready as soon as she saw the smile on the Blade Master's face, and before even the first drop of blood was spilled, her twin daggers were in her hands, and she was using the Arbiter's little strips of magic paper. She'd seen battles before, heard of how they were supposed to go with organized troops and maneuvers and such. The scene that spread out before her looked more like a brawl. Groups of people, folk on Keswick's side, split off and came at the crew. Most of them went toward the Arbiter. Not Thankwell, the silent one with the tattoos. Each member of the crew got themselves their own fight to deal with, and instead of doing the smart thing, sticking together and watching each other's backs, each member split up and chose to fight alone. Wasn't too much of a surprise. They were all reformed criminals, after all. Order wasn't exactly one of their strong points. The demons were fast and strong, but Henry wasn't slow her own self, and she had many years of experience in the sadistic art form of murdering folk. The first demon to reach her, a stone-faced, skinny beggar of a man, died as would any unprepared fool, thinking she was no more than the girl she looked. Henry ducked under his heavy swipe and used the man's own force as he overbalanced to gut him with one blade while the other she drove up through the base of his skull. The carcass dropped, leaking beautiful red that the dirt-brown dust lapped up quickly. Either the Arbiter's magic worked, or these demons weren't near so unkillable as folks seemed to claim. Not like the demons at Hostown. Not like Hostown. The next demon was different, an old man wrinkled from years beyond counting and dressed in the tatters of a robe. His long white beard trailed down near to his waist, and his mouth contained only one tooth. Despite his appearance, the man moved like a wolf, loping toward Henry and springing at her, covering an impossible distance. He took her unawares, maybe because of the way he looked and maybe because of her reverie, and she barely turned his sword strike in time to stop being skewered. The blade slid along her leathers and cut a small slice into her side. She growled in pain and limped backward, refusing to clutch at the bleeding wound. She could feel it growing wet. Not one kill in, and she was already on the back foot. The old man didn't let up his attack. He took two more loping steps left and leapt at her again, raining blow after heavy blow down upon her. Henry gave ground, parrying blows where she could and dodging others. Her daggers were simply no match against the weighty sword the man used, at least not at such range. She timed her strike perfectly, waiting until the man was swinging and sidestepping the strike, 
leaping close and putting both blades into his chest again and again and again. Hot red blood spurted out over her clothing and hands and face. The old demon lunged at her again, but only managed to pull Henry's hat from her head as his quivering, bloody body toppled to the ground. Two down. Henry marked off the kills in her head. After all this was done, she'd wait until Anders boasted about his own body count and upstage him by mentioning hers, making sure it sounded offhand. Of course, she would need more than two to properly humiliate the fool, but judging by the demons pouring into the square, she would have the chance for plenty more. This time, three of them came at her. Two men and a woman, all of middle age. The woman in a blue shift and the men in fancy suits. They looked similar, brothers or maybe even twins, and they attacked in unison as the woman attempted to get around behind her. Henry fainted toward the men, then turned, ran at the woman, and attacked, knocking away the bitch's feeble counter with ease and gutting her like a fisherman to his catch. More red watered the earth, turning dust to sticky mud. The two men came on, ignoring their fallen comrade as if she were nothing more but dead meat to begin with. Henry glanced around the battlefield. Plenty of demons surrounding the silent arbiter, yet he seemed to be holding his own. Anders was nowhere in sight, likely long gone and hiding in a cupboard. Thorn was nearby, grunting and grinning in equal measure, with more than a few bodies littering the ground. Though as Henry watched, one of those stood back up and came at the Blackthorn again. No sight of Susku either, and that worried her most. Something about the big Honin made her comfortable, made her feel stronger, made her feel less inclined to kill. She liked it. She liked him. Most of all, she liked herself when he was around. Her foot bumped against a wooden porch, and she almost tripped. She'd barely even noticed she was retreating. The twins didn't miss a beat. They took her moment of confusion to attack. Coming at her from two sides, one attacking high, the other low. She stepped into the attack of the demon to her right, blocking with both daggers and pushing as hard as she could. The demon pushed back harder, and before Henry could recover, punched her in the face. She felt her nose break, cartilage snap, and pop, and pain. So much pain she couldn't help but gasp, and that brought about a whole other set of problems. She swallowed blood, red and beautiful and streaming from her nose, into her open, gasping mouth. Metallic, sticky, and crimson as the prettiest of sunrises. She felt more than saw the sword coming. Her vision was swimming with colors that she couldn't name, and pain blurred even those. But she knew something was coming. Years of being a murderer had given a warning that screamed at her when she was about to die. She dropped to her knee and felt the blade skim her head, likely took a few hairs with it. Then she pushed back onto her feet and stumbled away, hit the wooden porch again and tumbled into the building rolling back onto her feet and facing the gaping doorway. A figure blotted out the torchlight from outside. Henry couldn't see it clearly through the blood and pain, and didn't really care to. She flung her knife at what was most likely its head and heard a dull thud. The blurred figure slumped to the floor by the wall, and one behind it roared in anger. Henry threw her other dagger. The figure rushed her. First. She was off her feet. Then the whole world slammed into her back, driving the air from her lungs in a bloody gasp. The demon slashed at her with claws that seemed made of metal. One tore bloody strips out of her chest, and the other hit the side of her head. Felt like it tore her left ear off, but Henry wasn't in any position to look for a mirror to find out. She reached up, quick as a snake, and grabbed hold of the demon's head with both hands finding the eye sockets and pushing her thumbs in as hard as she could. The demon tore at her arms, and still Henry didn't let go, ignoring the searing pain and pushing, pushing, pushing. Last-ditch attempt by the demon to dislodge her. 
It worked. She fell away and scrabbled to safety, as far away from the raging creature as possible, up against a wall, and she watched it. It slammed into one wall, then staggered back and slammed into the other. Its face was a crimson mess. Even in the dark of the building, Henry could tell that. It gripped its head with both hands, screaming and thrashing. Finally, it staggered backward out into the street and away from the building, a mixture of walking, stumbling, and collapsing, only to regain its feet and start again. Henry waited. She wasn't certain how long. The pain in her arms, her chest, her belly, and her head were a constant pulsing throb that she couldn't ignore. Gingerly, she reached up and touched a hand to the left side of her head. Her ear wobbled. Didn't really seem like a good sign, a wobbling ear, especially not with how much it was hurting. Get up, she said to herself, her voice shaking like a tree in a storm. Get up! This time she screamed at herself. There were folk counting on her. Thorn, Susku, Hells, even Anders. She couldn't just sit in a corner and cry, hoping the demons would pass her by like they had in Hostown. Like she had in Hostown. She wiped tears away from her eyes, only to realize her hands and arms were soaked in blood. Hers and the demons. Something about that seemed to lend her strength, as it always did. Something regal about blood. Something primal. Beautiful. Henry forced herself to her feet, blocked out her pain, and picked up her daggers. One from the floor, and one from the demon's face. She stepped back out onto the street, took a quick look around the battlefield, and went in search of her crew. Chapter 38 Anders Anders leapt backward, then lunged with his rapier, scoring a searing gash across the man's ribs. He released a yell of triumph that would have cowed even the manliest of sparring partners. If the opponent facing him now felt anything, either pain, pleasure, or even mild discomfort, he showed it not at all. He ignored the bloody wound, already closing by the looks of it, and came at Anders with axe swinging. Anders knowing that an axe against a rapier spelled a bad matchup in his direction, fell back, giving ground yet again. The problem was, he lamented, he simply wasn't much of a fighter. Anders had caused his fair share of death, and possibly another man's fair share as well, but he was never very good at the actual killing. Barring a couple of accidental murders, his assassination of Farin Kulth at the behest of Drake, and a few guards or criminals. The distinction between the two here in the wilds often left him confused. He didn't really have many kills to his quite infamous name. Another of the demons joined the fray, this one an astonishingly beautiful woman with fine features, firebrand hair, and a single exposed breast. Anders tripped, tumbled away from her, and then scampered away from the man with the axe. It was strange. But even amidst the chaos and bloodshed, he still found the sight of a pale, exposed breast arousing. Reminded him of Rilly. Reminded him of Henry. He regained his feet and met his opponents head-on, just like his father had claimed a real man should. Of course, the big man complete with axe and a beautiful woman complete with short sword did nothing to bolster his courage. A feint to the left and a dodge to the right and Anders laid another slash across the man's ribs. And again, it didn't seem to phase the brute. Hopping backward, Anders caught a glimpse of the Blackthorn hacking away in the midst of four men at once. It was a sight to behold, and one Anders truly hoped he never had chance to be beholding again. It was the bloody axe that caught his eye, and the faint golden glow it had. It could, of course, have just been a trick of the light, Yet it sparked off a memory in Anders' drunken mind, and he shoved a hand into his pocket, bringing out a strip of paper. With a short prayer to his father's gods, Anders sliced the paper in two with his rapier, and was rewarded with his own glowing weapon. I'd say we're on more of an equal footing now, eh? 
Still fancy your chances? He taunted. Neither demon responded with anything more than a feverish attack. Despite his glowing sword of someone else's righteous glory, Anders once again fell back, which, he knew quite well, was another word for retreating, which in turn was another word for fleeing, and that was something he was more than accomplished at. The beautiful woman tripped on her own tattered dress, and despite Anders' first instinct to help her up and steal her purse, he pressed the dubious advantage by launching himself in a frenzied and quite possibly suicidal attack on the man with the axe. One inch-perfect dodge, complete with wordless cry of terror later, and he was inside the man's reach, with a foot of steel lodged at an impressive angle through the demon's abdomen. He was rewarded with a roar of pain. Anders was just about to congratulate himself on a job well done when the man stopped roaring and looked down upon him with all the fury of the hells in his eyes. With a girlish squeak of terror, Anders withdrew his blade from the man's gut and instead thrust it up through his neck and into his head. The demon teetered for a moment, a ghastly breath escaping from his lips before toppling sideways, wrenching Anders' sword from his hand. The other problem, Anders had to admit, was that he was thoroughly alone. He had always been much better with a crowd of folk who liked, or at the very least tolerated him. They lent him courage, and he, in turn, strove to be better in their presence. Here, on his own and in only his own presence, he was well aware that he was a close-to-useless drunkard, with a distinct dual loyalty issue regarding his employers. With a heavy sigh, he reached down to pry his rapier free. Unfortunately, the beautiful woman demon thing had other ideas, and, disregarding her need for a sword, chose that moment to slam into Anders, tackling him to the ground. They wrestled there for a while amidst the dust and dirt, and each moment was a terrifying lifetime for Anders. She was without a doubt stronger and faster, but Anders had grown up with a lifetime of surprise wrestling encounters, and, while he hadn't enjoyed a single one of them, he had learned how best to defend himself. With a variety of twists, turns, pushes, locks, and one cheeky grope, he dislodged himself from the woman and scampered away, looking for his rapier. The demon, not to be outdone, came at him again long before he found his sword. Discretion, Drake had once told Anders, while blind drunk, on a type of rum as black as tar, is without a fucking doubt the better fucking part of valor. It was a lesson Anders took to heart, and it had saved his life on more than one occasion. This, he fervently hoped, was one of those occasions. With that in mind, he turned tail and ran. He sprinted past blood and violence and bodies, and bodies rising once again to join in with the blood and violence. He spotted a friendly-looking doorway, one that stood open and inviting, and turned for it. Anders wasn't entirely certain why he thought the building would be safe, but then he was acting more on instinct than anything else, and instinct told him four walls and a roof would inevitably be safer than no walls and no roof. Anders' instincts had a habit of leading him into trouble, and they did not disappoint. He skidded to a halt in the hallway of the dilapidated shack and slammed the door shut just in time to hit the screaming but beautiful demon woman in the face with a sturdy slab of timber. Then he turned to find himself confronted by yet another woman this one considerably less beautiful and considerably more armed. A longsword, to be precise, and a sharp-looking one at that. Ah, Anders said, holding up a couple of placating hands. Now, my dear, I wonder if... The woman leapt at him, snarling, longsword swinging. Anders threw himself sideways into a face full of molding wall, and slithered away into the nearest room, well aware the creature behind him was hot on his heels. He made it halfway across the room before something loud shattered across the back of his head, 
causing him to topple and crash to the floor and taking a table with him. Despite wanting to do nothing more than hold his head and weep for a while, Anders knew such vain indulgence would likely cause his probably unavoidable death, so he rolled onto his back and wiped away the blood from his face. Blood that tasted suspiciously like wine. He licked his lips. Did you just throw a wine jug at me? He asked the oncoming demon. She didn't answer, just leapt atop him, grabbed hold of his neck, and drove her sword into his chest. Anders Brekovic knew one thing. If he was going to die, it was going to be the best damned death scene any man had ever given anywhere and he didn't care if the only ones to see it were the demonic woman who had murdered him and the small grasshopper perched on the nearby window ledge. With that in mind, he gave a wail of pain and suffering, the likes of which would have moved the hearts of statues. He flung out his arms and cried out the unfairness of it all, and finally expelled his last breath, only to take another. In fairness, the demon woman, ugly, scarred, brutish, stub-nosed beast that she was, she looked just as confused as Anders. She lifted her sword up a little to find it lodged in something inside of his jacket. Their eyes met as both of them realized she had stabbed his hip flask. He grinned. Something dark and angry hit the demon, tackling her off of Anders, and both her and the raging whirlwind of blades scrabbled on the floor for a moment before that same whirlwind gained the advantage, straddled the demon, and started stabbing. It took Anders a moment of laying on the floor, dumbfounded, to realize Henry had just saved his life again, and she was busy checking the insides of the demon for valuables. She, of course, found only blood, and plenty of it. She was, in fact, dripping in gore before the attack had begun, and if anything, she was now a little less bloody. As soon as the demon stopped twitching, Henry was up, her hat long since lost, her face a crimson mask, her left ear missing, and her two dark eyes feverish, bright, and somewhere between intense, and causing Anders' bowels to loosen. She extended him a bloody hand. He didn't hesitate in taking it. I believe a thank you is in order, Anders said. It's possible. You may have just saved my life, my lady. Henry nodded at the doorway to the room, and then to the window, and Anders noticed another three demons, two skinny men and one very beautiful, broken-nosed woman closing in on them. Don't reckon it's worth the thanking till it's a fact, Anders, Henry said, reversing the grip on her daggers and readying herself to pounce. Then how about an apology, he said giving her his infamous and well-prepared smile. She ignored it. I'm sorry about that whole incident with my losing your trust. The demons were closing slowly now, wary of Henry and her glowing daggers. What incident? she asked. You mean the whole you working for Drake fucking morass thing? Anders picked up a broken chair leg. It wasn't much of a weapon, but he supposed cracking a skull was much like cracking an egg, only involving more swings. Precisely that. I'm sorry. Henry snorted. You want to be sorry? Stop fucking working for him. One doesn't simply leave the employment of Drake Morass, my dear. One is usually let go from a great height. Coward. I never claimed to be otherwise. You ready for this? No! Good enough! Henry led the charge, and Anders followed. Chapter 39 Susku They hadn't moved. Neither Pern nor Master Koshin. He had yet to see the old master's face, but Pern didn't need to see it. He knew its every line, every wrinkle, every scar, and every expression. Master Koshin had been old even when Pern was a child, the clan's longest surviving Harin. 
never lost a client, never failed the clan. Koshin was everything that embodied the Harin, and he was here to kill Pern. There didn't really seem like much to say. Pern knew the day would come when a Harin from his clan caught up to him. He had truly hoped it would be somebody, anybody else. But the world worked in its own ways, and no amount of hoping would change that. Kochin was Harin. Pern was Honin. They would fight. One would die. Likely that one would be Pern, though he hoped otherwise. The sounds of fighting started. Metal clashed against metal, shouting, screaming, even an explosion or two. Still, neither Pern nor Koshin moved. It was a nice night, a slight chill in the air, and the lanterns did their best to ward off the darkness. Stars winked in and out of existence overhead, and still the two of them faced each other from across the street no more than ten paces between them. Action through inaction was part of the Harin training. Battles should be won with a single stroke of the blade, and in that discipline, stillness was as important as movement. Pern ran through a hundred moves in his head, then thought about a different stance, and went through a hundred more. It was possible Koshin was doing the same. Likely he was doing the same. Pern had never known his father. None of the Harin did. They were taken as children, given names by the clan elders, and raised by the entire clan to be the next generation of Harin. He had never known his father, but in his weak times, in his flights of fancy, he had imagined he was sired by Koshin. The strong hands, the steady, even stance, and that sky-blue aura, the color of deepest control. Any Harin would have been proud to be sired by Koshin, and Pern was no different. Another scream in the distance. This one sounded almost like Henry, and Pern's eyes flicked away just for a moment. It is time to fulfill your contract, Honin. Master Koshin's voice was rich and deep and accented by his many, many years out in the wilds. He had served no fewer than four contracts. Most Harin only managed two at best. Pern had not completed his first. He had barely even started it before helping to kill the man he was sworn to protect. Has the clan given a contract to Kesik? Pern asked. Master Koshin slowly raised a gnarled hand, and with the butt of his sword, raised his hat an inch. Pern saw a deep green eye, set in a wrinkled old face, glaring at him from underneath the straw hat. Kessit came to us. He requested no contract. He told us you were here with the Blackthorn, and that the Blackthorn would come to him. Then. Should you kill me, Pern said slowly, I would ask you to visit the same fate upon Kessik. Silence. It stretched on for so long, Pern almost began to think the old master Harin would not answer. It is not my place. I am Harin. Pern clenched his jaw. For the first time in his life, he felt the inactivity grate upon him. His friends were fighting, maybe dying. The Blackthorn and Anders. Henry. His teeth ground against one another, and he drew his sword. A slow motion, letting the blade fully clear the scabbard before taking the hilt in both hands, the point of the blade dropping to the ground and slightly to the right. Still, Master Koshin did not draw his sword. If you will not kill Kessik, then I will have to kill you, Pern said through gritted teeth. A dirty red had begun to seep into his own aura. Had Koshin been able to see it, he would have been disgusted. 
Harin had no need for emotion, especially not anger. There is only one way this can end, Honin. Should you best me, so long as even one Harin from our clan draws breath, they will hunt you. Susku frowned. Then I see two ways this can end. Master Koshin took his sword away from his hat and let it drop back down to obscure his face. You would destroy your own clan over this? I have seen the type of people our clan protects. I myself was ordered to protect the most evil man I have ever known. It is not a Harin's place to judge their client. Pern straightened his back to its full height. I am Honin. I can judge as I please. Again, that crushing silence. Even now, after a year of being a Honin, Master Koshin's disappointment cut Pern to the bone. He focused, attempting to bury his feelings the way Harin were taught. It was no good. He couldn't rid himself of them. He couldn't find that sense of peace he once had by knowing he was doing right just by serving his clan. Ash and embers drifted across the street. Somewhere something was burning, likely a building, possible the whole town. Pern wasn't about to look to find out. Taking his eyes off an opponent as deadly as Master Koshin was to invite death. Pern tilted his sword a little and drew his left foot back an inch, still trying to decide how best to attack. Master Koshin himself had once said, Sometimes the best way to win is not to do something the opponent does not expect, but to do something they do expect, and do it better than they expect. Wiser words may rarely have been spoken, but Pern still found himself lost amidst a sea of possibilities. Koshin was by far the most dangerous opponent he had ever faced, and now Pern was Honin, he would not hesitate to deal the killing blow to his former student. Pern edged his right foot forward. Koshin charged. For a man of considerable years, the old master Harin moved like lightning. He covered the distance between them in moments, and still Pern was frozen by indecision. He heard Koshin's sword slide from its sheath and saw the tilt of the man's left foot, and he acted. Pern stepped to his left, went down to one knee, and struck. His sword moved upward and outward from his right hand in a deadly arc. He felt Koshin's sword prick his chest, a white-hot lance of pain for an instant, and then it was gone. Pern stood on shaky legs and took a deep, Ragged breath. He reached into his coat pocket with his left hand and pulled out a dirty yellow cloth. With exaggerated care, he wiped the blood from his blade, making sure the sword was spotless. He pocketed the cloth and slowly resheathed his sword. Pern sighed, the ghost of a smile on his lips, and collapsed next to the body of his old master, their blood mixing in the dust. Chapter 40 Jacob For so long the world had been silent. Jacob had heard no music since that day in Chade, since waking up without a tongue. Now was different. Now the whole band was in attendance, and they were making such a din. Jacob could hear nothing else. Drums, pipes, lutes, whistles, fiddles, flutes, and even a harp, and a raucous tune they played. Some might consider the mess of notes and sounds to be nothing but noise. Jacob could hear past the chaos, to the order within. It dragged him along like a leaf in a current, and he was happy, and more than happy, to go with the flow. He let it pull him push him, twist him, and move him and his partners. So many partners were brutally introduced to the joy and terror of his dance. A young woman 
barely old enough to bleed, reached for him, eager to join his jig. Jacob caught her wrist, spun her around, and snapped her arm with a punch, then threw her into the merry onlookers. Her screams only added to the rhythm of the dance. Another woman, this one older, with flesh that spoke of recent childbirth, and hips that suggested it was the latest of many. She joined in the dance and brought cold steel with her. A man as well, old and pox-scarred, and with teeth like knives. Jacob was not opposed to multiple partners. The music was loud, and the night was alive, and the more the merrier. He spun around the man's axe and under the woman's sword, and gave her a fist like thunder to her gut. He counted four broken ribs. As she collapsed, Jacob plucked the steel from her hand, planted it in the man's face, and danced away from the resulting blood. Behind the woman, he took hold of her chin, and wrenched backwards, both hearing and feeling the snap of her neck. More partners and more entered the floor, and Jacob danced with all of them. Demons they may be, and both stronger and faster than they looked, but he was beyond them. Their bones broke like sticks, and they bled red, the same as any other. His blessings burned with power, and with each new partner, Jacob felt himself grow stronger. He turned aside a sword with the flat of his palm and directed the strike into the path of another. He shattered a man's jaw like glass with an elbow. He picked up the body of a child, soulless and dead, with the demon inside and threw it into the crowd. He dropped, rolled into the dust, and came up in a torrent of blows, each to the beat of a drum, and scattered bodies. Yet they kept coming, drawn to his power like moths drawn toward a flame, and he would burn them. Faster and faster, the tempo spun, and faster and faster Jacob danced. He was a blur, a flash. Lightning that struck again and again and again. He caught a stray leg, a demon wearing the face of a man as big as a bear, and twisted. The bones shattered, and the demon went down face first. Jacob did not let go. He jumped on the demon's back and pulled. Flesh tore, and the leg came free in a torrent of blood and screaming. Jacob spun around, using the leg as a mace. A man found purchase on his arm, two long claws attempting to tear into skin. Jacob stepped close, butting the man in the head three times until both their faces were bloody. He stepped back and then forward and then to the side in a strange waltz, the man's body hanging limp in his arms. The music changed again, all instruments but the fiddle fading to silence. Jacob shoved his hand in the man's mouth grabbed hold of the bottom of his jaw, and tore it free, burying the shard of bone in his next partner's eye. The next partner was a surprise, so eager to join in, they hit him from behind. Metal punctured skin, and Jacob gasped in pain. They both went down, rolling in the dust and blood and bodies. Jacob was up first. He grabbed hold of his partner's arm, a woman with eyes the deepest blue, and heaved. The shell took flight, a rag doll, spinning in the air for a moment, and then two, and then another, before crashing to the ground in a heap. Jacob pulled the dagger from his side, and the drums took up the beat once again, each clash a stab, and each lull a death. For a moment, the music slowed. The harp played a sad note, and across the street, Jacob saw her. The woman who had started the fight, the woman Thankful Darkheart knew. Even if he had still possessed his tongue, Jacob would have been struck dumb by the sight of her. She danced to a beat all of her own. Her movements were water, and her sword strokes were fire. She was an artist painting in shades of death and all of life was her canvas. For that moment, Jacob stood still, awed by her grace, and he wanted nothing more than to dance with her. But 
She was not his partner. She never would be. Jacob was blessed. It was beyond his fate to die, and he knew that she was a fight he could not win. A soldier wielding a pair of knives stepped into Jacob's view, and the music was back, rushing in like a tsunami, and Jacob crashed down upon the man. He was a whirlwind of blows, each one smashing bone and pulverizing flesh. He tossed the soldier's head to the ground, and for just a moment, the other demons gave pause. Just for a moment. Chapter 41 The Blackthorn Weren't much got the blood pumping like a good fight, except maybe a good fuck, but it didn't look like that was in the offing, so Betram was more than happy to take the fight. Truth was, it had been a long time since he'd been in a proper scrape like this, and no mistake. He was beaten and bloody, and his chances looked slim. Yet, he'd given better than he'd got, and if the bastards really wanted to take him down, he'd damn sure take a few more of them with him. A fat drop of blood ran down from the gash on his forehead pooled at the end of his scarred nose and dropped to the dust. The demons were coming for him before the next drop had chance to form. Four of them, and each one armed with a sword. Three men and a woman, and all looked like they had once been soldiers, or guards, or maybe even bounty hunters like him. He flicked out his left hand, and another dagger flew into the throat of the woman. Truth was, he was fast running short of pointy objects to throw, and they weren't really having much of an effect, save the obvious distraction of the victim having to remove a length of metal from their body. He stepped into the first attack, his axe deflecting the sword, and then stepped back into the next, giving it similar treatment. He ducked around the third of his enemies and took out a chunk of leg with the business end of his axe. When he had first chopped the rune in two, he had half expected his weapon to burst into flames, but it didn't, just glowed a little, almost like lantern light on gold, only the glow seemed to come from within the blade. He danced back a few steps, almost tripping over the body of one of his previous opponents. Damned woman, stank like a brothel, stale sweat and stale sex and stale blood. Not the most enticing of aromas and no mistake. Truth was, there was a time the Blackthorn might have found it appealing. Such times were long past. The woman was there, leaping at him, short sword glinting in the firelight. Seemed one of the nearby buildings was well and truly ablaze. No doubt, Betram would find himself blamed for that. The Blackthorn laughed as he stepped aside from the blow and planted his axe in the woman's throat, right next to the dagger. Damn near took her head clean off what with the momentum and all. He plucked the sword from her hand as her corpse fell to the ground and readied himself for the next three demons. He didn't much like playing with swords, but sometimes needs must, and right now his musts were starting to get real needy. The three demon men closed slowly, taking their sweet time. They took so long, Betram almost started to wonder whether their plan was to let him bleed to death. He had a fair few cuts, though none of them felt much like threatening his life. Don't tell me I've gone and got you all scared, he rasped out. Thought it'd take more than the likes of me to scare a demon. One of the men, the one with the big nose, turned his head and trotted off. The others kept on closing. Betram tried to keep an eye on them all. Hard work, given he had only the one of them. Both remaining demons charged him. He gave a quick thought to the possible outcomes of his first instinct, then ignored the advice his brain offered and charged them both right back. He blocked the attack from the right demon with his new sword, then parried the attack from the left demon with his axe. Then he shoved his new sword into the left demon's face and planted his axe between the eyes of the right demon. The left demon stumbled away, screaming and clawing at the shard of steel sticking out of his mouth. The right demon toppled, dead, and looking every part of it. Betram bent down, pulled his axe from between the demon's eyes with a grunt, and then launched it at the wounded demon. The blade buried itself in the creature's chest, and it went down with a groan and thud. 
Betram grinned at his job well done, well aware of just how gruesome that made him look, and not caring a drop. Something sharp and painful and more than a little unwelcome found a new home in the meat of his left thigh. Thorn spun around to find a little girl, couldn't be no more than six years, growling at him. He looked down at his leg. A spear! A fucking spear! He roared. Truth was, it would likely have planted itself up his ass, but it seemed to be twisted up with his coat. Never before had he been so glad of the overpriced duster. Not that he'd paid for it. Just so happened it was a gift from Rose, and he wasn't overly pleased with the damage. He took hold of the spear and snapped it with his other hand, wrenched the head out of his leg, an act that required no small amount of not passing out, and pulled the girl close before planting the metallic end of the spear in the top of her skull. Now, Betram was no stranger to dealing with the dead, and he knew that sometimes the usual act of killing a person left them a little more alive than he liked. It was because of this that he wasn't entirely surprised when the girl dropped to the floor and thrashed around like a fish on land, instead of doing the natural thing and expiring. He also knew that his axe would finish off the girl for good and all, but it was over there and he was over here and he had a different idea. He stepped on the girl's thrashing back, raised up a big, metal-shod boot, and stamped it on her head. It crunched and burst, much like a melon might, given the same treatment. The girl stopped moving, for good and all. Betram lifted up his boot, now sticky with red and pink and gray, and took a stumbling step backward. He'd seen many things in his life, and done many more, and some of them far worse than that. Still, for some reason he found it a right struggle to keep down his last meal. He looked around for his axe, and found it just where he had left it. He wandered over with a speed much like a stroll and pulled it free. Reckon I might stick to you in the future, he said to it with a grin. It was a strange time to realize, but he noticed there was no one else trying to kill him. Nearby, he could see a right fight taking place. More demons than he could count were pouring in to take down the Arbiter with the tattoos. Seemed the demon who had cut and run from the Blackthorn was over there too. Something about that felt a little disgruntling. Almost like Betram Thorn wasn't scary enough, so the demon had to seek death elsewhere. A body flew out from the circle and crunched to the ground, and two more demons rushed in to take its place. He glimpsed the Arbiter then. Jacob was spinning and striking and dodging and blocking, and even as Betram watched, he saw two demons jump onto the man's back and drag him down to the ground. More piled on, and more, and they all became a writhing mess of flesh and wild, savage attacks. It didn't look good for the poor bastard. So many demons, and the Arbiter was down, and he had no one else to help him. The Blackthorn was perhaps the only one near enough to help. Betram shrugged, and he kept scanning the street. Backed up against a building and keeping each other covered, he spotted Henry and Anders. Neither of the two looked to be in a particularly good state, and Henry the Red was earning every bit of her name. A whole group of demon people, looked to be at least seven of them, were prowling nearby, ready to go in for the kill and making something of a game of it. That didn't hold too well with the Blackthorn. Keswick was over the other side of the street, directing his minions with frantic gestures and frantic orders. Thorn reckoned he could get a good run at the bastard. He had a few guards, probably the best of his lot. But the Blackthorn didn't fear a good fight. The decision was made before he had a chance to think it through, and he wasn't sure whether he'd pick any different, given an age of procrastinating. Betram readied his axe, set a wild grin to his face, roared out something wordless and full of what most folk would consider anger, and charged to the aid of his crew. Chapter 42 Jezet Jez had never lived an easy life. For as long as she could remember, she had fought, scrapped, 
clawed and fucked for every minute of her often painful existence. And now was no exception. She blocked, slashed, parried, growled, locked, punched, stabbed, dodged, kicked, and screamed. For every moment and every moment, she became more and more the woman Yuri Velern had told her she would be. Years and years ago now, Jezid had killed her old master, as all blade masters must. Her final test and greatest challenge, to kill the man she had come to trust with her life, the man who had taught her all she knew. It was not a clean kill. She had given him a fatal wound, and he had smiled at her. Blade master I might have been, but mine was a wasted life, chasing nothing but my own desires, and my next treasure. But you, Jezit, you will be great, and greater than great. Your name will be... He had died, then, but Jez had got the idea. She had always thought it folly, the ramblings of an old dying man, but in Sarth, when she shed her fear and her inhibitions, she had realized Yuri was right, only she lacked a purpose. The blade masters of old followed causes, aligned themselves with great kings and queens, or fought on the side of rebellion to help those who couldn't help themselves. Jezit Velern had never had a purpose, at least not until she met Thankwell. She might not believe in his god or his inquisition, but that didn't matter. She believed in him, and that made him her cause. Jez gained herself a second blade. Wasn't too hard. There were swords aplenty in the street now. She parried an attack with one and took the man's arm off, just below the elbow with the other, and flowed into her next attack, striking two demons at once. She knew her blades could not kill the creatures, but they were a damned sight less dangerous when they had no arms. Or no eyes, Jez. Reckon you're pretty good at taking those out these days. She whirled around from a wild swing and hamstrung a woman in the process, skipping backwards and glancing around to gain her bearings. At first, she had tried for Kessick, but that soon became a hopeless endeavor. There were simply too many demon people protecting him. Now she looked for Thankwell, to help him, to protect him, and just to be near him again. Close to the burning building she found him, beset by four demons, and looking far the worse for it. Jez could see Thankwell struggling toward Kessick, fending off harrying attacks meant to cripple, not kill. He was far, maybe too far, and there was a small host between them. But Jez could feel the fire of battle in her veins, and Blade Masters were not so easily deterred. Last thing I'd call this is easy, Jez. She stepped close to a woman demon and locked its sword with her own, only to step away a moment later, taking the creature's hand off at the wrist. Then she turned and started away from them all, away from Thankwell. A quick feint to her right, and Jez cut to her left, breaking into a sprint and skirting the chasing demons. A man stepped into her way, big and burly and with more beard than face. Jez leapt at him, brushed his axe away, and hit him full in the chest. They both went down, rolling in the dust, him scrabbling for purchase, her poking one of her swords in his chest. Easier to leave it there, Jez. She grabbed the dagger sheathed on his belt, pulled it free, flowed back onto her feet, and was running again. Her pursuers had gained, but she was still ahead and closing in on Thankwell fast. One of the demons brought down a hammer blow on the Arbiter. He blocked, but the attack forced him to his knees, and another of the creatures closed in from behind. Then Jez caught them. She barreled into the demon behind Thankwell at full speed and sent the creature tumbling away. With no time to waste and no sense for safety, Jezet vaulted over Thankwell and kicked the second demon in the face. The Arbiter surged to his feet and turned, and he and Jezit stood back to back, weapons drawn and ready and facing down their enemies. Wasn't too long before they were surrounded and more than a little outnumbered. Good timing, Thankwell said. I was starting to think you weren't coming. Jez found herself smiling. Had to leave it till the last moment, 
I like to make an entrance. He laughed, but only for a moment. I'm sorry, Jess. Huh? For not believing you. About Drake. I'm sorry. Jez's heart gave a flutter. Now might not be the best moment for this, she said, unable to stop smiling. Maybe, he agreed, slipping something into her hand. It turned out to be a slip of paper, and she wasted no time in slicing it in two with her sword, which took on a distinctive golden glow. But I can't be sure we'll get another, so now we'll have to do. She should have told him then how she felt. She wanted to tell him, wanted to say the words, but her throat tightened and refused to give voice to her thoughts, so she settled for thinking it instead. I love you. I need you to watch my back, Thankful said, and Jez noticed the demons had backed off a little. Always, she managed to croak. She felt his back disappear, took it to mean he was walking away, and she glanced back at him. I can't be certain how they'll react, he said as he took hold of something in his coat and pulled it free. A moment later, a whole mess of paper fluttered to the ground behind him. The demons backed away further, giving ground before him, around him. Jez followed slowly, keeping distance and keeping watch, glancing back at him whenever she could. Then she saw what he carried. A sword black as night that looked like it had crawled up out of hell itself. The blade was uneven, jagged, and hard to focus on. Looks like a demon, Jez. Looks like a demon blade. Thankful? She started to say something. Not really sure what, and not really sure why. But it felt like she should give voice to some sort of thought. Keswick interrupted her. Now, where did you get that, Arbiter Darkheart? Took it from your master's smoking corpse she heard Thankwell say, with a voice colder than she'd heard before. I was thinking of leaving it in yours. Silence rushed in to fill the gap, or at least as silent as a battlefield could get, where fighting was still very much taking place somewhere nearby. The blazing building to her right decided upon that moment to collapse in a gout of flame that quickly set two neighboring dwellings on fire. The demons were closing in behind Thankwell, so Jez kept close by, protecting him, as she had decided she would. I see, grated Keswick, and Jez heard the sing of steel leaving scabbard as he said it. She glanced back to see both men, just a few paces from each other, and both with swords in hand. Jez had done her best to teach Thankwell how to fight, but he was far from a master, and she was far from certain he could beat Keswick. Yet he had brought that sword here, so she supposed he must have a plan, and she trusted him enough to believe he could see it through. Of course, that didn't mean she wouldn't take the chance to give Keswick a good stabbing should the opportunity present itself, and she sorely hoped it did. Jez saw Thankwell move out of the corner of her eye, preparing to strike. Keswick stepped backward, his hand held out in front of him. Wait! I should wait if I were you, Arbiter. Kill me, and Jezet Verlern dies too. What? Jezet and Thankwell said in unison. Our fates are bound. If I die, so does she. Keswick continued, but Jez didn't hear him. Didn't hear anything over the blood rushing in her own ears and the deafening beating of her heart. The charm! She looked down at her left wrist, at the fresh scar along the precise line of the old one. The scar first made to sew an anti-pregnancy charm into her wrist, and she knew what had to be done. Jez dropped her sword, and without so much as a thought, drew her dagger across her left wrist. She gasped at the pain and gritted her teeth. Yuri had inflicted far worse injuries on her during her training. She would endure. Not deep enough, Jez! She drew back the dagger and stabbed it into her wrist, the pain driving her to her knees and flooding her eyes with tears, so the world became a blurred mess of color and agony. 
she cut into the flesh beneath the skin and dug with the point until it hit something solid, and she sent a prayer to any god would listen that it wasn't bone. Throwing down the dagger, she thrust her fingers into her open, bleeding wrist and cried out, There, Jez! That's it! Her fingers brushed the charm, and the world went black. Chapter 43 Thankwell Thankwell opened his eyes to darkness. Only, it wasn't darkness. It was black and it was endless, but it wasn't as though he couldn't see. He saw his arm stretched out in front of him, he saw Mjorso in his hand, and he saw the business end sticking into Kessick's chest. He also saw Kessick, pale and with a face of confusion and pain, but Kessick nonetheless, his own hand still outstretched, yet no blade present. Thankwell looked around glancing first left and then right. He could definitely see, only there was nothing to see. Help me, breathed Kessick softly. Thankwell turned back to the man. Why? Kessick fixed him with a cold stare. I wasn't talking to you. A laugh sounded in the nothingness, loud and heartless and strangely familiar. It echoed around and around, until Thankwell could not tell where it came from. Then, from behind Kessick, stepped Thankwell's mirror image. Or maybe I was, said Kessick. Thankwell's doppelganger took two steps, until he was between the two, and looked at them both. He looked younger than Thankwell, but only because he also looked healthier. No black bags under his eyes, no scraggly beard left uncut for too long, no wounds from the fight. Help me, pleaded Kessick. Why? asked Thankwell's mirror. We had a deal! Thankwell laughed. The other Thankwell. Our contract in no way states I must save your life, and it is null and void upon your death. Tell me, why would I need you? The other Thankwell looked at Thankwell. When I have him. Kessick opened his mouth to protest, but nothing came out. Like dust on a breeze, he simply faded away until there was nothing left. Thankwell dropped Mjorso and backed away from himself, glancing around with wild eyes. Where are we? Am I? Is this the void? The other Thankwell looked at him like a wise man might look upon a foolish child, only with far less compassion. Not quite. This is you, Thankwell Darkheart. We are inside you. And you're... The demon, Miorzo. The way the demon spat the word, Thankwell was far from certain that was its real name. Ignoring the irony of the question, Thankwell asked it anyway. Why do you feel so familiar? Miorso smiled. Because you are me. No! No? That's not true! Are you sure? Your god has an incarnation, a piece of himself born in mortal form. Are you so sure I can't do the same? Thankwell stared down at himself and wondered if his face always looked so smug. You're lying! A room began to build itself around them. Four walls layered upon each other, brick by brick, and a roof of straw growing into existence, faster and faster, until they were inside a building, inside a room. A hearth sprang to life in one of the walls, though it provided no heat, and a chair grew out of the floor. Part of one wall fell away to reveal a window, though no light shone in from outside. A stray straw dropped from the roof and formed into a mattress on the floor in front of the hearth. Do you remember this place? the demon asked. Thankwell nodded. 
This was my home. Before... Two figures faded into life on top of the mattress, both naked and writhing, thrusting, grunting, and groaning in pain and ecstasy. Fankwell's parents. Thane and Issa Fisher, said the demon in Thankwell's own voice. She was barren, you know. Thankwell saw his mother claw at his father's back and gasp. There a point to this? he asked himself. This was the first time we met, said Muorso. I was here, at your conception. They wanted a child so badly, and Volmar would not answer their prayers. So they called on other powers, and I answered. Thankwell grimaced as both his parents shuddered in climax. He turned away from the scene. And what was the price? You were both the price and the payment. I gave them you. I gave them myself. He might have struck at the demon had he thought it would do any good. It isn't the only time we've met, continued Murso. Hundreds of times since then I've come to you, keeping an eye on you. How? Thankwell asked. You were inside the sword. Miorso laughed. <laughs> you think in such small terms. I was there. I was here. I'm in many places all at once, just like your god. The demon stepped up beside Thankwell. Would you like to see what Kessick saw? No. But it was too late. His old home, and his parents faded away, and a wall began to build itself beneath his feet. A giant wall. It stretched out as far as the eye could see, in both directions. Higher and higher it grew, with Thankwell and his mirror standing at the top, watching the world shrink beneath them. Figures down below began to move. Hundreds of them, thousands of them, tens of thousands. A sea of movement down below. A dead sea. Dead bodies writhed together, surging toward the wall and throwing themselves at it, hacking at it with picks and hammers and arms ending in bloody stumps, climbing upon each other in an attempt to reach the top. Nothing grows in the land of the dead, said Miorso in Thankwell's ear. Nothing lives in the land of the dead. Thankwell completed the saying. You've been there. You've seen the dead walk. Never seen an army of the dead, Thankwell mused at the chaos below him. One of many, said Miorso. One of seven, and each one bent on flooding the world with death. The dreadlords are returning, the demon finished for him. This is what I showed to Kessick. He saw it, and knew action was needed. He knew your god could not be trusted to help you. Again, Thankwell turned away from the image. He was wrong. Miorso stepped in front of Thankwell, his face a picture of rage, and Thankwell realized he could look quite scary when angry. Why do you cling to him? Miorso demanded. Why do you believe in him? Thankwell opened his mouth to reply, but the demon cut him off. Do you even know what your god truly is? Do you know he and I come from the same place? Thankwell refused to let anything show on his face, but even so, the demon smiled at him. You didn't. Your god comes from the world you call the Void, just as I do. We are one and the same, he and I. Belief was a tricky thing, hard to explain and harder to keep. If anything, faith was even trickier. It doesn't matter, Thankwell said to the demon. Though it does make sense, 
I believe in Volmar's teachings, in his ideals, and I have faith that his plan for us is the right course. It doesn't matter to me if he's a god or a demon. It's him I believe in, not the word we give to define him. You would defy me? asked the demon. Thankwell looked himself in the eye. Yes. The wall vanished into the nothing, fading to black, and in front of Thankwell an image of Jezid appeared. She was on her knees, her eyes flooded with tears, and her wrist dripping with blood, her own fingers digging into the wound. He felt his throat close and choked back his own tears at the image. He had been desperately trying not to think of her. He failed. Hot, wet tears rolled salty tracks down his cheeks and into his beard. Is she... dead? he asked. Not yet. The demon walked up to Jezet and looked at her closely. Time isn't exactly on track here, but she's going to die. In your words, demon magic is the power to change fate. Kessick used that power to change hers, linked it to his own. The moment he dies, so does she. You can't change that. Oh, but I can. The demon looked up at Thankwell from behind the image of Jezet and smiled. I can stop her from dying. Thankwell didn't bother to wipe the tears from his eyes. And the price? No different to that I gave to your parents. You. I want your service. Your... No, Thankwell said, almost choking on his words. He closed his eyes, forced the tears to stop, and when he opened them, the image of Jezet was gone. No, he said again. Huh? said his mirror image looking confused for the first time. Thankwell looked the demon in the eye. I'm going to give you what you want most, Mjorso. I'm going to set you free. The demon stood, watching Thankwell carefully. You can't. I can. The chains were forged by Volmar himself. Only he... I am Volmar's will! Thankwell all but shouted before he could rein in his emotions. He walked over toward the discarded demon blade and looked down upon it. And for that, you want the life of Jezet Velurn? Thankwell let out a ragged breath. No. For that, I want you to leave. You and all your brethren. I'm going to set you all free, shatter the chains, and break the ties that bind you to the Inquisition. And in return... I want you all to leave this world and never return! He knelt down and picked up the demon blade, taking it in both hands and waiting for the demon's answer. The creature seemed to take forever to decide, and when Thankwell turned, he found his own face staring at him from only a few paces away. I agree to the terms of the contract, Miorso said in Thankwell's voice. The demon blade shattered. Chapter 44 Thankwell The demon blade shattered. Kessick, slack-mouthed and vacant-eyed, toppled. Mjorso's dark presence rushed out of the sword in a black fog. The building behind them burned bright yellow, ash drifting into the air. Thankwell turned from the scene just in time to see Jezet hit the ground. She didn't move. He ran to her, collapsing onto his knees by her body, and slowly reached out to touch her. Her only wound was her bleeding wrist, self-inflicted and far from fatal. Thankwell had almost expected to see a stab wound, just where he had killed Kessick, but there was nothing. She was whole. Her eyes were open wide, staring blankly into the sky, yet the light had already gone. Jez had already gone. There was nothing left but a body. The world grew blurry again, and Thankwell felt the tears come. 
choked them back, and knelt by her. Her clothes were tatty, a mere step above rags. Her hair was a mess, longer than she liked it, and she was spotted everywhere with others' blood. It seemed wrong somehow. Not a death deserving of a blade master. Not a death deserving of Jezet Velern. She still wore his ring, the little wooden charm he had made for her in Sarth. He remembered the way she liked to play with it, rub at it with her thumb whenever she was nervous. Thankwell heard voices close by and raised, and he blocked them out. He shut out the world and just knelt by her. A traitorous part of him kept imagining she would suck in a deep breath and sit up, and it would all be a cruel final joke played by the demon. But she didn't. No matter how much he watched her, no matter how many tears he shed, she didn't get up. More shouting. A moat of ash landed on Jezet's face, just below her left eye, marring her skin, covering the small scar she had there. He reached out with a shaky hand and wiped it away, but it only smudged, made things worse, and her skin felt cold. Thankwell couldn't help himself. He gave her shoulder a shake. Jezet's head lolled to the side. Still, she didn't get up. Something hard and fast hit him in the face, slapped his cheek and stung. He barely felt the pain. He was too busy feeling tired and numb. It came again, tried to hit him, and he caught it. Turned out to be a hand and a wrist connected to a thin, bloody arm with oozing wounds. Thankwell looked up into Henry's eyes, and for just a moment the little woman looked scared. A flicker of fear soon replaced with her more familiar anger. She wrenched free her hand and turned Thankwell away from Jezet's body. He didn't stop her. It wasn't like any of it mattered anymore. You and Thorn had a deal, she said to him, her fierce face spotted red and brown. She's dead. Henry nodded her face a picture of compassion, if not for the permanent sneer created by the scar on her lip. Thorn'll be too if you don't do something. You had a deal. Keswick's life for a pardon. That fucker is dead. Time you lived up to your end. Thankwell frowned and looked up. There, she pointed and he followed her finger. The Blackthorn and Jacob Lee were facing each other over a stretch of street crowded with bodies. Thorn held an axe in one hand, and his other was cradled against his chest. Blood ran down his face from a cut on his scalp, and he was shouting something. Jacob Lee limped slowly toward Thorn, a dagger sticking from his left leg, and three deep gouges cut across his face. It seemed a miracle the wounds had not hit his eyes, but both seemed intact. Do something, Henry said her voice quiet but strict. Thankwell nodded slowly and wiped away the tears from his eyes on his coat sleeve. Look after her, he said to Henry and pushed himself to his feet. He crossed the distance to the two slowly, each step an effort greater than the last. His limbs felt leaden. His eyes struggled to focus. His mind screamed at him to go back to Jezet, lest she should wake and he not be there. He forced the traitorous thought to silence. There were bodies everywhere, so many of them, some with wounds, some without. True to its word, the demon had taken all its brethren with it when it had left. They had vacated the human bodies and left nothing but empty shells behind. Empty shells, like Jezet. The two were still a fair distance apart, Jacob limping faster with each step, and the Blackthorn backing away, screaming at the Templar to stay back. Thankwell put himself between them. Stop, he said, his voice barely more than a defeated whisper. Jacob took another step. Stop, Jacob, please. Another step. The Blackthorn isn't to be harmed. I've pardoned him. Jacob took another step so he was within arm's reach of Thankwell, 
and then stopped, staring down at the smaller man. He shook his head. Thankwell nodded. It's an order, Jacob. The Blackthorn is not to be harmed. He sniffed and forced back fresh tears. I've already lost too much today. I'm not about to lose the only friend I have left. Jacob turned his gaze from Thankwell to the Blackthorn and back again. Then he struck. Jacob's hand took Thankwell around the throat, and the Templar gasped. Thankwell had been ready for him. He wove together as many curses as he could. A person had five senses, and there was a curse for each one. Thankwell used them all, and it had just the effect he wanted. For a man so used to having his senses augmented, Jacob didn't know how to function when all of them were taken from him at once. His pupils dilated, his skin prickled, and his mouth worked absently. It wouldn't last long, but it didn't need to. Thankwell pulled his pistol from his belt, put the barrel underneath Jacob's chin, and... BANG! Jacob's head snapped back, and gore spattered Thankwell in the face. The Templar teetered for a moment, and toppled backward, hitting the ground with a dull thud and a puff of dust. Thankwell stood for a moment, watching blood leak into the dirt from the hole in Jacob's head. He dropped his pistol, turned, and stumbled back to Jezit's body, collapsing onto the ground next to her. She still hadn't moved. She's dead, he said again, more to himself than to anyone else. He didn't know how long he knelt there by her body. It might have been minutes, might have been hours. Pictures and noises passed by him in a blur. At some point, someone closed Jezit's eyes, her beautiful brown eyes, gone forever. Thankful, a harsh voice, deep and rough. She's dead. I, the voice said, and then paused, as though admitting such a thing was hard work. Reckon we should do something about that. Thankwell looked up at Thorn. He looked sad, his one eye wet, despite the dry heat of the street. Dunno what your folk do with the dead, Thorn continued in a thick voice. Got enough of them lying around here, and no mistake. Too many for us to deal with them all, so most we're just gonna leave. Took that bastard's head off, just to make sure. Some folk we don't want coming back. Coming back, Thankwell echoed, looking at Jezid. They don't come back like that, Thankwell, Thorn said. But I reckon you know that. Thankwell sniffed. His nose was running. We can bury her, or we can build a pyre. Reckon this whole town'll be naught but ash soon enough. Storm passed by us without so much as a drop. Thankwell nodded to Thorn's words, though he barely heard them. I don't think she'd want burying, he said. All that earth on top of her. Being ash seems more free, floating on the wind. Though being burned hurts. Reckon I know that just as well as you. Might be even a bit better. But she ain't gonna feel it. A pyre, then, Thankwell said. She'd like that more, I think. Thorn moved away, and Thankwell went back to his vigil. He wouldn't leave her alone like this. He couldn't. He would wait with her until she was gone. All of her gone. By the time Thorn came back, the sky was starting to brighten. A dim light revealing the true horror that had been wrought the night before. Burning buildings, dead bodies and bits of bodies, and so much blood. The smell was anything but pleasant, and the sight was somehow even worse. Jezit's body was the worst of all. Her skin was pale and lifeless, and she looked so... dead. He carried her to the pyre, and he couldn't remember her being so heavy. Each step was torture, 
yet he endured. He placed her down on the pile of tinder and arranged her arms and legs, wiped at her face and made the smudging of ash even worse, and pulled strands of her black hair away from her face. Lastly, he laid a sword on her chest. A blade master without a blade, Thankwell said quietly. You wanna? Thorne said, holding a lit torch. Thankwell nodded and took the torch. He felt he should be crying again, but simply didn't feel like he had anything left. With only a moment's hesitation, he lit the pyre and stood back and waited. Thorne waited with him. It didn't take long for the dry wood to catch and the fire to start roaring. It didn't take long before the flames licked at Jezet and began to consume her body, her hair, her clothes, her skin. Thankwell took a step backward, away from the heat. He didn't look away, just stared at the funeral of the woman he loved with firelight dancing in his eyes. The others, he said, after the pyre collapsed in on itself, Jezet's form no longer distinguishable. Got them tending to Susku as best they can. Everyone's pretty bad, but he's on... He's on death's door. Don't know if he'll make it through. Thankwell nodded. He was numb all the way through. So, where do we go from here, I wonder? He said. We'll double time it back to Farpoint. Might be we can find some sort of healer for Susku. From there, we'll make our way back to Chade. Reckon we can find you a boat back to Sarth there. If that's what you want. Thankwell couldn't have what he wanted. She was gone. He turned to look at his friend. Just about the only one he had left. Let's go. Chapter 45 Betram Relief, maybe. Or happiness. A little bit of nervous anticipation. Those were what the sight of Chade's walls brought on these days. Betram had never really called anywhere home, except his family's ranch, back before he'd run away. But Chade was definitely starting to feel a lot like one, especially now that Rose was in charge. The very thought of their reunion after a good few months apart threatened to bring a grin to his face. So Betram quickly turned his mind to darker thoughts. Last thing the good folk of Chade needed was to see his ugly face smiling and making it a whole lot worse. The journey back to the free city from Absolution had been anything but enjoyable. Truth was, it was about a month of long days, long faces, and short tempers. Ben and Rilly had been waiting for them back at Farpoint. They had bitched and moaned about wanting to make certain the Arbiter was dead, but Betram assured them nobody came back from a death like that. A hole through his head, followed by decapitation and finally cremation. The story of his demise had done wonders to endear the two to thankful some as well. Henry and Anders, both beaten and bloody, recovered quick enough, though Henry's loss of ear gave her a slightly ghoulish appearance. That and she wouldn't stop picking at the scab. Her arms would bear some nasty scars for the rest of her days, but there wasn't a member in the crew who didn't have a few scars. Anders came out of absolution surprisingly well off. The blooded drunk had made a habit of picking up permanent injuries wherever he went, and he was happy to talk about them all day long. This time, he was, for the most part, unharmed. He seemed a touch more focused, too though still a raging alcoholic, and a right pain in the ass when sober. Susku was a worry, and no mistake. The Honin wouldn't talk about his fight, other than to say the old man had been a Harin from his old clan, and that there would be more of them. Truth was, he was damned lucky Henry had been so determined to look for him. Took a lot of bandages and a little bit of Thankwell's magic to keep the bastard alive, though survive he did and he looked like he might make a full recovery in time. He was already back to his daily morning training sessions. 
Betram reckoned he'd never seen Henry so worried about another person as she was about Susku, and though they'd make a damned strange pair, a pair he reckoned they'd make. Most of Betram's own concern was taken up worrying about Thankwell. His friend switched between morose and catatonic. He would sit astride his horse for days on end, saying nothing, and showing not even the least bit of emotion. They'd hit a town, and he'd match Anders drink for drink, a fool's errand that Betram reckoned was fairly close to suicide. More than once, he'd had to drag the unconscious arbiter away from a tavern. Betram had seen it before many a time. Some folk got so consumed by grief, they just switched off and stopped caring. It was almost as though they had nothing left anymore, and Thankwell was very close to fitting into that category. In Betram's experience, folk either came around and snapped out of it one day, or got themselves killed pretty quick. He hoped, and would have prayed, if he had believed in any of the gods, that his friend did not fall into the latter. The sun was just about beginning to show itself when they set eyes on the walls of Chade, and it was low and dim by the time they reached the gate of the old town quarter. Wasn't but a year ago the city was a war zone, gangs of armed thugs on the streets, and the good folk locking themselves indoors and hoping no one came for them. Things had changed a little since then, and most of that was thanks to the city's new magistrate, Rose. The walls were scrubbed of filth and patched up where they needed, so the whole city looked new from the outside. The gates had been replaced, all three of them, with hard wood from the Red Forest, banded by steel. New machines of war Betram couldn't name were being built atop the walls. Rose claimed they were precautionary measures to ward against the threat of attack. But Betram had developed a good ear for when that woman was lying. He just didn't care enough about the subject to press her for the truth. Rose had been steadily replacing the guards as well. Those that now manned the walls, patrolled the streets, and doled out the justice were no longer the thugs and mercenaries usually seen in the wilds. They were soldiers, well-trained and well-disciplined, and loyal only to the new magistrate. For a few months, the city jail had been full, and then some. But these days, Chade was probably the most lawful place in all the wilds. The change sat well with Betram's own change in profession, though at times left his crew a little short on work. The life of a bounty hunter meant lots of travel, so travel they did. Still, it seemed a little strange to Betram at times that, as far as he knew, in all the history of the wilds, never had there been a bigger bounty than his. And now, he hunted folk for theirs. As they walked their weary horses up to the gate, a few of the soldiers on duty came close. They checked in with most folk as they entered these days. Once they realized who the crew was, they waved them all through with winks, and in one case an applause. Betram wasn't sure what he'd done to earn a clapping, though he wasn't about to turn one down. He'd certainly received far colder welcomes in his time. The streets were as clean as he left them, and about as busy with folk, too. The light of the morning might be dim, but it was enough to work by, and plenty of people agreed. The old town quarter, famous for being the poor quarter of Chade, no longer looked like the run-down collection of hovels it had until recently been. New houses, built of stone and not wood, were springing up all over, and carpenters and masons were already hard at work to meet the demand. A number of people started trailing the crew as they walked their horses along the dusty streets. Rose had plans to turn the old quarter to hobbled roads. Seemed that was one improvement she hadn't managed to make a reality yet. This doesn't seem normal, Thankwell said, looking up and around, and mostly at the folk following them. Henry snorted. You might be surprised, Arbiter. Thorn here is a hero, didn't you know? Betram sighed. Reckon they've heard yet? Words are air, and the wind travels fast in the wilds, Susku said, still wincing with every step his horse made. 
couldn't have put it better myself, Anders agreed. You have a wonderful way with words, my good man. Fancy way of saying yes, if you ask me, Rilly said with a sneer that reminded Betram uncomfortably of the woman Henry had once been. The little woman was far less scary than she wanted to be, though. A hero, Thankwell said. Betram had noticed the Arbiter had gone back to being careful not to ask questions. It was a change he approved of. Best you don't ask, Betram rasped. Most of it ain't exactly true anyways. I ever tell you how Chade is one of my six cities? Asked Six Cities Ben. Henry spat. Any of us ever ask? Uh, no. Reckon there might be a reason for that? Ben grinned. Seemed they were all in good humor to be back in Chade. Suit yourselves. Get yourselves to the bastard's end. Reckon we've earned a bit of rest. I'll go check in with the magistrate, Betram said, already steering his horse away. Give her a check in from me, called Ben from behind. My people told me a hero had arrived in my fair city, and now I see they were right, Rose said, gliding out of her chair and over to Betram. She was wearing a red silk dress that showed off plenty of cleavage. Already, Betram was imagining how easy it would be to get her out of the garment. Seems a right strange time when a man like me can be called a hero. Were it but a short ways back, some folk were calling me something a damn sight worse. Rose stepped into his arms and tilted her head back. She smelled of flowers and fruit and it got his pulse to racing, being so close to her. He leaned down a little and kissed her, and she kissed him right back. Betram also thought it was a strange time that a man like him might be able to call a woman like Rose his wife. Not that most folk knew it. Rose let out a rumbling, purring noise from her throat and pulled away a little, resting her head on Betram's chest. But you are a hero. You killed Host before he could unleash that army of his on the wilds. I was there for a fact, Betram agreed. Also got the blame for slaughtering half the bloody city. You waltzed into Sarth, killed an Inquisitor, and came back from the dead to return here to us. Don't reckon I've ever done any waltzing in my life. And I didn't kill no Inquisitors either. Just got myself good and stabbed by an evil arbiter, and lost a perfectly good eye in the process. Then got nursed back to health and ran away the first chance I got. Mm-hmm, Rose mumbled. One man's rubbish is another man's treasure. You freed the slaves in Salantis and started a rebellion. Funny how slaves ain't exactly free everywhere I tread, ain't it? And rebellious ain't usually well received by most. Lots of good folk die in rebellions. Lots of good folk die every day. Rebellions are exciting. You killed my brother, the tyrant of Chade, and freed the people from his evil machinations. Betram couldn't even spell machinations and he certainly didn't know what it meant. Reckon my part in his death was motivated by less than honorable purposes. The why is less important than the act. And now, just recently, you have killed the kidnapper Kessick and raised his city to the ground. They pinning this one on me too, are they? He asked. Seemed the majority of the Blackthorns' recent accolades belonged to others, most of them thankful, and yet he was the one bearing the weight of the consequences. People from all over are calling you the Guardian of the Wilds, Betram growled. <sighs> that you're doing? Yes, she smiled up at him, and he found he couldn't blame her. Not when she looked so damn beautiful. 
The blooded are terrified you'll come for them next. The outlaws run and hide at the mere mention of your name. And the law folk are all worried, in case you go back to your old ways. Right, said Thorn. Heroes meant to get everyone shitting themselves, are they? She nuzzled into his chest. Sometimes, this time. She started absently picking at the laces to his trousers, and truth was, he didn't feel much like stopping her. It had been a while, and then some, and her desk was looking a right fine place for a proper reunion. Did Jezit kill him? she asked. Keswick? Even wrapped in a distracting concoction of her perfume and his desire, the oddness of the question made it through the haze and struck him as more than a little odd. He gripped her by the shoulders and pushed her away, held her at arm's length. How do you know about Jesset? Rose looked up at him and frowned. I delivered her to Keswick, she said slowly. At Drake's order? He could feel some of that desire being replaced by anger. It would not be the first time they had argued about Drake. Wouldn't be the first time it had come to blows, either, though Betram had never once hit her back. At his request. Drake don't make requests. And I don't take orders, she said, her voice going cold. Betram let Rose go and turned away, stalked over to the window, and gave it his very best one-eyed glare. Jesit was a friend of mine. Rose didn't say anything for a while, letting Betram simmer a little, he reckoned. I'm sorry, Betram. I liked her. Reckon I need a favor, he interrupted her. Need you to organize a boat to Sarf, soon as you can. Fastest one you can find. He felt her hand at his back, and she stepped into view beside him. Damned woman could move silent as a ghost when she wanted. I'm sorry. Didn't realize you'd want to flee all the way to Sarth. He looked down at her. Ain't for me. Reckon it might be best we get thankful on a boat soon as possible. He finds out you had anything to do with Jez's death, and I reckon he might try to kill you. Not sure I could stop him. A smile played at the corner of her mouth. Are you protecting me? Betram took a deep breath and sighed it out. Well, I promised to, didn't I? She took his hand then, so small but with a grip like iron when she wanted it, and he let her lead him over to the desk. Betram stood, looking at the road well-traveled, with Thankwell beside him. The Arbiter had used his time back in civilization well. He had shaved off his mess of a beard, bought some new clothing, and even given his coat a clean. Truth was, he was starting to look more like a witch hunter and less like a drunken beggar. Still had that haunted look about him, though, almost like he could see her ghost everywhere he went. Two days, Thankwell said. Anyone would think you wanted rid of me, Thorn. You could stay, Betram suggested, already knowing the answer. Bloody useful person to have in the crew, I reckon. All you gotta do is trade hunting heretics for outlaws. Thankwell gave Betram a humorless smile. Thanks. Had to make the offer. You going back to the Inquisition? Thankwell nodded and went back to watching the sailors load the sleek little ship. My actions have consequences, and I have to face them. Betram took his turn to nod. What'll they do to ya? Well, I killed an Inquisitor, and they slapped me on the wrist. So, now I've crippled their lines of communication for all time. I expect they'll promote me. Betram laughed. <laughs> Reckon you'll ever make it back here? He saw Thankwell's head drop. I hope not. Well. If you do, drop in. Say hello. Thank you, Thorn. The sailors finished loading the cargo, 
and the captain waved down at them, eager to leave but ordered to stay until the Arbiter was ready. Good luck, eh? Thankwell nodded and started toward the ship. He stopped after a few paces and glanced backward. If you see Drake Morass, tell him to run. Betram smiled sheepishly and nodded. He watched his friend board the little vessel. Part of him hoped he would see the man again, and part of him was scared he might. Chapter 46 The Arbiter The Imperial Palace of the God Emperor of Sarth looked smaller than Thankwell remembered. Smaller and dimmer, but then he shouldn't be surprised. The whole world seemed a dimmer place these days. His journey back to Sarth had been mostly uneventful. No pirates, no monstrous sea serpents, one very wet storm. They made good time. He reported to the Inquisition straight away, and the Council of Inquisitors wasted no time in demanding his accounting. Two months after their communications with all their arbiters had been cut, and they were still left wondering why. So Thankwell made his report, and made no apologies, and spared no one the truth. The Grand Inquisitor himself did not seem best pleased upon learning of the involvement of his son in delivering the Demon Blade to Thankwell. Still, the Inquisitors did not kill him, nor torture him, nor confine him. They did, however, order him to not leave Sarth until their judgment on the consequences of his actions be decided. Just two days after his arrival in the city of Sarth, the God Emperor sent for him. A familiar-looking young man with a full and very neatly trimmed beard came looking for Thankwell, and this time he did not look like he was willing to wait while Thankwell bathed. Not that Thankwell cared about making himself more presentable. The place gleamed, but the light seemed to have gone out of it. The corridors were no less ostentatious than before, yet Thankwell barely noticed the finery. The armored guards watched him with wary eyes, full of suspicion, as was their job, and he ignored them all with equal measure. Even the God Emperor's meeting chamber seemed a smaller place. Even the God Emperor himself seemed smaller. Less the titan that Thankwell remembered, and more a man like any other. Thank you for coming, Arbiter Darkheart, the God Emperor said as Thankwell entered, and the young bearded man left, closing the door behind him. Thankwell glanced around the austere room, with its redundant fireplace, marble floors, and row upon row of bookshelves. No guards, he noticed. Here, the God Emperor felt safe. I didn't really feel like I had much of a choice, Thankwell said, walking over to the Emperor's desk of runes, flicking a few aside, and blatantly pocketing a rune of judgment. You of all people have choice, Arbiter Darkheart. Thankwell snorted out a laugh. <laughs> you know about that. I have heard about your report. No need to repeat it. For that, Thankwell was glad. He had repeated his story far too many times in the past two days, and the end was still much like a knife in his chest. It had taken him a long time to admit to himself that he had sacrificed Jezet's life for the Inquisition, and admitting it to others always brought the pain right back. I wasn't intending to do so. I should thank you. The God Emperor of Sarth said in earnest, a warm smile on his handsome features. His short blonde hair and trimmed blonde goatee framed his face perfectly. Go ahead. Thank you. Thankwell glared at the man. Suddenly, it all seems worth it. Careful, Arbiter Darkheart. The God Emperor adopted a stern expression. My good will only extends so far. Thankwell always had a habit of pushing people's good will to its limits. What will the Inquisition do now? he asked. The God Emperor's face softened again. We will cope. Volmar never intended the chains to be permanent. It was the only way he could find to control the demons. 
What are you? Thankwell asked. You've asked that before. It doesn't matter what I am, only what you believe. I've accepted that you're Volmar reborn. The demon told me you come from the void. Ah, grunted the god emperor. I am not Volmar, only a part of him, his avatar on this world. And that isn't an answer to my question, Thankwell said, unrelenting. The god emperor took a deep breath and stood. He towered over Thankwell even more so than most folk. But it took more than a man wearing big boots to intimidate him. Volmar does come from the void. So he's a demon? No, said the god emperor. He is... Something else. And you're a part of him? Yes. Thankwell wasn't certain whether that made it more or less likely that he was part of Mjorso. He was even less certain that he wanted to know, one way or the other. The demon showed me the same thing he showed to Kessick, Thankwell said. An image of an army of the dead. The dreadlords rising and sweeping across the world like a plague. The demon said it was coming soon. The god emperor was silent for a while. He looked to be mulling over the information. Demons lie, Arbiter Darkheart. They will often spin half-truths in order to convince people to sign their contracts. But I will have the claim looked into, just in case. But this is the reason the Inquisition was created. To safeguard against the return of the Dreadlords. If they do return, we will be ready. Thankwell nodded, but he was far from convinced. I need to call in a favor, he said. The God Emperor frowned. You presume to think I owe you a favor? I presume to think you owe me more than one. Thankwell replied quickly. The god emperor looked far from impressed. I want you to pardon the Blackthorn, Thankwell said. The Inquisition sent a Templar to kill him. He's no heretic. He helped me kill Harren, and he helped me kill Kessick. He's done more of a service to the Inquisition than most arbiters, and I promised him a pardon for his past crimes. I can't deliver on that promise, but you can. The god emperor nodded. Done. I half expected you to demand a pardon for yourself. Thankwell snorted. All I've done, I've done at your request, in your service. Do I need a pardon for carrying out Volmar's will? Silence erupted into the room. Once, Thankwell might have felt awkward, might have sweated and shook, and looked about for something to steal. Now he found he just didn't care. The Inquisition would do with him what they would, and there was no sense in worrying about it. He wasn't even certain he deserved a pardon. He wasn't even certain he wanted one. Go, the God Emperor ordered. We will speak again soon. Thankwell turned. I can't wait, he mumbled and started for the doors, stopping just as he reached out to open them. Inquisitive Vance told me I have no future. He said it was almost as if I existed outside of fate. The demon told me that the power to change fate is demon magic. He looked back at the god emperor. Who did this to me? The demon or Volmar? Does it matter? The god emperor asked. Yes. The god emperor was silent for a while. I cannot answer for what the demon may or may not have done, but I can tell you, Volmar is no demon. He does not have the power to rip someone out of fate's path. Without another word, Thankwell pushed open the door and walked out. He found Inquisitor Heronis Vance waiting for him. The man was as neat as ever, immaculate white coat, over pressed brown robes 
and his handsome face an expressionless mask. Arbiter Darkheart? the Inquisitor said. Vance? Thankwell said right back. The Inquisitor cleared his throat. If the nearby guards found Thankwell's lack of respect amusing, they did not show it. The Council have made their decision, Inquisitor Vance announced. And they send you to deliver my verdict? They were undecided about how you should be dealt with. I convinced them. Thankwell said nothing, just stared a hole through the man. The Inquisition is worried there may be more insidious elements within its ranks, Inquisitor Vance said. You are perhaps the one arbiter beyond suspicion. Your loyalty is unquestionable. Thankwell couldn't stop the frown appearing on his face. If the demon was telling the truth, his loyalty was anything but unquestionable. They are placing you in the sole position of hunting down these insidious elements. You will report directly to the God Emperor and to myself. Thankwell found his mouth was open, and no sound was coming out. Not the verdict you were expecting? the Inquisitor asked. Uh, I understand with your recent loss. You may want some time to recover. That snapped Thankwell's mind back into focus, brought the pain right back as well. What do you know about what I've lost? The Inquisitor frowned at the dark tone of Thankwell's voice. Take your time to come to terms with it, Arbiter. When you're ready, I have a task for you. What is it you want me to do, Vance? Thankwell asked. If you need to wait... The last thing Thankwell felt he needed to do was wait. If the Inquisition wanted him to hunt down his fellow Arbiters, then so be it. He'd do their dirty work for them. What is it you want me to do, Inquisitive Vance? Epilogue Making port in Sarth had always been dangerous for Drake. The fortune would be boarded, and probably scuttled on sight, and he had a price on his head that almost made it worth turning himself in. Sometimes, however, needs must, and he had an important meeting to make. So here he was in Sarth, in the Holy Empire of Sarth. Not many folk knew it was also the kingdom and city of his birth, and that was, for the most part, because he had killed nearly all those that did know it. The Bearded Muscle was a dimly lit, strong-smelling, beer-stained tavern of no small ill repute. But damn if they didn't serve some of the best ale he'd ever tasted. He sat with his feet up on the table in the center of the room, rocking back on his chair's hind legs, and sipping at the wonderful beverage. There were no customers in today. The tavern was closed, his own men stood guard outside, and two sat with the owner of the tavern down in the cellar. He was alone and thoroughly enjoying his drink. He was forced to congratulate himself on his latest endeavor. Not only had he helped to facilitate a change in the ruling system of an entire empire, but in what was the most complex plan he had ever woven together, he had done exactly as he had been asked. He had killed Keswick, installed a new influential hero in the wilds, consolidated his power in no less than three of the largest cities in the wilds, and saved the Inquisition in the process. He may have done none of the actual legwork, but it had all been his plan. His only regret in the whole situation was the death of Jesset Valerne. He had liked the woman, truth be told, but more than that, he had really wanted to get between her legs. Sometimes everything did not go his way. Not often, but from time to time. He took another sip and stretched out his arms as though to embrace the entire empty tavern. Of course, he hadn't actually planned it all himself. Not this time. The Oracle had their own fair share of responsibility in this one, 
not that they'd ever own up to it. Drake worked behind the scenes, manipulating folk to carry out his will, and the Oracle advised. Drake had long ago discovered it was bloody useful having an Oracle on your side. Knowing the future was a good way to stack the deck, and Drake never played without being certain of winning. The door opened, and in walked the Oracle. Drake grinned, took his big boots off the table, and rocked the chair onto all four feet. He stood, repositioned his saber, and pulled his blue patchwork coat into position. Appearances were a big part of the reputation, and he had one hell of a reputation to maintain. The oracle looked at Drake and broke into a smile. Good to see you again, brother. He pulled his own white coat into position. I usually is. Drake said. He crossed the room in three long strides and embraced his younger sibling. Good to see you too, Inquisitor. You have another one of those? Heronis Vance asked, pointing to the mug of beer. Aye, behind the bar. Heronis collected the mug and sat down with Drake at the table in the center of the room. Everything went as planned, as I hear. Drake grinned. Uh, just about. You could have told me about Jezit. Heronis shrugged. Fate is a tricky thing where Arbiter Darkheart is involved. I hear he doesn't like me much. I'd stay out of his way if I were you. Regardless, I have him busy for now. Drake took a big swig and leaned forward. Right then. Done what you wanted. Inquisition saved. Council scared of their own bloody shadows. Indeed, it won't be long before I can start rebuilding the council with my own people. Drake ran a hand through his hair and leaned back on his chair. Reckon it might be time we get to my part of the deal then. Heronis nodded. The Pirate Isles. Drake grinned, his single golden tooth glinting in the dim tavern light. I. This has been The Price of Faith, The Ties That Bind, Book 3, The First Earth Saga. Written by Rob J. Hayes. Narrated by Jarrett Ross. Copyright 2013 2017 by Rob J. Hayes. Production copyright by Rob J. Hayes.